Ready? Recorder's on? Okay, let's uh, call to order. The December 1st, 2021 Historic Preservation Board meeting. 
Call the roll, please. Robert Ostinoff. I'm here. I don't have my. Lise Lindstrom. Absent. Donna Saxon. I'm here. Buddy Willis. I'm here. Jim Chard. Here. And Jimmy Baffer. Here. Okay, so we've got some changes to the agenda. Yes. Right, we're going to go A, then C. We're going to try to do A and then C. So C would become B, and B would become C. Um, this is in order to accommodate the consultant who is having a personal issue. Um, we'll be here for it, but we're not sure if he'll be here by the time we get to B, so we're going to try to help him out. Okay. So you need a motion, I think. Set. Move approval of the of the agenda, as advised or as revised. A second. Yes. <laughs> yes. Amanda Saxton. Yes. Buddy Willis. Yes. Jim Char. Yes. Benjamin Baffer. Yes. Okay, so board discussion. We're going to talk about landscaping. Would you like me to lead off? Okay. Um, as per the last board meeting, we agreed to have an earlier meeting at uh, 5 o'clock uh, so that we could be uh, fresh and think about some, some ideas about uh, uh, the preservation of the natural environment in addition to the preservation of the built environment. Uh, and uh, I was somewhat tasked with the idea of uh, pulling uh, this together. And I put together this uh, little PowerPoint with some help from staff. Uh, it got a little bit longer than I intended, so hopefully you can uh, all stay attuned with it. So we start out with the second slide here, I think. Um, what would the goals be of trying to preserve not only the built environment, but the natural environment? Well, one of them would be to make us uh, historically aware and sensitive to uh, the things like the environment, like the landscape, and like the topography. Uh, another one is for a healthier community. Uh, more oxygen in the air, CO2 sequestered, uh, lower temperatures, and so forth. Uh, another is to save legacy trees. A lot of the trees that are, we are taking down are much older than the houses that we're trying to preserve. We have 100-year-old trees here that uh, can be taken down in a matter of minutes with a chainsaw. And then the final one is to actually make our city a leader in the areas of biodiversity, climate change, and restoring ecosystems. Um, so, could you go back just one for a second? I'm sorry. The picture on the right, uh, we're going to refer to a couple times. That is actually a tiny forest in the middle of Palm Beach, a block away from Worth Avenue, and uh, formerly a parking lot. It's, uh, just if we can kind of keep that in mind as we go forward. Thank you. So, uh, I think this is the most dense slide, so we'll <laughs> try to go through it quickly. But uh, as Claudia often reminds us, uh, we have the Secretary of the Interior to guide us on these things. And it, it turns out that they guide us not only in terms of the built environment, but the natural environment uh, and what that represents historically as well. So it does require that the landscape be kept in its historic form. Question is a little bit, what does that mean? What's your baseline for historic? Uh, there are standard, in the standards and uh, in the guidelines specific requirements for cultural landscape and the nece necessity to recreate that since we have essentially destroyed much of it, uh, particularly with buildings. Um, it calls for the building of uh, identifying and retaining and preserving the site, the building site and the native plants the fences, the walls, the trees, the undergrowth, grasses and orchards therein. And finally, it talks about a cultural landscape, that the cultural landscape is not... This off. 
just the buildings, but it is also the environment around it. And that again, it talks to such things as topography and vegetation. Um, just hold on for a second as we're distributing. Do you want to dance? Yes. Do you want to do it yourself? If I can, yeah. It's backward, okay. Thank you. So, another page on federal requirements. It's not only the Secretary of Interior, but the National Park Service that has guidelines. And those are particularly important to us because they really focus on things that uh, uh, can be impacted by the seashore, the beaches, the dunes, and preserving the same. So it calls for restoring natural flood control systems. Uh, it talks about wetlands, and it talks about larger scale um, interventions, not just a street tree here or there, but looking at sites and the cultural landscape. Uh, it also talks about um, the, trying to reestablish the overall historic character, not just the building and its sidewalk and its driveway, but the historical ca uh, character surrounding it. Uh, it uh, mentions that we need to uh, restore or maintain the topog topography and the historical relationship between the natural environment and the unbuilt environment. Um, it means that we also need to restore not only the on-site uh, aspects of the natural environment, but also the surrounding areas and the abutting areas. And it calls for what they call a green infrastructure. Uh, and that would be things like cisterns and bioswales and permeable fill pavers, which by the way, the city is doing very well with their alleys now. We're putting in alleys that are permeable concrete, which changes the flood pattern on the heavy rains. Uh, and FEMA, of course, has some points here too in terms of, again, uh, protecting the natural and historic landscape. And they note that there are over 30 federal regulations, directives, and mandates that we can use to uh, leverage our thoughts on this. Uh, all of these are built to ensure the long-term environment and natural impacts. So that's the federal side. The local side, we're pretty well covered here too. Maybe not the exact language that we're using here tonight, but similar language. And we start with the comprehensive plan, uh, Always Del Rey, uh, which uh, took us about five years to do, uh, develop and, and finalize, so there a lot of effort went into that. And also our own historic preservation design guidelines. So if we start with the preservation element, it talks about uh, the historic resources of main, that we need to maintain uh, through our land development regulations and the designation of historically significant sites. That's important because that's going to be one of our, that is one of our responsibilities uh, as defined in the LDRs. Um, it also talks about public infrastructure improvements. And that's not just sewer pipes and water and roads, it's also the whole character of a neighborhood of a city and maintaining the historicity of that. And then um, the final one under uh, historical preservation is exploring the potential for designating parks, landscapes, gardens, median strips uh, to be registered in the local registry of historic places. <coughs> You might, just a, a little bit of a side, you might have all seen the uh, median strip on Lake Ida Road between Swinton and uh, Congress. Beautiful, beautiful. That the city built. That, they built that, I'm going to say, 30 or 40 years ago, if somebody can correct me. Uh, that's something that should be historic. We also have the coastal management element uh, that is, again, uh, protecting naturally occurring coastal habitats. Uh, which can extend quite a ways inland. We're not just talking about the beach. And then the open space parks and recreation element, that's the third one that addresses what we're talking about here tonight. It uh, is to, again, the same language, preserve, protect, restore, and enhance the quality of the naturally occurring coastal habitats and public access there too of, uh, for public use and enjoyment. And finally, the conservation, sustainability, and resiliency element where we are conserving, enhancing, uh, protecting wetlands, conservation areas, and sensitive lands, which many of our buildings are built upon. And that's one of the reasons we talk about the coverage of the permeable surfaces and what that does to the, uh, the sensitive lands. Um, 
and require the use of native plants, uh, it should be plants, sorry, plants and environmentally friendly landscaping in all publicly owned areas. We don't do that. We didn't, we didn't talk about that on the train station. Uh, we haven't talked about that uh, in uh, any of our public areas that come before us. And then finally, encourage planting of native trees because they do sequester more carbon dioxide. They are much more sustainable in our environment. And it's talking about them not only on public lands, but private lands. Uh, so here are the LDRs. I'll go through this quickly. It talks about our duties as HPB. And one of that is to nominate buildings, sites, and districts for the local historic registry. Uh, another one is that we make recommendations to the city commission for changes to the comprehensive plan, to the LDRs, to the ordinances, having to do with things like sustainability, uh, sustainability and resiliency. We also hear appeals, just like the SPRAB board does, with regard to uh, the historic aspects of plans and uh, applicants. Um, we also have the responsibility of looking at landscaping plans and sh uh, shall approve, approve subject to conditions, etc. We're all familiar with that. Uh, as appropriate, it would be a SPRAB with those areas that are not historic. It would be HPB for those that are historic. Uh, we at present would not have responsibility for single family dwellings. And I know a number of us have talked about that. That might be something. Uh, I don't know all the legality of that, but that might be something we'd want to consider proposing to be changed. Um, we also have in the LDRs in section 4.6.19, tree preservations. 4.6.16 is landscaping, 1.9 is, is trees. And it goes through the various things that, can, that we should be doing here uh, and why. Uh, one of them is to preserve native plant communities, not just trees, not just understory, but, uh, but the entire uh, native environment of plant communities. Um, so it's saying that existing native plant communities on sites proposed by development shall be preserved insofar as you can uh, in the site plan. And that, of course, is where we come in. It's what is possible. Uh, I looked through the Delray Beach Historic Preservation Design Guidelines. I could not find one thing in there about the native natural environment. It's only the built environment. I think that's something that we might want to discuss and, and advocate one way or another. So why is this all really important and why HPB? I think this is a report that stands on its own. Um, I think this effort was begun in about uh, 2017. It was finally uh, passed, funded, and studied, and, and delivered on May 2019. Uh, I'm not sure if it has yet been accepted, perhaps Michelle can help us with that, but look at this. We have a 23% tree canopy. Atlanta has a 40% tree canopy. They say that's moderate density. I'm not sure I would say it's moderate, but let's say it is. To increase 1%, go to 24%, is 2,300 large trees. Again, I'm not sure what large is, but it's probably a couple feet in diameter. Uh, or 230,000 small trees. That's just to do 1%, and small trees are mostly what we plant in the city. Um, if all of the ground cover areas in the city were forested, that would only get us to 39%. And they're saying the way to do that is to maintain all of the trees now that we have, and make sure they're healthy and pruned and, and the density stays the same, and plant 10,000 trees in the next five years, which is a, a goal in, the, uh, I believe, the uh, CIP. Uh, even then, if we did that, we'd still only be between 27 and 28% uh, canopy coverage. I, I think that's a, a real challenge to all of us. So there's also a bunch of publications that uh, I won't take you through, but it talks about uh, our trees, landscape, our infrastructure, and makes a strong argument that it's infrastructure just like sewer pipes. Uh, and it's the only infrastructure that increases in value over time. A 100-year-old tree is worth, I'm sorry, yes, a 100-year-old tree is worth a lot more than a 10-year-old tree. You can't say the same thing about water plants and, and uh, sewer pipes. Um, but it's not just a, a, a do-good, feel-good thing. It helps our 
um, our cities, our health, our, our happiness. It helps in our less served, underserved communities so that we have environmental equity. Um, and, and I could go on, but I, mean, I think the point is clear. There are lots and lots of uh, organizations that are making the point that a, tr a community that cares about its trees uh, and about its environment is a healthier, more prosperous community. So take a close look at this. I think this is another sort of emphasis on where we stand. The upper left-hand corner is our southwest west neighborhood. You might note there are a lot of bare spots in, and uh, sun-blasted areas. Better than that, though, is you look at the Delray Barrier Island. But even though uh, there are more trees there, it's nothing compared to Tallahassee in the north and Coral Gables in the south. Whether we're associated with the weather patterns in Coral Gables or in Tallahassee, we don't necessarily have an excuse that we have to have trees that, and, uh, and cover that looks like that. So one of the things that, that I think I sent around to everybody the, the last time is the whole idea of tiny forests, that you can put a forest anywhere. It doesn't have to be any more than this space right in here. It can be a couple of parking slots. And we certainly know that uh, we have quite a few parking lots uh, that parts of it go underutilized. Or it could be on that fence line uh, by the uh, historic train station. It could be a couple feet wide, maybe 50 feet long. Of course, the ultimate goal is to have these linked together, little tiny forests, so there is a pathway for uh, animals. Uh, this is proven science. This is proven uh, success uh, happening all over the world. Uh, I do make the point that in one study they found in 11 tiny forests, 636 animal species and 298 plant species. So with, I think we can all remember when there used to be a lot more birds and butterflies around. This would be one way to help make that happen. Uh, in a tiny forest, you don't space trees and plants out. You just kind of throw them all together. And they feed one another and take care of one another, protect one another. Trees that, that uh, can provide a buffer from the wind, for example, uh, or provide moisture and nutrients to one another. Um, and they also, even though they're tiny, they contribute to carbon sequestration and they help us adapt to rising temperatures. We have a few resources around town that uh, could be very helpful. Uh, the Delray Beach Historical Society not only has these tens of thousands of uh, archived items, and one of them is that picture up there, the Delray Beach Historic Backroads. I'd love to know what that street is. Maybe Michelle can tell us. Uh, and they have a heritage garden. I don't know if uh, you've all had a chance to walk through that, uh, but it's fascinating. Uh, it was paid for by the uh, River Grass uh, Garden Club, and it's very, very well done. So we could really, we the city could rely on that. There's also something, and some of you may be aware of this, called the Institute of Regional Conservation. Uh, it's right on Linton. Uh, they're world renowned, and their whole goal is to protect, restore, and long-term manage biodiversity. Um, they have done a little bit of work on uh, Lake Ida to do some restoration there of getting rid of invasives and putting in natives. And the important thing to us, I believe, is they have a, a database. It's a baseline of what natural uh, phenomena, topography, plants were uh, in our community and in our region. So we can see to, in order to restore something that no longer exists. Um, so one of their projects is the Gold Coast pro Project, where they've been funded to rebuild the diversity of native plants and animals in southeast Florida. The, fat, the last one is the Palm Beach Preservation Foundation. This is the tiny forest that I mentioned a block away from Worth Avenue. I would highly recommend going to see it. It has uh, uplands on the, the, the left-hand side. Uh, uplands, of course, being in Florida terms, maybe five feet. Uh, and on the right-hand side, lowlands, that, and you can kind of see through the trees, there's a beautiful little pond in there and wild plants and turtles and birds and fish and so forth, all of which are pretty much self-populating. They find that. We don't have to find them. Uh, so how do we do this? This is a thank you for telling me all this. Um, we, we, first of all, would achieve a, a consensus here on the board. 
Uh, secondly, is that there would be a letter drafted to the city commission with our requests or suggestions. Um, and then the commission, if they are in favor of all or part of what we're suggesting, requests staff to undertake a study. And then that study comes back and it's considered by HPB and, and probably others. I think the important thing here is that uh, it's not just HPB. This is public works, it's parks, it's planning in the back row. Uh, so uh, all of that really needs to come together and be able to work for these kinds of objectives. But here's some of the things we can do. And I think the one on the top we probably all agree on and could probably do right now is require landscape plans or approval items coming before us. Uh, next is require all city buildings in, in construction to restore the native environment. I talked about uh, parking lots and putting tiny forests in those. We could give incentives, like maybe reducing the uh, uh, in-lieu payments for parking uh, to do plantings in parking lots. Uh, we should be amending the comp plan, the LDRs, uh, the historical uh, design guidelines, as we saw as we went through those, uh, those slides. Uh, I think we should be strongly advocating for tiny forests. I mean, why not? It's, it's, it's I think, a no-brainer. Um, we should make sure that if we are doing some planting in the parks or the water retention areas, that those be natives. Uh, we could offer tax breaks to community, co uh, community gardens to encourage those. Um, we should update the preservation design guidelines, um, and we should coordinate among other agencies and boards, uh, all within Sunshine. And uh, finally, um, of the many community master plans we have, like my, my own neighborhood, Oceola Park, there's nothing in there about landscape. Why, why shouldn't that be a requirement in all of the master plans? So, sorry for that being a little long. Uh, hopefully that uh, provokes some interest in what we've been talking about. Thank you. Well done. Thanks okay, for the effort. Yeah, thanks. Um, it seems to me th we there are there are yeah there definitely are and it seems to me we were supposed to eradicate them by like 1990 or something yeah. but they're still around I mean yeah. the Malaluca the Malaluca is a good example um, yeah. the, uh, and and there are some forms of sea grapes that the are Brazilian also invasive the Brazilian pepper Brazilian peppers even the Australian pines and yeah the, Australian pines that's in there the code five major ones they're in the code yeah, yeah they're in the code. Um, so why, uh, why are, are we not allowed to look at the landscaping plans for single family homes? It's what the way the code is codified. So single family and duplex go straight to permit. Okay, it just seems, I mean, I don't know why, why, it's, based that, why it's that way. <laughs> um, to me, particularly when we're looking at historic sites, and then we're talking about spatial different distance between buildings and landscaping and all of these additions um, that gobble up the whole lot, it seems to me that we should be able to have some, some say on that. Um, also, I'm gonna ask a couple, uh, ask a bunch of questions. So, um, Jim talked about legacy trees. Uh, is, where are we on the tree ordinance? Uh, and are they designating legacy trees or how do we initiate that process? So I hear Anthea. I see <laughs> Anthea. <laughs> Our director, Anthea Giannotis, um, Michelle Hoyland, principal planner for the record. We um, did adopt a tree preservation ordinance and it is already in the code, I think, um, Jim highlighted it a few slides ago. Uh, it's in LDR section 4.6.19. So we have specific requirements in the code now. Um, the requirements for historic properties in historic districts or that are designated are a little bit more stringent than for those that are not um, single family included. And then the city did complete um, 
board member Chard, you asked about the um, tree canopy assessment that was completed in 2019, and now we're working on a tree inventory that our sustainability coordinator is doing. Do you think I left anything out? No, I, I think that, um, you know, to be 100% honest, I'm sorry for the record, Anthea Gidonis, Development Services Director. Um, you know, we, I think, discovered that while we adopted some rules that um, they weren't being necessarily stringently enforced on single family. The state has preempted some, some ability with trees. I think there was some confusion, but those are for sick trees or trees that pose an immediate hardship. Um, so right now, the way that it works for historic is like any other single family. Um, there's a requirement for a number of trees that are there. Um, and I think what we're trying to do now is more stringently enforce the mitigation that's in the code now that Michelle is showing you, which says your first stop is not to move the tree. Right? <laughs> the tree is supposed to stay. Your second stop is to reuse the tree on the street. The third is to relocate it, and then ultimately, if it's determined you know, that it's okay to take it off, then there's a pretty significant mitigation. The fees were raised, I, I want to say, two, two years ago, possibly? Yes. I know they were raised. It's time that is more. <laughs> so so we, we are um, taking a much harder line with trees in this era. We are fortunate that we've got a new senior landscape planner. Um, she just started about two, two and a half, three months ago. She is a certified landscape architect as well. And Mr. Edwards, a sustainability officer, is undergoing the tree inventory that um, that Michelle referenced. So the city is absolutely moving forward with those things as quickly as we can, given the resources that we have. And I was actually just starting to type an email uh, to Mr. Edwards and um, Jayoon, Kim, and uh, I guess Missy Barletto as well, because Public Works has a lot to do with tree planning, to, to just suggest that they maybe look at this video when they have a minute to hear all of the concerns that the board is beginning to discuss so that they're in the loop and then may I also address what uh, Claudia asked one of the things that are there we have a lot of trees that should be legacy trees that are not natives uh, like sausage trees and baobab trees and they are one by one being picked off uh, I, there was a beautiful sausage tree um, not too far from where you live and it was right in the middle of the lot and the lot wasn't selling so the person who owned the lot leveled the the lot and that tree, which was probably at least 50 years old, right. so as to better sell it. We are not allowing that anymore, and it has been quite a battle um, within the permit department. These, these, you know, they, they're, you know, used to clear cutting lots and then deciding what to build, and we're not allowing that. You have to show us that the tree is in the way for it to come out. Um, so we are, um, we've definitely increased our resources in the last budget. The city commission approved another landscape site inspector to help us track what's going on with construction, including landscape. It is a landscape site. And so those things are starting to happen, whether they're, um, so I think what we need to do is hear everything that you're telling us and then see what updates we can bring back to you with Mr. Edwards when he gets to a point with his. Um, study to provide an update or to let you know when one will be provided if there's you know things like that so um, but in the meantime please you know continue talking and the only the only thing I would caution you that I think um, I just in good conscience want to put this out there is that we already have a lot of pushback from people who should be designated or should be contributors and they don't want to be because they think the hysterical board is going to give them so much trouble so my concern is if we add another la layer of requirements that you have to do that other single family neighborhoods don't, it's gonna be a deterrent for designation. So I'm sorry, I can't see anybody either, I'm steaming up. So, so just please consider that as well, that you know, we're always trying to coax people into districts and save things, and, and if we add another hurdle towards that, it, it could inadvertently have a side effect that maybe we're not thinking about right now. So, 
I understand, but I think it should be citywide, not just the historic. So if it's citywide about le legacy trees, Absolutely. then it's just another tool. We have a few more tools because of the Secretary of Interior standards that refers a lot to this, uh, the landscape and the setting and whatever. But, um, but we need a specific list. Is that what's going exactly on in the tree that. survey now to... To, to help us determine, do we have a native species list and do we have a yes. legacy well, list, or that's in the works? That, that does exist. We have, that the exists. code defines a legacy tree with a certain you know, size and things like that, and um, native species, other things like that, and it does have a list of invasives. You guys hit the top three, yeah. you're just knee-jerk reaction. However, our invasive list is somewhat anemic compared to the counties. And so there's things like that that we need to get into with the code as well. So. The, uh, there are also legacy trees that are on the invasive list. Yes. I mean that. That's what I guess. But, so, yeah. uh, so we have to kind of navigate. Well, navigate well maybe we come at it from a different angle. Maybe we encourage or do plant a tree campaign. <laughs> Instead, and instead of penalizing, we, we I don't know, we try to, to make it a, a positive thing. I, I know that in, I've been hearing all about in Miami and the, the heat management office they've established in the person, they're trying to do things at, at bus stops, plant shade trees and canopies. I think we need, sometimes those tiny forests look like they haven't had any maintenance because they're wild and that's what you're wanting. Mm -hmm. So maybe we need signage and education when we do one of those. And I do think things like the bus stops would be good. That's out of our purview though. Um, but I just want to mention one other thing, Dan. The, the other pattern that I have seen is that, let, let's say owners, let's say developers, come before the various boards with a full-blown plan uh, an architect does great renderings, uh, and then they get a demolition permit from the, I believe, from a demolition permit from the buildings department to take the trees down. And then they flip the property. They never had any intention to build anything, but they did it from a marketing point of view of having something that looks very appealing, and the, the ones who suffer are the trees, because they're gone. I, I do want to just make a comment, I, if Michelle, you want to address it. I just, if you guys can, this is your discussion item, so I want you guys to kind of talk about it amongst yourself. I, if they have something to add or, you know, if okay. there's something, clarification that you can give, obviously, you can jump on in here, but yeah. um, just, I don't want it to be a put on the spot, this happened here, or this happened here, you know, mm -hmm. allow you guys to discuss, and if you want to make a rec recommendation to commission, it would be done the way that... Um, you discuss and then it would come back down to them so that they can look into it further or do whatever we need to do to make the commissions um, so To that point, happen. you've got about 21 minutes left, yeah. right? Before we have to go to agenda items But to answer your question, Mr. Chard um, When someone comes before this board for historic approval if demolition is included they cannot get a demolition permit until they have the permit for the positive work. That's only the districts. Yeah. That's yeah. coming before this board. So. Which is back to Claudia's point. It should be <coughs> citywide. Mm -hmm. Right. And this, that, I think that's a good question. But yes, Kelly's right. You know, where are the things you want to discuss what, having change or where are the things that you have issues with that, you know, you can forward up to the commission? with your action recommendation. I agree with um, Jim about we need to be taking a look at the, not just the site plan, but the landscape plan. And when I served on the board back in early uh, 2000s, we did. We actually had a landscape architect or two on, on the board and those were reviewed and scrutinized very carefully What's the height of this palm tree? That palm tree doesn't have a big enough head on it. Um, you know, whether it was a palm tree or they had, um, you know, maybe they were using uh, ficus instead of uh, cocoa plums and those kind of things that 
came up during the conversations on the Historic Preservation Board, and we analyzed all of that for the entire look of the site. And, and I don't know why we got away from it. Yes, ma'am. We do that now for everything but single family and duplex. Yeah. So I think one of the things you should discuss is, do you want to see the board doing that for single family and duplex? You Definitely. get landscape plans as part of your package for the big projects for anything other than single family and duplex. You have full purview on that. I can't recall one that we've looked at. I don't know. Or we analyze the landscaping. It, it's up to the board to do that, but there's also a complete review done at the staff level to confirm if it, the plan is in compliance with the code. Uh -huh. And then we provide an analysis so in the staff report for non-single family, non-duplex, uh -huh. that the proposed landscape plan meets the requirements of the code. If you want to roll up your sleeves and dig in further beyond that, you're, you can. During board discussions yeah. and that's okay. Yeah, but the, this yeah, board tends to focus on the aesthetics, compatibility, and appearance of the structure. Um, so that, that might be something you want to focus more on moving forward, which you have the ability and authority to do now. The other thing that one of you brought up was that, you know, we do have some little pocket parks and, you know, um, Marine Way has a, an area that's you know, could be maybe more utilized as a forest, <laughs> so to speak. Um, there's a, a little pocket park uh, down on um, 2nd and like right around 6th, I think it is, North 6th, uh, near you, Robert, that, um, I mean, years ago, uh, Lois Brzezinski did some uh, artwork and so forth, but that's got like, maybe one tree in there and just some bushes. So that those are some areas that we could maybe push along as a board. Um, to enhance our historic right, district yeah, pocket the, parks. Yeah, because the marina is pretty, too much grass. Maybe we should look at all of our parks that are too much grass. <laughs> We've got a lot of parks that are a lot of grass. Osceola Park, there's, um, there's um, well, you're not historic, but, um, there's a couple of little community parks in that area um, that, you know, and I don't know as a historic board, they're not historic, but we have some little pocket parks that maybe we should take a look at making them historic so we have a little more purview over them. There's a little pocket park all over the place. I mean, in the Southwest area, and uh, there's, a, I can't remember all the names, like uh, Rosemary Park and, um, there's one that's um, Merritt Park. So I don't know if those are something that we should try to bring in to Historic because they've been there a long time. And I think they just become a city maintenance situation where they're, they're never really upgraded, they're just like walkthroughs. I don't know. If you we, also, we also have slivers of municipal owned property that just fell into the city's plans because of tax, uh, hands, or because of taxes and so they're forth. Too small to build on. And they're too small to build on. Uh, so those could become tiny forests. Yes. And I, I know... One over in West Settlers kind of mm -hmm. like that. Yep. Okay, so my question about that is, who maintains those? Well, in theory, <laughs> <laughs> they're self a tiny forest would maintain itself. Yes. You wouldn't irrigate it, you wouldn't send Parks Department there to prune it and trim it. Um, in reality, that might be a little different, but I'd, uh, I think our objective would be that we'd not add additional costs to the city. Yes, once established, I'm sure yeah. it, it probably would. But um, I think there's also a national organization. I thought it was a, oh. Closer to it. I also thought there was a national organization well, the Arbor Tree Foundation, I mean. But I mean, what they actually contribute to the purchase and the planting of trees on a national basis. So if we're not tuned into that, we could be losing that resource that's happening. And the other thing, too, is like you we were saying, um, in regards to that park around Dixie and Sixth, you know, maybe we could do an inventory of underutilized areas that are, 
there's you know knowledge of towers, we know where they are mm -hmm. and can identify you know the traffic that can be utilized. I can't imagine there'd be much of a groundswell against it, there'd be a groundswell for it. So I don't know how we do that or so to your point. You know, I think we figure out where all these and take an inventory of maybe underutilized parcels of land that are not available or locally. <coughs> Well, I, I was told that study had been lost, but uh, maybe we could find it. It was, it was done about seven or eight years ago, and they had actually started disposing of, of some of these little weird triangles and, part, and parcels. And if I may just make one comment. I, I do think while Tiny Forest, in light of your review of historic properties and things like that. I definitely think that could be within your purview to consider that as um, something to recommend. I just want to get away from things that are outside of the Historic Preservation Board's um, I understand purview. that, but if we are able to uh, establish what a legacy tree is, I would like to see us have the ability to rule on that citywide um, in that it, it falls under the historic purview. But, um, I also I know I think that's a lot certainly something that could be recommended if you want if the, if it was considered a legacy yeah. tree that's you know could be a historic thing in itself you yes. know if that was a recommendation that makes sense to me I'm just saying um, like recommending an inventory of the entire city of, of of spots that are empty I, I don't know that that's going to fall within the historic preservation board's purview. I agree. Um, I'm not. I'm not I'm not even sure that Robert meant it that way. I think, and nor did I, but I think in the in the five districts, there are those spots, and I think that's okay. That's understood. We I apologize. In on not if I misunderstood that, thank I you. I may have mentioned that, but just because that was to kind of get your minds going, because I couldn't think of the ones that are in the historic districts. <laughs> Okay, understood. Thank you for the clarification. Um, as Jim's picture showed, it's not, we're not very well shaded in, I guess that's Southwest that your picture yeah. was. But in doing research for the Frog Alley, uh, which may one day be a historic district, there are a lot of CRA lots that just have grass. Um, so uh, not being as familiar with the uh, West Settlers, I'm assuming there are also some CRA lots in West Settlers, and I think all CRA lots ought to be greener, and I don't mean long. <laughs> and if they're in, they're in historic districts. There's a little bit of the CRA in the marina, but that's pretty much just Atlantic Avenue, so. Uh, Mr. Chair, where, where do we go from here with our 15 minutes remaining or so? So it sounds like we need to um, pursue a modification or something in our in our regulations to, to give us the ability to um, the purview of, of landscape plans for for single family residences and that fall under the historic preservation board um, and then. Um, Pursue how we go about determining what um, what city-owned parcels might exist within our five districts uh, to understand the feasibility of, of perhaps creating uh, any force, and then continue to educate ourselves. So you know, I'm thinking I don't feel like I have the expertise to review a landscape plan. So I think we're going to have to, you know, continue this type of um, education amongst ourselves so we really do understand, you know, the fact that a lot of the landscaping that we see even on approved landscaping plans might not be good landscaping in terms of sustainability. Okay. Um, one of the things I didn't hear but I haven't read really the your presentation is uh, an emphasis on plants that require little or no irrigation because one of the bad things about grass for instance is turf requires you know, a disproportionate amount of irrigation to 
to sustain it. Uh, we, we need to be looking at things that don't require a lot of irrigation and, um, or any irrigation. I don't know if we go completely to xeriscaping, but understanding the different plant species of what what exists well without having to be irrigated. Would it be possible to ask the staff to put together a proposed letter from us to the commission with some of those ideas in it? I think so what we would, go ahead. Sorry. So, so what you would need to do would have to be a motion to recommend certain items to the commission, yes. um, as long as all of you, or a majority of you vote for that, um, then it would be prepared and city manager would review and he would determine how it was presented to the city commission. So I think your next best bet is to list the items. There's consensus. Where there is consensus, make a motion, and then we move on. And I think at that point, if we draft a memo, then we just work with the chair to make sure that it's accurate. You know, it would come from the chair, I believe. So. Yeah, if, it, if you all also could just give consent. Uh, if we get to the end of this, I'll ask for consensus to um, allow the chair to just work with staff to make sure that memo comes out kind of how you guys um, had discussed it. Okay, can I ask Anthea one Clarification. So uh, the legacy, tr is it actually called a legacy tree or is it just a trees of a certain size? It's trees of a certain size. Oh, okay. So it so doesn't get to the species issue that you've been discussing, it, it, that I think. I mean, I'm kind of going well, off the then, top of my head. Then <laughs> so. the secretary's guidelines, there are definition of legacy trees that is, that is not just for old trees. Yes. Or, or big trees. Yes. They're for trees that have some type of, of historic mm -hmm. or... Um, Cor correct. So does that fall outside of the current criteria? So we have a definition for all of the city. I think it's in 4619. I'm actually looking to Jim for help. I had it up back there and I was trying to scan in, through yeah. it and it was about size. But there may be, I think it, under your purview, um, perhaps there are specific trees with historic value for a particular reason or a certain tree planting characteristic, for example, I live in a district in West Palm. Our trees, our, our streets are lined by mahoganies, and even though they dent all of our cars, we make sure that it's mahoganies that continue to be replaced with other mahoganies. So, you know, if there's something that's innate to a district in particular, yes. that is something that is important to raise. Okay, because we, I know in the marina we've had mahoganies, and now we have palms. Right. So. Shade tree versus a palm species cluster, the code does allow for that to be considered equal, and that tends to be a point of contention in some places, so. Yes, I was gonna say, I think in Florida, aren't we looking down on palms now? I think it is, I found it once. And when you guys are making recommendations, you don't necessarily have to have it like down to the tiny little detail. You could say, you know, define, uh, like amending the land development regulations to include definitions of the legacy okay. of a legacy tree and you know what's important to the city or, or something like that you know um, and then it can be looked up into if it comes back down to the commission with mm -hmm. approval um, it can be looked into by staff with their landscape architect and actually kind of going into the details and you know we work on if we are going to amend it we work on it for a long time after I mean Depending on the thing, we, we would probably work back and forth with each other a bunch to actually make the determinations of what should be put into it. And Anthea and I were just talking about what Kelly said. Mate, we're checking now, and it could be something you include in the motion because you've said it several times. We're not 100% sure that the term legacy tree is in the definition section of the code. So if the board wants to have some kind of definition created, you could include that in your memo or like stricter regulations related to the legacy tree. You know, if those are if those are the things you're looking for, you can do it as more of a general and then, you know, if it comes back down to staff, we like the research comes that at that point. That's why, you know, it has to go through this process so that yes. you know, they're not so, so the survey they're doing now will that establish a uh, a base for us to select what are legacy trees? I think it's basically at this point it's an inventory. It's a jumping off point. Let's figure out what the inventory is. Okay. Um, you know, something that 
I, I don't know enough about it because I've not directly spoken to Mr. Edwards, but I don't know if, if he's looking at a planting pattern or, you know, when you see new subdivisions go up out west, they tend to have a new tree planting pattern that goes up. I don't know if we have that, and I don't know if he's looking at that. I just want to make sure we don't run out of time before we get a, a I motion. I think we should get a motion and direction going. And the chair can make that, emo that motion? He, I, I think I heard anything. he would have to pass the gavel to make the motion. Would you like me to make the motion? I would like you to. Oh, sorry. Right into that. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I'll entertain a motion. Okay, so. Um, so I would, um, I would uh, make a motion to um, to work, have the, the chair work with staff to create a memo that would um, that would provide recommendations to um, modifying our, our city code to provide um, historic preservation board with purview over over landscape plans on single family residences that come before the board, as well as to um, look at um, city owned property or opportunities for tiny forests within the uh, five historic districts. <laughs> can, can we add to that? Sure. Yes. Okay. Uh, uh, sorry. So there was a motion, and then Robert seconded. Okay. Yeah. And then now you can discuss and, and amend okay. if you. I, I'd like to add that you know I want to create a legacy tree category. Definition. Yes. And so therefore we need a definition, and we need it mm. uh, defined, I guess, by our landscape uh, architect, but. I know that there is a huge uh, desire for this in the public. People ask me all the time. So would you take that proposed amendment? Yes, I would. I would like. Yes, I would. I would. <laughs> I would like to amend my motion to to add a definition for a legacy tree. And the second accepts that amendment. Yes, I will. Okay. Uh, would you entertain another amendment? I can do this as a chair, right? That no. you that no, you actually need to pass the <laughs> can't do that. No. Why don't you hand it over to Robert? <laughs> <laughs> that that the motion includes the three programs or, or projects that you suggested, but it's not that it, it includes, but is not limited to those as per the, the other things that we discussed. Yes, I would accept that amendment to include the items but not limited to. I, I'm confused. You, you're, I mean, you're welcome to add that on, but you guys are always welcome. I mean, you know, pending us having the discussion time and all of that. Uh, you're welcome to make recommendations in the future. It's not like this ends your ability to write a memo, so. Okay. No, he can't. Oh, you need to, um, you need to uh, second. amend your second. And then the chair needs to call for a vote. Okay, so I amend my second to. As noted. As noted. Yeah. I'm gonna call for a vote. Call for a vote, at least. Let's call for a vote. There we go. <clears throat> Robert Ostinov? Yes. Rhonda Saxton? Yes. Buddy Willis? Yes. Jim Chard? Yes. Benjamin Baffer? Yes. Okay. Motion okay. carries. Motion okay. carries. Thank you, Jim, for putting that together. Yes, thanks, Jim. Should have told you you had to hold on to it. So does that mean I can start asking for benches and trees in our historic district? Benches and trees? Benches and trees, yeah. Oh, boy. I wish that you had said that on the record. Shade. They may want to sit and dwell on history. <laughs> I wish you had said that on the record. 
Well, I believe he said look for ways to f incorporate tiny forests. Tiny forests. Tiny forests. Oh, well. See, tiny forests. Oh, is it too late? Do I do? Wait, how do I do out that? Out I'm sorry, Kelly. Well, that, that's why we didn't limit it to those items. Yeah, we didn't I, limit it. We can add limited. that. We can, we can talk about it. Okay. Thank you. I'm, I'm good for tonight. Okay, do you want so to formally add it before we walk away at this point? <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, it should be. I, I think you just said not limited to, but I mean, that would go into the motion that that's not the end of the Historic Preservation Board's recommendations, but I, but you guys can recommend whenever. So I guess it doesn't, it doesn't, it's not absolutely necessary that you included that. If, if you want to make another motion to recommend, I mean, we're here at 6 p.m., but do you we, know, we're moving do into we need it. If to it's going to make a recommendation for that. Well, you, it, we didn't, you didn't say benches. I, I know I didn't say benches. That's just always my long well, desire to have benches and shade trees in the historic district. It can also always be brought up in board comments at any point, okay. you know, moving forward. Okay. Let, let's move into our, to our regular agenda now. I'm real busy. No, enough landscape talk. <laughs> okay, so we approved the change in the agenda and talked about landscaping. So do we have minutes? We do not. Okay. So we have no minutes, so we can swear in the public. Let me uh, corral the public and right. the lobby. If anybody wishes to speak tonight, if you guys could please rise and Diane will swear you in. Please raise your right hand by the authority vested in me, the notary of the state of Florida. Do you swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Yes. Hey, do we have any comments from the public on items not on the agenda? Um, I believe this item is not on the agenda, although it's tangentially related to it. So if I'm incorrect, please let me know and then I can move my comments to later. My name is Angela Marsh and my address is 101 Southeast South Avenue. And I thank you for your time and your service as members of the Delray Historical Planning Board. It is a privilege to appear before you to discuss the historical significance of one of the most cherished of Psalm Ogren's projects situated at 110 Marine Way. I thank you for your time and your service to the city and the residents of Delray Beach who place their trust in you to ensure the properties with historical significance are not in any way diminished. When the variances and waivers were first brought to this board, it was noted that the board must find the granting of the variance will be in harmony with the general purpose and intent of existing regulations will not be injurious to the neighborhood or otherwise detrimental to the public welfare. These three distinct findings must have been made, but none of which were actually met in this applicant's petition for these variances and waivers. The project as currently configured is detrimental to the public welfare. It is a complete annihilation of the original vision as expressed in the physical creation of this project by Sam Ogren. The size and sensibility of the five bungalows I, are in If peril. I could interrupt you. I, 
you can finish up, but it's not going to actually be put into the record on that item. This is 110 Marine Way, um, which is actually going to be the second item tonight. So if you want it, your comment actually put into the record on that item, you would need to say it during that, that item. Okay, so because the, the thing about the 110 on the agenda is just the fountain, and my comments, although the fountain is part of it, in terms of the annihilation of this project, okay. it's not really the focus. So Go ahead. It, okay. That um, Sorry. It's okay. <laughs> so when the plan was first envisioned, it required 30 variances and waivers, indicating at the very outset of this project, the intent was never to preserve a jewel of Delray, but to transform it into something entirely unrecognizable. And this flies against the public interest. It's this board's legal duty to preserve historical properties of significance, and any additional degradation of this jewel should not be allowed to occur. It cannot be understated the special beauty of these five equally balanced cottages surrounding the significant fountain that is the subject of today's hearing. Sam Ogren did not envision, nor did he build, a McMansion in the rear of the property to overshadow the other four. The balance within the courtyard is key to its beauty and its historical significance. From the outset, this applicant undertook work without permits, has at every turn demolished the unique beauty and history of this project. They should be denied any further project progress on this project until a complete and open public hearing is taken on this issue with notice to the neighborhood where the opinions of immediate neighbors may be voiced. They come before you with unclean hands. They've thwarted the board's attempt to rein in the destruction of historical significance by ripping out the Spanish tiles on the roof, obviously with the subject of today's fountain destruction, and they are instead bent on creating something that has no connection to Sam Ogren's vision. Sam would indeed be an unhappy man should he be present today. It brings me to that second element, granting of waivers. It will not be injurious to the neighborhood. On its face, any degradation of a property with such unique significance will be injurious to the neighborhood. It is also injurious to its immediate neighbors, impacting their rights. Standards applied and massive alterations require that it's minimal change to the defining characteristics, that removal of historical materials must be avoided, that adding additional architectural elements shall not be undertaking. Adding a second story is exactly what you are not allowed to do. I implore you to stop this course. You have an opportunity to do today what is right, and more importantly, what is re legally required by these standards. This applicant should be a stop from proceeding as their past actions demonstrate they have no regard for compliance with this board's directives to preserve history. Standard nine is instructive on this point. New additions, exterior alterations, or related new constructions shall not destroy historic materials that characterize the product, property. Massing, size, scale, architectural features to protect the historic integrity. These are defining features of these five bungalows, not one overtaking the others. Finally, that was, that was a three minute warning. So if you just um, wrap up your comments. Okay, I, I, I appreciate this. I'm requesting an immediate stop order and a rehearing with appropriate notice being given to the stakeholders to address these issues. I ask you to present a motion to allow the comments from the public to re redress the, the, the variances and waivers that were, in my mind, illegally given because they do not meet the standards accepted by this board. I really thank you for your time and I hope you do the right thing. I think we have another person, but again, we, you did say that it may need to be under the 110 Marine Way public comment, it, if that's what it's in regard to. Cause if it's in regard to 110 Marine Way, the COA that is before the board today, it should be addressed in public comment on the item. Um, her notation was it was about prior approvals. Um, things. This will, it will not be included in the record for that item. So that's why that is on, that's why it's considered on the agenda. Are you talking about the fountain? She's speaking Okay, he says he's not speaking about the fountain. Okay. Hi everyone, my name is Robert Brunel. I'm a neighbor of Angela, which you just heard. I live on the 105 Southeast 7th Avenue. So our property is directly to the west of 110 Marine Way. 
you're probably asking yourself, why are we here tonight talking about something that was approved back in 2019? Well, the reason is, is very simple. We were never notified of the meeting on November, 19, on November 6, 2019, even though the Historical Preservation Board staff report clearly states that public notice was mailed to property owners within 500 feet radius 10 days prior to that meeting. So I purchased my property in early 2019. We were concerned, obviously, about the development of 110 Marine Way. So our real estate agent emailed Michelle Hewitt here to ask her if the owners were planning any change. She replied in an email back in February 2019 that they had not received any application for modification to this property other than permits for maintenance and repair. It goes to say that we were relieved. So then when we proceeded to buy the property, only a few weeks ago, I found out the property was up for sale. So I went on the website and saw photos and to my dismay, I saw the sketches for a second floor directly in my backyard. Uh, obviously I was shocked. So I came here to the city to try to find out what's the process for getting such approval. So I met with Katrina Paliwoda, and she was kind enough to provide me with a report, the plans, and the mailing list of the notice of the meeting on November 6, 2019. To my great surprise, not only were we not on the list, both our neighbors that are directly in their backyard were not on the list either which is very strange. So as mentioned at the beginning of my statements, I would have loved to make these comments back in 2019, but we were never given the opportunity to do so. The second floor addition, which require both variance and waiver, substantially and adversely impact our right to quiet enjoy enjoyment of our home and neighboring homes. This new addition will cast shadow in our backyard and grant direct view in our master bedroom. I even learned today that we'll have an outdoor kitchen mere feet away from our property line. This is, why this is why today we implore you to reassess this project and perform your duty to preserve this is historical gem in my backyard. Thank you so much. Great. Are there any other comments from the public on items not on the agenda? <clears throat> Michelle, I have one question for you. I was at the meeting in November 6th of 2019, and I remember voting to approve the, the application. Um, did we follow the proper public notice for that meeting? Uh, we believe we did, based on the way the application works. The applicant provides the list of mailers that's generated from the Palm Beach County Property Appraiser's Office. And then they sign an affidavit indicating that that mailing, uh, those mailing documents are in true and in good form. And then we mailed out notices. So, um, yeah. You. We can review those notices. We have copies of what we sent to see. Um, I know we do have a public records request. I think it's from both of these folks here. Um, that's pending with a lot of information, so we need to assess that and get back to them. But you know, if there was an error made, that's not the city's <coughs> error; it's the applicant who files those documents. Okay. Do we have any presentations? No, sir. <coughs> no presentations. We can move into the quasi-judicial hearing process after I read the instructions. This hearing shall be conducted in accordance with the City of Delray Beach quasi-judicial rules. The applicant in the city shall be permitted to present their case. The public shall be allowed to speak for three minutes each or a maximum of six minutes if the person represents an organization or a group of people who are present but agree not to speak. The city commission, board, members, staff, and the applicant may be allowed to cross-examine a witness. The city or the applicant will be allowed to offer rebuttal testimony. Decision to approve or deny an application or appeal may not legally be made upon personal views as to whether a project is a good project or not, or may a decision be made on the numbers of citizens who support or oppose a particular project. The law requires that all decisions must be made on the basis of whether the project meets the requirements of the law 
the Comprehensive Plan and Land Development Regulations. So we're going to move to, we're, we're on item A, will be our first, first item. Yes, item 9A for 110 Marine Way is the first item. COA 2021-239 is entered into the record. This is a continuation from the October 6th HPB meeting. And the applicant is here and has a presentation to make to the board. Mr. Weiner, I'm going to get you the remote so that you can advance as needed. For the record, Michael Weiner with the address of Broken Sound Parkway, Boca Raton, Florida. Um, I'm here tonight on behalf of Dr. De Leonibus, who will be making the presentation, but I just have some introductory remarks. Um, we're here in respect of an interior pond. It's inside, probably about 12 inches high. Um, as Dr. De Leonibus will explain, uh, certain tiles on the interior pond were replaced. Um, to get it out of the way, the replacements already occurred. And there was a code enforcement matter. And Dr. DeLeonibus realizes the extent to which certificates of appropriateness are required in the town of Delaware Beach, Florida. But that's not the issue in front of you. It's not at all, OK? Uh, the issue is whether or not the chosen tiles meet the LDR requirements. That's, that's what we're here about. Everyone wants to protect historic structures. That's what we're talking about. We're looking at those regulations. To the point is 2.46H. And it basically says that there's four hurdles. You know, there's, there's standards. This is a quasi-judicial hearing. Uh, I, I know you understand. You've been on these boards and that you're sitting here as quasi-judges. And it has four standards. Um, you have to meet the objective HPE 1.4. That's the historic preservation element in the comprehensive plan. You have to meet section 4.5.1. You have to meet the Delray Beach Historic Preservation Design Guidelines, and you have to meet the requirements under the Secretary of Interior Standard for Rehabilitation. That's what we're here to discuss tonight. Um, the tiles are sort of an in, are an in-kind replacement of materials, and under different circumstances, it would have been a staff review, but we understand we're, we're, that we, we, we give credence to the system. It's, we understand the importance. So, uh, as I told you, we have four standards to get over. Objective 1.4.1, it, it, it's for the most part just a restatement of 2.4.6. They've actually codified it in the code, the, the comprehensive plan, so it gives the same standards. Um, importantly, 4.5.1, E7, that's, I, as I mentioned, that's the other hurdle to get over. What it talks about repeatedly is visual compatibility, two words, visual compatibility. And uh, it, it then gives A through M, that's almost 13 little substandards. The, the, the most important one is G, relationships of materials, textures, and colors. The relationship of materials, textures, and color of the facade of a building and or hardscaping shall be visually con compatible with predominant materials used in historic buildings and structures within the subject historic district. Notice, never the use of the word exactly the same, never the use of the word that it must be um, precisely what there was before, only to mention the words of visual compatibility. The local design guidelines that we have, oh, there's, there's really no reference to tiles. There is some reference to walls and fences and things of that sort, but it doesn't add anything more than the standards of visual compatibility. That brings us to the last standard. The last standard has to do with the standards of the Secretary of Interior. And item six is the one that really controls here. Because as 
Dr. Dilionobis will explain. He's going to take you through the whole uh, pond situation. I'm here only to explain the hurdles. Um, deteriorated historic features shall be repaired rather than replaced. Where the severity of the deterioration requires replacement, and Dr. Dilionobis will explain that, it was severe. The new feature will match an old design. But again, only match, not duplicate, not be the same, not be exact. It will match. And I believe Dr. DeLeonibus will explain why it is that it matches. The Secretary of State's guidelines go on to explain, if the essential form and detailing are still evident, so the physical evidence can be used to reestablish the feature, and here that happened, there were tiles, you'll see they disintegrated, many of them, but there were tiles, then a replacement is appropriate. That's what we did. Like the guidance for repair, the preferred option is always replacement of the entire feature in kind. That is with the same material. But it goes on to say, because the approach may not, be always, not always be technically or economically feasible, provisions are made to consider the use of a compatible substitute material. I'm, pardon my mask. Glasses get fogged up. Um, I will try to keep it where it should be. Um, so under the circumstances, if it's visually compatible and we have compatible substitute materials, the hurdles are crossed. Let Dr. DeLeonovis explain. He's passionate about this project, and I believe that he'll show you that, in fact, every hurdle's been cleared. Dr. DeLeonovis, could you come forward? Give me a moment, please. I have, um, I have some letters I'd like to circulate to the board that should have gotten last time when Dr. Palmer was here um, from Casa Ceramica and from Tranquil um, uh, Waterscapes. I'd like to make sure everybody has these because I want to refer to these. Can I have someone pass these out? To me, sir. I don't want to step my bounds. You can give them to me. Yeah. Okay. I'll take them Okay. How many do I need? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Here, just take whatever is there. Hand it to Diane, correct? Thank you, Michael. Could you restate your name and address, please? My name is John D. Leonibus, and uh, I'm using the address at 110 Marine Way, but I'm presently uh, renting in Deerfield Beach right now. I'm a citizen of the state of Florida. I've recently retired, and I was planning to be down here last Thanksgiving, but things didn't work out that way. Uh, allow me to introduce myself. I'll be redundant here. My name is John DeLambis. My partner, Courtney Palmer, we both purchased 110 Marine Way approximately three years ago. We both practice medicine and we clearly out of our element, knowing the ins and outs of land development regulations. Before this board tonight is the issue whether the installed tiles meet the requirements of land development regulations and the Secretary of Interior Standards for their treatment of historical properties. The issue concerning the failure to receive an appropriate approval before the Code Enforcement Board at this time doesn't play a role tonight. I'll accept those consequences as they fall out. I'd like to play the video, before, I'd like to play the video of uh, Tom McToof First, if there's a possibility of getting that video on uh, Michelle.
Mr. Delanibus, there should be a clicker there with you and a wipey if you want to wipe it. I'm okay. I have three vaccines already. The presentation that you provided is what's on the screen, and you can advance the I slides. Video. That was a video. There was a video on there first. I, I, went, I went to see Tom McTooth at Casa Ceramica and I asked him questions and I want to make sure that gets here tonight because I want to bear edify what I did there because I think it's important to this board. There is only this. Well, I have, I, I have another... Uh, they were both on there. I did have put both on there. I have another uh, thing here that I made sure that I had a backup because I didn't want to get into a situation tonight where I didn't have exactly everything. Do you have, are you saying you have an audio that you can There's play? an audio. But do you have that? Cause I have that on the other zip drive that I gave you, but I have another one of them. So we can't zip drive here. This is all that I have. I understand what and you're then, saying. And then this one was on there. They were, and then we double checked and double I believe you. I believe you, but this is all that I have here. So do you have it? I have it. Uh, do you have an audio on your phone or something where you can play it into the record? Um, yeah. Yeah, we do. You got it? I apologize. This is all that I have. Yeah, I, I really wow. wanted to double check. I'm so anal about things. I really want to get things right because I feel my partner came down here last time and I feel like things really got on, off on tangents and I just want to get it right this time. Understood. If we can um, get it pulled up on your phone and play it into the record, that would be acceptable. Uh, that'd be great. And you, why don't you look for that and I'm going to see if there's anything I can do on and my Let me see if I can continue expediting this a little bit, okay? Um, okay. Okay. Well, we can put it right here next to the microphone. Okay, you know what? Right here, and the Excuse me. Do you want me to continue talking? Why don't you continue through your presentation and give us a moment and we will. All right. I think it's added. important because it really true. I asked Tom to be here tonight, but Tom said to me, John, I had a family commitment I and I, I get it. People have family, especially around this time of year. So, okay, go ahead. And we're going to do this on the back end. Okay. Slide. Um, this what the slide we're looking at shows the finish pond as of November 24th. This wasn't the fin date it got finished, but it was the finished pond as of the date November 24th. Uh, the surrounding rosemary vegetation is 75% complete growing. You still can see some of the peeking out of the field tile there, peeking out of the field tile. But eventually that will be a shrub, it will be squared off, and it will be no little visual effect to that surrounding um, field tile. The field tile, just so everybody understands, is the solid tile which is found throughout this project not what i did what sam ogren did in 1937. Uh, the cottages feature five different misner moorish tile designs five different ones three separate solid colored field tiles as well as two different color used quarter rounds quarter rounds are the edges they were turquoise and uh, uh, Cobalt blue. The, the colors that were in this whole arena was the turquoise, the cobalt blue, the gold, the yellow, and the green. I want to go to number two. Can we go to two? Do you have that? You have a clicker? I gave it to you. It might be right under your paper there. It's not here. Hold on a second. Here it is. There it is. Yep. Peg here. Yeah, all right. How do I do this? I'm not good with this stuff. Let's see if I can do it. I, I make my own mistakes in these things. Okay. Can we go to town uh, number two? Here we go. All right. I'm sorry about this, people. This is actually an example of Villa Sevilla number two. Locate, location is around the front door. This, uh, this particular tile was around the front door of Villa Sevilla. The prominent colors in the tile are gold and cobalt with quarter round trim in cobalt blue. This identifies the cobalt blue 
It also identifies the prominent colors found in the selection made in the pond. 110 Marine Way was a prime example of the Mediterranean Revival architecture in 1937. Sam Agra noted in the placard, as you pull into the Marina District, there's a placard there. And 110 Marine Way is on that placard. And everything that Sam Ogren did, I respected. I tried to respect. And that was an example of the Mediterranean Revival architecture. Villa, okay, next slide, please. <clears throat> This is a Villa Granada, number five, the location above the front door. Prominent colors here are the cobalt blue and the gold. Slide number three, this is slide number three, and slide number four, depict the same prominent color Sam Ogren had in 1937, which we all know is an example of the Mediterranean Revival architecture that we're using on the placard upon entering the Marina District. So three and four. Okay, that's the four, okay. Well, Let's go to five. All right. Okay. The site has always been an eclectic in its approach to the tile work. And what I mean by that, there was a variety of different tiles. I mentioned that before. Five different, five, three, two. Five different designs. Five different designs. And they were all, you can do this in a plethora of different ways. I mean, it could have been put away this way and this way. You, you play lottery, you know how that goes away. It could be done many ways. Villa Verona number four, the location surrounds the front door. The pattern and the field tile are prominent colors. They're turquoise green with gold and cobalt secondary colors. This slide depicts again the prominent colors, but points out the field tile. And it's an example of the Mediterranean Bible architecture and marine district. Next slide, please. This is what's there now. And this is with the help of my local expert, Tom McToof, at Casa Ceramica. We chose this particular tile, uh, which we thought was the most appropriate tile that blends the previously pre matches up with the previously installed, installed tile work. And we'll show you a side by side in a moment, but this was a hand painted tile for the pond. This was authentic 1920, 1939 Mediterranean Misner Moorish reproduction from Casa Ceramica. Pretty impressed place. Uh, he, uh, his, this establishment is a really impressive place. I feel like going and being in business with him myself. Sli slide number six, that depicts the actual hand painted tiles. Mm -hmm. The gold, the cobalt blue, the turquoise, mentioned in slides two through five. This is a, the next one is an actual side by side of the uh, sunflowers that were also representative around the project. Um, this is depicting the actual colors. You can see the turquoise green in here. You can see the the cobalt blue we picked up, and we picked up this. Uh, we picked up the gold in there. I think we did a good job with that selection. Uh, I, I don't take all the credit because I think Tom and Peg were a big help to me. But, I, but we spent many hours looking for this, and I think we did a good job there. <clears throat> and that was actually, we go to the next slide as well. Um, that's again a slide by slide. This is actually the top surface of what the pond was, but again, here we are again, where this product was used over in different areas that are still exist on the property right now. And this is what we had to replace with. And let's go to the next slide, number nine. This goes back to April 6, 2019. The bottom of the pond had no tile lining inside of it. Only four by four field tiles at the top trim inside. So it was included, we, I included this because this four by four tiles ended at the level of the field tiles and the water line. But so we didn't have any, I just want to get it clear, I didn't have any tiles down there. I didn't get cheap on anybody. I did, I did exactly what was there before. I replaced what was there before. 
I didn't, I didn't get cheap here. But I, God knows I didn't get cheap. Slide 10 through 13. I want you to read now that letter that I got from Tranquil. Please read that letter real quick. Because it's not me. You know, I'm a second generation Italian. My grandfather was from the old country. And he was a tile, he was a tile mason. My uncle was a tile mason. My cousins were tile masons. I was a little boy working with them. This is not my, I, I know this. I know what's going on here. I don't want to act like an expert because really my expert is really medicine. But here we go. Slide 10 through 13. I'm going to start with 10 and go to 13. But this is what I was up against. I had multiple cracks that went right up to the surface. This thing, this actually, this pond was acting <laughs> tongue in cheek, spaghetti strainer, prior to the structural repair. The pond was severely compromised from bottom of the shell all the way to the top surface, requiring many stainless steel staples which they held the concrete together after, after they, what they were doing is they were hitting with a sledgehammer on all these sections, they were hitting. And they found all, like seaside, that, what's that, the building went down. They were hitting this and it was totally compromised from water and rust. The whole place, I'll tell you, I'll be honest with you all. I probably should have filled it in with dirt, kept the thing, and been, everybody here would have been happy. But, I, I brought this back to life, for God's sake. And I put these staples in there. But when you do that, you come to the surface, and these things fall into shards. They fall into, and I couldn't save it. And they had to waterproof it on top of that. So let's go to the next slide. And this is what I had before. I had missing sides of the tile on the side as well. And, and uh, I can't see that real well. Um, and then if you look at the bottom, there is a hole that goes down in through the top, through the structure. That all had to be repaired. Go to the next one, please. There was a water running out so bad here that it was pushing all the dirt out. When the pond came up through rains, we'd get all this water rushing out and it would come out. So it always rush out, would lose the soil out of there. So this is just one section I'm showing you, but this thing was all compromised. But this now is, it ha, it's back, it's been brought back to life. It has been brought back to life. So what I'm saying here, the selected slides are an example of a larger percentage of missing quarter rounds, damaged tiles, as well as missing cracked tiles, making this project difficult to rehabilitate. But the deal killer came was when the number of staples needed to repair and get waterproofing. It came from a replacement, a, a rehab to a replacement. And you talked about that. This project, as completed, was barely economically feasible. But to replace and remanufacture every single tile would be entirely cost prohibitive. We're talking about, what, four or five hundred tiles? So I think <laughs> you went through all, all those. I think we have. OK. So here we are, number. More damage. Okay, got one more showing the damage. Okay, that's a quarter round and broken tiles, broken, and it's along the side. Okay, but the real, like I said, the real deal killer was when we had to replace it, and waterproof it, and put the staples in. Okay, uh, let me. I'd go to number fourteen. Okay. <clears throat> This is a historic photo. I don't know where you got this peg, but it's good that you got it. Uh, the center courtyard showing the garden bed surrounding pond. This is what it looked like. If you can look carefully at it, it showed the, actually, the vegetation all the way to the top surface. You don't even see the field tile that I put in there. I might keep it a little better than that. It's a little overgrown. But it shows and depicts the planting in the surrounding garden bed are grown to the top of the pond. Number, next one, please. 
The additional view of the pond with the surrounding garden, planting and the historic photo. And I'm going to show this next slide, but I hope we don't have to go there. Okay? But this next slide is, next slide, please. I did a Photoshop, not, I'd go, go to backwards, please. I Photoshopped this, and understand, understand, please, this is not finished growing. When that's finished, you won't see that. But this is Photoshop, what I could do as a compromise. But to be honest with you, I think it's a total waste of my money, and no one's ever going to see it right now anyway. So. Finally, let's get to the last slide, please. And then we'll, I hope we get the video, please, okay? This depicts, is also using the shrubbery and landscaping in connection with the features of the grounds which mask the tile. We continue to do the same by replicating the landscaping, planting, bordering the pond, keeping in the design as close as possible to the original. In summary, the standards do not require exact replication. And in fact, highlight the practical solution should be found and give consideration to the economic in respect of the cost of replacement. This is exactly what I did. Exactly what I did. I really want to go back to this uh, video because I don't want anybody to say to me that I did this on my own. I did not do this on my own. I did this with a professional who knows a lot more about this than me. That's right, there you and go. I, I just want to make this point to this board and to the people here in this audience because I heard a lot of things before. Okay, so I just want to make sure I'm getting this point across. Okay. D drive. Yes. There it is. The cast of that one. The cast of that's it. There. Okay. Tom, can you identify yourself? Yeah. Where's the Bible? Tom McTrue, founder of Casa Ceramica. Uh, been in business since 1997. Uh, this is our niche, the Mediterranean old Meisner uh, Moorish tiles. We sell in uh, California and all the Sand Belt states. Our tiles are handmade and hand painted. Uh, it's really uh, what used to be done since the year 1400. And uh, we're a member of the Tile Heritage Foundation. We're a member of the Tile Council of North America. And if you Google Casa Ceramica, it will show worldwide that's what we do. It's just the Mediterranean tiles. You can see what we do carry. And uh, the uh, selection is wide, authentic, and available. You, you answered clearly how they're manufactured and where they were manufactured. They're ma manufactured in Tunisia, Carthage, one of the oldest uh, states with this 3,000 years of culture. They're hand-painted. Uh, the glazed are imported from Italy or Spain uh, and uh, manufactured to the European norm. And we, this product is uh, worldwide recognized, and Tunisia is one of the authentic uh, country in the ceramic tiles. So, and then you addressed that they were hand painted. Okay, are these considered era appropriate of the Meisner time frame? I know you just said that, but go I ahead. confirm these. We, that's what we do. It's uh, the so these are appropriate for an historic building built in 1937. The answer is yes. We, uh, you can see, we even remodeled some in Santa Barbara, the authentic uh, uh, courthouse built in 1920. We did recently restoration in um, uh, Montecito in California. We did some here in Palm Beach in uh, five, all the Sun Belt states. That's that's a destination. Uh, can you address the selection that we selected particularly, and where we place those? Are you able to do that? Uh, based on the picture you provided me, some of the tiles uh, are really of the air of the miser and the selection. You did your best to be as close as possible to the authentic installation. Maybe you can address the field tile because they were kind of they were kind of befuddled. They don't the seem to think the field tile are even in the era, which we actually have solid field tiles in the property from originally 1937, but she seems to think they were done later. 
everyone is entitled to his uh, right. own opinion. But the tiles are selected, they're uh, machine made, but the glaze is uh, one of the authentic uh, colors, especially the blue cobalt and the uh, orange. Uh, right. Because they were, they, it dumbfounded me when they were saying over and over, like many of them, that the cobalt blue is a garish color. And I'm like, Gar cobalt blue has been used for centuries. Absolutely. And uh, if you look at the history of books, the cobalt blue came from China, the era of the tra silk trade, and that's how they get that particular cobalt blue. I know the answer to this, but will this particular tile we picked stand the test of time? Well, if you can live 300, 400 years, uh, yes. Okay. And I know you answered this before, but is the tile we chose era appropriate for the historic property built in 1937? The patterns and the colors are really uh, reminiscent of that era. Thank you very much. My pleasure. And, uh, <laughs> I want to thank everybody and I, I don't know if you're interested in feeling the product, seeing the product that we put in, but here it is. If you do, you, you're welcome to pass along. Thank you again. If we could, we'll just pass it to our, our board <coughs> secretary and she'll take some pictures of it just so that it's in the record too. Of what? The, the tiles. Oh, we have them. Oh, okay. Great. Are you going to continue or are you complete? We'll complete this portion of the presentation. We hope that uh, if there's board discussion, you have an opportunity to call upon us. We feel strongly that certainly the words visual compatibility are met. It, 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 is, it is not uh, the standard that each person gets to pick a tile that he or she wants. It's whether or not there's visual compatibility. I say that to the board with the greatest respect, um, but I think you do understand that it is not a personal preference that you are um, asserting tonight, but whether or not someone has done the effort to cross over the requirements <coughs> under the LDRs. Thank you. We're here, we really would enjoy any, any questions. I think this was yours. Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Michelle, I just had a quick question before you got into your presentation. Yes. I feel like we've seen this presentation before, like a month ago, and we sent the applicant back with direction. So are we saying, is the applicant saying that they're not taking our direction and they're resubmitting their original um, project. So, so I, I think, you know, what I heard that it's a proposal to compromise, correct? Which was not um, coming back with what the board requested of them. They're coming back with a compromise, a request, re modifying their request. Would you like to see that picture again? The, yeah, the, the slide number 16. Was, the, the so, compromise was, was not, I, I didn't see what the compromise was. I like. think Michelle put that in your, uh, your staff report that I think it was number C, if I'm not mistaken, uh, what I saw come across my email. I said, if you have to, if you have to give me a compromise, then do this, but don't make me rip everything off and okay. do it all over again. Let's, we're just asking to see the proposal. So... Compromise. This is a proposal, which um, maybe what I could do is go through my presentation because I have a similar slide. Okay. Because I know that I think there were some board members that may not have been here for this. I'm not sure, but at least I get on the record and then you can communicate with the applicant about the, his specifics. Would that be okay? Yeah, yeah that's good. Just I, it wasn't. I, I wasn't clear to me what was being presented. Yeah, it's a, of, uh, a modification. And I'll go through that when I okay. do my staff report or my presentation. So Michelle Hoyland, again, for the record, Principal Planner in the Development Services Department. I have quite a few slides. I'm not going to go through all of them, but I included quite a few in case the board had questions based on the last presentation. 
So the item before the board is 110 Marine Way, COA 2021-239. This is an application that's being requested uh, for the property that's located at the southwest corner of Southeast First Street and Marine Way. This is in the Marina Historic District. Uh, the specific request for the Sam Ogren um, designed property is to modify the fountain tiles, which this was a, a result of work that had been completed prior to permit and then was a resulting um, special magistrate irreversible, irreparable uh, finding of guilt. And the special magistrate remanded that or required that the property owner come to HPB to get approval of the modification. So I'm just going through some photographs, historic photos. I think one of the last questions that came up in October was about landscaping around the fountain and um, its condition. So here we have the fountain and its condition prior to the work commencing. The original site plan, as I um, showed you earlier slide, was to remain as is. Um, this photograph depicts the sunflower tiles very clearly, which you can't see clearly on this. Um, these zoomed in pictures is that there are there were different kinds of tile on the top. Uh, this is the work that was being done on site, which obviously once we saw this, we engaged a special magistrate. Um, I'm going to move a little bit quicker through this. If, if someone has a question, I'm happy to come back to it. This is what the fountain looked like post-completion pre-landscaping. Um, the orange tiles on the outside, orange or yellow, um, the navy blue cobalt on the inside, and on top there are decorative tiles which the applicant has indicated um, were designed in a similar fashion. You can see them in more detail here. These pictures were taken maybe a month ago. I met with the owner on site to get a few more photographs and talk about the project. Um, and it, it does have a koi and lily pads, and it is being utilized as, as a pond. This is a representative photograph that I did the best I could. Um, as I understood, it's not exact. So the location of the tiles isn't exact. It was really just more of a mock-up. They're talking about intermittently adding um, three sections of tiles on the north side of two tiles each to create the sunflower three tile sections on the south side and one on the east side. So there would be a total of 14 tiles that would be created as a replica of the original tiles and they would remove a few sections and in incorporate that into the design. The tiles on the top would stay. Um, this is a photograph of the specific tile that, you know, a close up when um, they were removed. So we, we got a few photographs of those tiles. A few more photographs here on the bottom left is the older historic photo. The upper middle corner or upper middle is before the tiles were removed and the right side is post removal. Uh, we do have photographs of the doors. We don't need to heavily focus on this. We're merely showing you that there are tile surrounds that are decorative tiles throughout the property for the front door of four of the villas. Um, you can also see the tile is used on other things such as planters. Um, you can see down there in the bottom right hand corner of the left picture, those sunflower tiles. Those are the same tiles that were on the fountain. And the tiles that are around this door were the tiles that were on the top level of the fountain. Similar, same tile. The field tiles as we referenced, those are used throughout the site for all of the side doors with a decorative motif in each corner. Um, this is the historic marker for the Marina Historic District. Um, this marker specifies the property as being a prime example of Mediterranean Revival architecture in the Marina um, District that they were designed by Sam Ogren um, and that at the time this marker was put in the mid-2000s, it talked about their original detailing having been preserved. As normally, we do provide you with the standards that are analyzed in the staff report. Um, this is the analysis that was in the original staff report um, that talked about the importance and significance of the tiles um, and that they were there when the original building was constructed in the 30s. 
Th this is a reference to our historic preservation design guidelines. Um, so what are the recommended approaches? What surface materials um, are looked at when re referencing accessory structures, which the fountain is? This is the National um, Secretary of the Interior Historic Preservation Design Guidelines. And the approach when dealing with building sites, and there are a number of applicable um, guidelines that we addressed in our last presentation as well, includes fountains. Um, and that removing of character defining features that is unrepairable and not replacing it is a problem. And I think what the applicant has indicated in their presentation is that some of those tiles were not repairable, um, so they replaced it. These are the visual compatibility standards for the local LDRs. Again, analyzed in your staff report. And we talk about visual compatibility and the alteration um, of those tiles. Comprehensive plan, this is standard for every presentation. These are the requirements that the board makes findings that an application is consistent with the LDRs, the Secretary of the Interior Standards, and the design guidelines, as indicated in your findings. And now that brings us to public comment. So if we have public comment, we can move to that and then the next part of the process. If you could just do ex parte communications as right before that. Board members, have there been any ex parte communication? Uh, I was forwarded an email uh, from the presenter and I uh, walked around the site today. Mel, and no further communication. Same for me. I received the email, but I've not had any communication. Uh, I received the email as well. I received the email as well. Two emails. Okay. Do we have any public comment? Uh, good evening, Mr. Chairman, board members. My name is David Schmidt. I'm an attorney here in Delray Beach. My office address is 766 Southeast Fifth Avenue, and I am representing Angela Marsh and Robert Brunel, who uh, reside and own 101 Southeast Seventh Avenue and 105 Southeast Seventh Avenue, respectively. Those properties are immediately to the west of this property. Um, my clients object to a certificate of appropriateness being issued based on the work that the applicant has done uh, without a permit uh, and coming in after the fact. I think it's important to note, um, you know, we want to preserve historic structures if we can. And the original design that came in in 2019, the architect was very sympathetic and aware of the historic nature of, of the buildings and trying as best that he could in what they were proposing to preserve uh, the original structures. And it's interesting to note on the site plan that was submitted and approved, and I quote, existing pond and decorative fountain to remain as is, okay, not to be changed. All right, if you look at the renderings uh, as well as the site plan that were submitted back in 2019, all of the tile around the doors was to remain in place, it was not to be replaced. And so keeping the pool and those tiles the same would be consistent with the original Sam Ogren design. Um, just pointing out a, a couple of things, and I know it's touched on as in the staff report, but in the uh, presentation from the applicant, the tiles that he showed for Villa Number no. 5 are the same tiles that were on the pool. So they tied in aesthetically and architecturally. Second thing is the applicant did not say that it was not possible to duplicate those tiles. Um, and in touch, responding to Mr. Weiner's arguments, and I'm just going to pull a couple things out of the staff report here. It says that 
It's important to note the historic significance of the tile as they are original to the 1937 construction of the property and believed to have been designed by Addison Meisner. With regards to the subject request, the fountain was constructed with the same original tiles and is an accessory structure that has continued to contribute to the overall historic integrity of the site. And the fact that it's an accessory structure is important because under the standards, um, Standard 6, deteriorated historic features shall be repaired rather than replaced, where the severity of deterioration requires replacement of a distinctive feature. The new feature shall, shall match the old in design, color, texture, and other visual qualities, and where possible, materials. Now, Mr. Weiner's argument is that, well, we did a similar material, and it's visually compatible, so that's sufficient. Uh, and just to finish up, because I know I'm out of time, uh, standard nine um, says that the existing, well, it's a contributing structure, which I've already touched on. Um, yeah, I'm sorry, I'm building site. As Ms. Hoyland noted, um, if you replace a feature that cannot be repaired, uh, then you use as physical evidence as a model to rep reproduce the feature, and examples include a fountain. So I think you should deny the certificate of appropriateness um, and require the applicant to duplicate the tiles that they removed without a permit. Thank you. Is there any other public comment? Seeing none. I do not have any rebuttal of the applicants. Is there any no no rebuttal or cross examination from staff? Is there any rebuttal or cross examination from the applicant? Yes, we do. I, I appreciate what Attorney Schmidt had to say, um, uh, but in a sense, he has proved, actually in more than a sense, he's proved that we are correct in the tile choice. So the Oxford Dictionary defines a match as to correspond in some essential respect, to make harmonious, no words of duplication, that is not the requirement, and in fact, you'd be doing violence to the standards of the Secretary of Interior, because it is not to have some faux type of, of, of uh, uh, tile. It is intended that with a building such as this, that it be visually compatible. Now, I know about the other hearing, and and. I know that there was an ask, but the ask was without really examining the requirements under the code and what the essence of the building and the protection of historic structures are all about. So if you feel, first of all, there's no retribution here. You heard it. There's, there was irreparable damage before the code enforcement. I think you all know that doesn't feel good, and I think you all know there are fines there. What we want to look at is whether or not this solution crossed the hurdles, which all center on visual compatibility, all center on match, all center on harmonious, and never center on duplication. If you set a standard that's different than what's in your codes, you're going to be doing violence to, to other historic structures in the future. Satisfaction inside, the, the word aesthetics was mentioned. It never says it must be aesthetically pleasing to each of the members of the board. And it may say, well, then I can't vote for it. But you can, because you want to uphold these standards, and you want to have an appropriate approach. 
to every historic structure that may come before you that will, in fact, carry out the essence of it. If you feel that somehow or another, and, and I know that the word garish was used, but garish isn't in the code either, but if you feel somehow or another that there has to be some kind of homage to the sunflowers, then please, Dr. DeLeonibus's solution is there for you. And um, as you deliberate, I, I, we're more than happy to come to the microphone. I think you, you can hear the passion in, in his voice. Um, he, he now is, a, is, is much better at LDR reading than he ever was before, but that's not the issue. I've gone on too long. Thank you for letting me speak. And, and again, we're here to, to try to make you feel comfortable about the decision that you're making. I'm good, thank you. No further rebuttal. No further buzz? Okay. Um, we'll move into board discussion, and um, I'll start, and I just want to try to make this as simple as possible. Um, my position hasn't changed from a month ago. Um, I didn't like the field tile then. I don't like it now. And um, I, I kind of resent the fact that we gave direction to the applicant, and, and they chose not to take our direction, and so I'm not going to support this. Okay. Uh, I've knocked this thing number once. I'm not going to do it again. Um, I'm sorry for all the frustration. I feel it in your voice, and I see you, and that's never good for the historic board to have people so frustrated. Um, these are not our rules. They're the rules that are your rules, and they're the rules we have to follow. Um, I'm sorry it's gone awry. I know you've spent money, but we could have saved you all that money if you had come to us in the first place. So twice, we, you had an opportunity to save the money. Um, I feel that we're very well supported um, by the Secretary and Interior Standards uh, to ask you to replace um, with uh, replication of the product you know nothing can replace the original um, I know that I tried to listen I had a little bit of trouble hearing the sound but I know you talked about the cobalt blue being used at the time etc etc however it, it wasn't used in this particular situation it absolutely was. not allowed to speak Mr. Delanovas and um, this is a very kind of emotional, there, this is a citywide, people are in love with this place, and um, I, we would be remiss not to ask you to replicate the tile. Um, there is one question I have though, I know that you will be um, removing some tiles in your future renovation, uh, and I think they're the field tiles. Can those field tiles be saved and reused? I really can't comment on that right now. Okay. All right. That's all I have right now. I, I just want to make one comment. I know you guys have seen this before, but if, if you do want to just d continue to recognize the standards that you have recognized in the in the past hearing as well, just to reiterate what, what you've said before as well, too, if, if, if you're still of that same opinion. <coughs> Uh, that wasn't directed to you okay. <laughs> specifically. <laughs> okay. Just letting you guys know. <laughs> I feel like the only thing that we can go by is the Secretary of Interior Standards. I mean, uh, it's very clear. Um, Attorney Smith, you know, I had written down the exact same wording that he did, and it says that if you have to change something, it will match the old design with the color, the texture, and wherever possible, the materials. So I don't see that that has any leeway in making an arbitrary change that this uh, applicant brought to us. Um, of These colors were, and this pattern are not shown on any of the buildings that we've seen uh, pictured. And I 
think that just to go into a nice shop that has nice tiles that are similar is not what they should have done in the first place. We have given them direction and I think that, for my opinion, I think we need to stick with the original uh, design. It was a uh, Meissner-esque, uh, <coughs> even Meissner designed this tile. So that's even more important to our historic um, fiber of this particular building. I can't support keeping the tiles that were installed. I guess uh, my decision rests on uh, two words uh, in trying to parse those. One is the word match, and one is the word replicate. I'm not sure I understand in this context what match means. Is a yellow tile match a yellow sunflower? Uh, maybe, maybe that's just a, a, a judgment call, but I do know that replicating a sunflower produces a sunflower. Uh, and so I think I would tend to go toward the word replicate rather than match. And I, I think in this instance, both of those words pertain, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong on that, Michelle, but uh, I certainly understand in a clearer, objective way what replicate means. I think it's, this is what I have on the screen for you all. It's been identified in the staff report as well. This is taken from the Secretary of the Interior Standards and Guidelines. So the discussion throughout um, that book talks about replacement. That's where we are right now. If you are having to replace, that you use the physical evidence as a model to reproduce the feature. So I think we're spending a lot of time debating the jargon of match and reproduce. If you read what's on the right, it, that says replacing it with a feature that does not match. I think the idea here is that if you're in a situation where your material cannot be salvaged, then you're looking at um, you know, re reproducing that feature. There's other sections too, if you refer to the staff report. This is the repair section. This is another section here about protecting important site features. Match or uh, I don't see either of those words going from a decorative sunflower, something that is clearly hand painted, that is a design to a Sour. solid color. I don't, I don't see replicate or match in it, it, that. To me, it doesn't matter which word you use. It, it's not on the right hand side under rec not recommended. It says removing a character defining feature of the site that is unrepairable and not replacing it, or replacing it with a new feature that does not match. Right. And then on the left, it talks, of the word that's used is reproduce. Underneath the not recommended says, using a substitute material for the replacement that does not convey the same appearance of the surviving site feature. So I'm sorry, I, I was not, I don't believe I was in the previous meeting on this. Am I understanding correctly that essentially the pond was not, none of those features were to be removed at that time? They did not plan to remove those features, so the board said to move with the direction of just repairing the pond, but, but it was not the the owners plan to remove them at that time? So I'll just do a quick synopsis um, to give you that background. You can see here on this um, slide, mm -hmm. the, pro the property had a class three site plan modification approved a few years ago, which included um, additions to the four cottages. They were small additions to the side. There was also a second story addition approved on the rear building 
um, as well as site improvements such as landscaping, improvements to the wall that surrounded the site, irrigation. The pond, which this is a zoomed in picture of the approved site plan, which that's the approved site plan and we zoomed in here. Mm -hmm. The pond was to remain as is. And no permits have been pulled for the site or the fountain. And we had received a report that there was work occurring on the site. And we went out to look at the site on April 30th. And this is the condition we found the pond in. Then at that point, um, we coordinated with code enforcement who organized the special magistrate to review the case. And the special magistrate did. Um, that occurred, I cannot see that far. I want to say it was June. Um, I think it says June 17th. June and 17th. the special magistrate said, go back to HPB, work out the approval, get a COA approved. The applicant submitted the COA request for an after the fact in removal of the tiles mm -hmm. to get what was approved or what was installed. Mm -hmm. um, they, were, they initially came to the board to request approval of this. Mm -hmm. When it went to the board in October, the board continued the request and provided the applicant with direction to replace, come back with a proposal that was replacement of all the tiles with tiles that matched what was there or replicated what was there. The applicant talked about it with staff on what their options were um, procedurally mm -hmm. and came up with a modified request as a compromise and said that they would have uh, 14 tiles replicated in the sunflower pattern and installed around the outside edges of the fountain. And that's what's before you tonight. I'm sorry if I missed any of that. Or if someone thinks there's something else I missed, please let me know. No, I just wanted to mention keeping that in mind. Um, part of that was dealt by code enforcement, so that shouldn't be a consideration of yours in, in making any determination here sure. tonight. Absolutely. No, I just wasn't clear on what the board had given as, you know, when did this come about? How did it come about? And what was our direction? Because so that, that doesn't I, seem yeah. to fit the direction. No, and, and I actually think that this compromise of the 14 tiles is worse than What's worse? Either, either solution. I have a question, Michelle. What, what is this that they passed around? That tile is the tile that's on top of the fountain and the quarter. Picture. So you can see the right scale here. This totally different, isn't it? This is the. And this green is not that? Yes. It is? Yes. That's a quarter round. I meant to ask a question before under rebuttal that I didn't ask. No, the caller's not right. No. I, th I think they're in board discussion at this point. It, it, if they ask you a question, yeah. okay. you can comment on it. But at least that would explain why you said they had two opportunities to come to the board, right. and they didn't. Right. And so then they came after the fact, and, and they were aware they that if they were going to change anything, that they should have come to the board before they changed yes. anything, and they did not. Can I ask Michelle if she had a comment? Certainly. There was just a photograph in the, one of the applicant's presentations that had a star here, and I didn't know if that was a new feature or a Christmas decoration. Okay. Thank you. I have a technical question for Diane. Uh, can we only do a motion in the positive? Because there's a site plan technical item that says D as deny. And I thought we could only do. And so you I'll, I'll, I'll respond yeah. to that. Yeah. So that um, site plan technical items portion is actually just related to that option of motion C. Um, and, and there's just no site plan technical items that she noted on it. Um, that's just part of the form that comes out of it. Oh, so it uh, have to be you could done. still do deny certificate of appropriateness as, as your D. And you guys are always also welcome to make your own motions it's a, it does, we do not have to always be positive we can deny you ready to make a motion you mean negative i think mm -hmm. so yeah. 
Any more discussion or we ready for a motion? I'll make a motion that we um, deny the certificate of appro appropriateness 2021-239 request for the property located at 110 Marine Way, Marine Historic District by finding that the request is inconsistent with the comprehensive plan and does not meet the criteria set forth in the land development regulations. Second. Secretary, call the roll. Discussion? Discussion, sure. Um, as an alternative, would it make sense to repeat the directions that we gave the last time? Rather, and I, I, I don't have an answer myself, I'm legitimately asking the question, as opposed to outright denying it, to reiterate what we decided back in October. That's, that's up to you guys. Um, typically, if you're going to continue with direction, um, I, I would seek their advice of whether they would prefer a denial at this point or a continuation with direction just because, you know, that, that can um, debate can, the amount of time that they have moving forward. They can also approve with the condition that the tiles be replaced. I mean, we've had. I think if, if you're going to approve with conditions that all tiles be replaced, though, you're essentially denying it. So I, I would just look to Mr. Weiner to see if you'd approve, you'd rather have a continuation with direction or a denial. Yes, I, uh, there's very strong emotions about this. Um, my client is sitting here. We would prefer that if you feel that it must be a replacement of all tiles, maybe, maybe you might consider replacement of just the gold tiles, but. Again, um, uh, we respect this board. Um, we feel differently about what the standards are, but that's we made our best case. So, if you would be kind enough to do that for us, we get it. And, uh, I can't. Uh, please don't 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 uh, believe that uh, Dr. Gileonovus's is um, feeling of coming back to the board for a second time to make his presentation. He likes what he has. He, he, he likes those tiles. So if you'll understand that, we, we get it. Either replace all the gold ones or replace all of them. Thank you. We'd appreciate that. So I'm sorry. So you would prefer a continuation yes. with direction yes. at this point or just a, a we prefer a continuation with direction that, it mu that if we return, it must be, and then fill in the blank for us, a replacement of all tiles or a replacement of just the borders. I'd like to get well, I mean, if, if we're at the point where the, the board has a motion on the table, which they have to vote, and the applicant's saying continue with direction, perhaps it's not a continuance with direction, it's just an approval with what the condition is, whether it's just the outside tiles, just the top tiles. Because I'm hearing him say, he, he would, Mr. Weiner said, replacement of the gold, which I think he means where the sunflowers were. Um, maybe there is further discussion for the board to have with the applicant. I don't know. Well, like, what, why wait a month? I don't know if I'm off on that. I know, do you want to come back? We, we, we understand, um, again, um, made our best case. It's obvious that you, 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 you have come to a different conclusion as the words match and and uh, visual compatibility. We understand the importance of the project. If you tell us to replace all the tiles um, and, and give us direction on, as I say, all the tiles or, or, or just the ones around it, then uh, get it. Um, we uh, I mean, are you understand asking what has to be done. We'd, we'd only have to come back here and, and guess at it once again for you. And all that we want to do is not guess. So any kind of direction that you tell us, we, we completely understand. Okay, I think what, what Mrs. Hoyland is trying to say is just that it, if they gave you an approval with conditions, mm -hmm. then you would not have to come back to the Correct, board that's what we're hoping to receive. Okay. We, or, or they can you. deny it and... Right. I just didn't understand, do they want the approval or do they want a continuation and delay a month? No, we, we would like the approval with, with specific direction so that we don't have to go through this again. We don't want to put them through this again. 
we, we, what all that I'm asking is, is that the, whatever the conditions are be clear enough that we'll, we'll be able to satisfy it and, and uh, do it. Is that in yours or mine? Your presentation? It's in mine as well? Sorry. I know you're technically supposed to go to the dais. The I, I, I'm, yes. Peg, you, you, won't, you want to come up here and just repeat what you said? We're, we're also. We're, we're in the middle of a motion right yeah, now. Yeah, yeah. Look. We, all, yeah, I hope I'm making myself abundantly clear. We would like. Approval with specific directions. Oh, are we in discussion? Or are we no, in we're, motion? We're in a mo discussion of a motion. <laughs> yeah. You're, Can I vote on that, and then, and then if it doesn't pass, then we make another motion? Or? Uh, at this point in the discussion, you're, you, you can make it, somebody can ask to amend the motion if you'd like to make it a motion for approval with conditions. That way, it, it can just get done and it's a, a finished decision, or, or you can. You can. If our conditions are the same as they were that we direction that we gave them at the end of last meeting, um, how do we? <laughs> Approval with condition is a final decision, so that means that it actually has to be done, or it's subject to code okay. enforcement. So, Michelle, does uh, is there somewhere where we can read back our direction from last meeting? Again, sorry, wasn't here, but um, the. Last meeting's direction was to replace all the tiles with replication. Including the top tiles? Yeah, top, inside, and outside. Because there's cobalt blue ones on the inside at the water line. The solid ones. You want to see this again? Could I suggest that we withdraw the motion that's on the table? Sure. Uh, I'd like to rescind my motion. Well, Mr. Chard made the motion. Oh, I'm sorry, Rhonda. You did my mistake. That's okay. Okay. Yeah. And what I would propose is let me get the language right. Um, in general, to approve this uh, certificate of uh, appropriateness with the conditions that this board unanimously supported. In October. No. Let's get a second, and I'm just going to. Second. Okay. If, if you could just read the full full um, motion out, just so that it has everything in the record, and you can actually say the condition that was just mentioned. <laughs> well, I, I I will do that. I was just discussing with my board. Yeah. There might be a consensus around that. Okay. I'm sorry. I didn't understand that. I thought that was a motion. No, that wasn't yet a motion. Michelle, I'm sorry to be difficult. Can you put back on the screen the original tiles? Inside, top, and outside. Um, this is why I should never miss a meeting. So I'm the so sunflower sorry. there are... Time. The, the sunflower that's in this picture mm -hmm. are the original outside. Huh? Um... Okay. This Can picture, you could see the inside was inside like a light blue. Finish. It should have been, okay, so it should have been the same as the quarter round. The inside should have been the same as the quarter was, round that. It was like a light blue, mm. a seafoam okay. green maybe. And the top tiles, the best representation I have for that is actually in a door. So I will show you that. Um, and you guys don't have to say the exact name or the the design you could just say replicate the tiles if that's if that's the intention of the board all of the tiles so the picture on the left is the tile that was on top so they do still exist on site around door surrounds so that was on top the sunflowers were on the sides and seafoam gr sea green was inside Would you like me to take a, a shot at this? Yeah, take a shot. 
All right, I'll make a motion to approve Certificate of Appropriateness 2021-239, request for the property located at 110 Marine, Marine Way, Marina Historic District, by finding that the request and the approval thereof is consistent with the comprehensive plan and meets the criteria set forth in the land development regulations, subject to the following conditions. Conditions would be that all tiles are replaced with replica tiles to match the original. Second. Discussion? Good this time? All right. Call the roll, okay. please. Robert Ostinov? Yes. Lisa Lindstrom? Yes. Rhonda Saxon? Yes. Claudia Willis? Yes. Jim Chard? Yes. And Jim Baffert? Yes. <clears throat> okay. So we're going to move to 9C? Yeah, so... Um, All right, how do I get back? Mr. Sloan? Your item was rearranged to the number C on the agenda. Good night. Um, can we get the tiles back for Miss Delp? Thank you. All right, so um, 9B is actually 212 Seabreeze Avenue. And I'd like to enter the file into the record. Um, I can get to it, which is 2021-102. It's for the individually designated property known as the Sewell C. Biggs House. Um, the applicant and their team are here, and they will present to the board um, next. So you guys want to come on up? I'll get you set up. Marco, would you like me to get started while you're setting up? Or are you set up? Sorry? Are you set up? Yeah. I'm sure the board is glad to see me return to the microphone. <laughs> Thank you much, very much for all your deliberations. I mean, we, for, the, for the record, it's Michael Weiner with an address of Broken Sound Parkway, Boca Raton, Florida, my business address. I'm here on behalf of Mr. and Mrs. Marco with respect to 212 Seabreeze. Um, we, have a, we, have a, we have a similar situation. And again, I have a very passionate client. Um, and uh, 
he will be making the presentation. Mm. In, in this particular instance, I understand that it is a reconstruction. I understand that it is a major uh, uh, reconstruction with respect to the site. Um, the, the same standards apply. And once again, with respect to 4.5.1e, you have similar hurdles. They aren't larger as a result of it being the situation we're in. You just have the hurdles they have. In this particular instance, far more has been, far more resources have in fact been associated with this particular project than almost any other in Delray Beach, Florida. And as Mr. Marco will explain to you, when the situation um, went bad with respect to the condition of the house, he realized that he had to enlist the assistance of the city and did so by employing Mr. Heisenbottle. H has he arrived? Uh, uh, yes, thank you. Uh, I understood you were stuck in traffic. I'm glad to see you here. And some substantial reports, in fact, came forward. Uh, in pre-shadowing or shadowing what, 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 what you're going to hear, I think you will find that those reports, in fact, give us a bright outlook with respect to this particular house. Once again, this, there are code enforcement matters that are not before you tonight. The idea is that with respect to where the situation stands now, what can we best do so as to move forward a historical site, a historical project, and a historical house? And I think you will hear from Mr. Marco that in fact he has a plan that meets all criteria and requirement and which the expert for the city agrees. With that, let me turn it over to Mr. Marco, who will tell you the journey he's been on and how it is that uh, I believe we will have a major contribution to the historic fabric of Delray Beach, Florida. Roger, Michael? Roger will say a few words. Oh, all right. Do you think he needs to advance this? I apologize. <laughs> Mr. Cope no. will be coming to the microphone and then introducing Mr. Marco. When I present the working from here. You can do it from here. That's fine. He can do it from here. Well, uh, board, for the record, Roger Cope, Cope Architects, Inc., uh, 701 Southeast 1st Street in the National Marina Historic District, diagonally opposite the Marina Villas. So thank you for making the decision you did uh, on the prior item. That was very important. Um, I'm simply involved in the project now to uh, aid in the reconstruction, the loving reconstruction of the home. Um, this is a, the 1955 Paul Rudolph House on Vista Del Mar. Uh, the goal from day one, I, uh, I have been an architect for the Marcos prior to this project uh, and have grown to love them and to understand uh, their passion about historic preservation. Uh, we as a team, uh, prior to their purchase of this property, successfully uh, to completely renovated 55 Southeast 7th Avenue also in the National uh, Marina Historic District. Uh, and I can attest to you that the demolition that occurred on that project was just as great, uh, and in some instances uh, greater than it, it, it has become on, uh, on this Vista Del Mar house. But uh, the goal of the Marcos, uh, both of them, uh, is simply to put the most original home back on the map uh, which is uh, a goal that they had from day one. It, it will continue to be a goal, and it will be uh, the end product once we uh, are allowed to move forward. Uh, when they purchased the property, it goes without saying that uh, the existing conditions uh, that you'll see in a few slides when Mr. Marco gets up uh, was almost unrecognizable. So there, there were so many additions to the property that uh, the property had to be stripped down to the original before you, the original became evident. Um, the degree of the demolition is certainly an issue. 
It's an extreme degree. Uh, but in my professional opinion, you can't restore something uh, without peeling back all the layers of neglect or inappropriate additions or in, in the, many of the cases in this structure, uh, deteriorated structural elements. Um, this, is, this is an iconic home. Let's make no bones about it. It's, a, it's one of the classic glass boxes uh, of, of this era. Uh, others of which are, are Philip Johnson's glass home in New Canaan, Connecticut, and uh, the Farnsworth House in, in uh, uh, just outside of Chicago in Peoria, Illinois. Th this is just as important as those, and, and those homes, uh, uh, I would safe to say, uh, have had significant uh, renovations to them as well, especially the Farnsworth House in Chicago. It floods, floods every few years. Um, I've reviewed the, the drawings of this project, uh, both from a demolition standpoint, the new structural standpoint, and the new architectural standpoint, and they're a fantastic set of documents. Uh, so I want to just offer the testimony that documentation on the project has been uh, supreme. Um, and so uh, my job with them and the team moving forward again, in conclusion, is to make sure the house is put back uh, in, in, in as pristine and original condition as possible uh, from every two by four uh, on and the outer uh, uh, walls to the aluminum louvers uh, that repl that we that we uh, have photographic evidence of uh, to the, the wooden joists that make up the roof system uh, and I'll be on site as a, as a field supervisor and a architect to help to help make sure that this project, is as loving a restoration as humanly possible. And uh, the bottom line is that, uh, that its historic designation is, is not an issue, not in doubt. Um, there's been a testimony by everybody involved that if put back together, it shall remain uh, an individually designated uh, property and something that the entire city can be proud of. And I'm very proud of the fact that I was in this room when Virginia Courtney came in uh, I don't, 15 years ago or so and uh, applied to have it designated. So, so that's my testimony this evening. Thank you. I'll be available for questions at the end with everybody else. And now I'd like to throw it over to Mr. Marco, who will give you a very detailed presentation on uh, the history of the construction of the project. Thank you. Good evening, I'm Mike Marco, 212 Seabreeze Avenue, owner with my wife, Nina Marco, of the Biggs residence designed by Paul Rudolph in 1955. Most of the current board, I believe, was not a were not here when the COA was approved in May 2019. I think Ben Baffer was here. I don't know about any of the others, but I'm thinking you were not here. So what I wanted to do first in my presentation was to go over where we are today and how we plan to go forward. So my intention is really to present it as straight as I can, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Um, I want to state clearly from the start, it's not my intention to somehow justify that everything we did is right and that everything came out exactly according to plan. It did not. I think you'll understand better as I'm going through the timeline why things happened the way they did. But in hindsight, the most important thing I think I really need to say is we should have reviewed everything I'm about to show you ahead of time with historic staff to get the appropriate approvals. That's the way it should have been done. That was our mistake, huge mistake on my part. So hindsight's 2020, and they say foresight's legally blind. That's what happened here. Everything we did, though, we, we did with one purpose in mind. We wanted to bring back the original design. So you can see there, and this is the original design from 1955, as designed by Paul Rudolph. We wanted to bring it back, preserve the historic property, but in a sustainable way for the future to be used as our family home. But as you'll see, things went awry. 
It's all, as I said, it's always been our intention, always will be our intention to bring back the original Paul Rudolph design of the house. i just show you again, just for your reference. This is the, and the original historic front of the house is on Vista Del Mar. That's why there's some confusion. Vista Del Mar, Seabreeze. The address is 212 Seabreeze. The original front of the house is Vista Del Mar. The address, I think, was originally, oh, I forget the exact number, but I think it was 1963. They changed the numbering system on Vista Del Mar, and they gave it a 212 Seabreeze address. So this is the rear of the house. Michael, they want you at the microphone. Why don't you just, just move me down? I'll So again, that's the Vista Del Mar, original historic front of the house. You can even see there towards the left, the walkway from the street into the house. This is the Seabreeze side, again, approximately 1956, 1955. The Seabreeze rear side was originally the vehicle entrance. We're keeping it the vehicle entrance. The address is now 212 Seabreeze. We'll just keep that address, even though the historic front and our reestablished front of the house will be Vista Del Mar. So, like I said, we've always wanted to restore the original Paul Rudolph design of the house. But the reality is, and I'll show you as we're going through the slides, with all the alterations that the house endured since it was originally built, and considering the dilapidated condition of the existing house as it was, it's impossible to do that without a reconstruction, a total reconstruction. I'll show you documentation that the existing house, when I say existing house, I'm referring to, sorry, no, the ones where it says Seabreeze facade at time of COA approval and Vista Del Mar facade at time. So when I say the existing house, that's the existing house prior to the demolition and reconstruction. That's really our starting point. I'll explain it in the presentation. That's what the house looked like when we started, when we got the COA. And the, I'll show you details, but you can see the original front of the house, what we're starting with when we got the COA, that's not the same house. And I'll show you in the slide present, extensive alterations are made to the house to the point where what we started working from was not the original design, not the original house. So we received approval in May 2019. We received approval for COA. Our architectural plans were approved. We have not changed those plans. We're working with the same plans. They're better drawn now with more detail, but it's the same architectural plan with the only difference being we're raising the elevation to seven feet, or we already raised the elevation to seven feet. That's the only difference. So we're working with the same architectural plans. Nothing in this application now impacts or changes or affects those plans. I think Mr. Heisenbottle will address that in his presentation. So we're not talking about changing any plans. We're working with the same plans already approved. The purpose of this request is, the sole purpose, is to get, for lack of a better term, after the fact approval for the elevation change and for the demolition with the reconstruction plan, the concept of doing demolition with reconstruction. So I, I also want to emphasize what probably the single most important fact, and again, Mr. Heisenbottle, I think, will address this, and he states in his staff report, the plans comply with all the requirements of the Secretary of the Interior standards for reconstruction. So let me, let me just repeat that. The existing plans we have, architectural plans, that were already approved by the board in 2019, the resubmission of those plans now complies with all the requirements of the Secretary of the Interior's reconstruction standards. It's very specific standards for reconstruction, I think Mr. Heisenbottle will go into them. We comply with all those requirements. So now I'll start this uh, 
presentation. I don't have to be Vanna White anymore. <laughs> um, I'll, brief, I'll point, as we're going to the presentation, I'll point to certain Let's boards. But, but let, me just, let me just go through them quickly. As, like, this is 1956, Sea Breeze Vista Del Mar. There's a photo there. And again, we'll go through the presentation of a, an addition made in 1980. Those uh, 2019, that's, what, that's our starting point. That's what we're working from at the time we got a Those COA. Two. The bottom right is a rendering of our reconstruction of the original design. That's, what, that's what's in our plans. That's what was approved in March 20, uh, May 2019, and it hasn't changed. It's the same architectural plan. The only difference being it's raised to seven feet, the current building code. And we're basically focusing on now as a reconstruction. We did not emphasize in the May 2019 plans that it was a reconstruction. It is a reconstruction. It had to be a reconstruction. Mr. Marco, can you just confirm all these pictures are already within um, your justification statement or yeah, the they're timeline? They're, they're or? in here too. Yeah. Okay, There's great. nothing new in here. Excellent. Thank you. Okay. So here, this is just the same, same photo of the original Seabreeze rear view, 1955. <clears throat> This is another shot taken probably 1955, 1956 of the sea breeze rear view there. This is the same shot on the board. In 1980, 1981, there was a, an addition that was approved. And what happened is they totally enclosed that ground floor, whereas before it was an open air ground floor. And the owners at that time, it was not a historic property at that time. It wasn't designated historic till 2005. So they totally enclosed that ground floor. And as you'll see in some future slides, made some other non-historic alterations. That's the Vista Del Mar view of that 1980 edition. You can see that whole section underneath the main house, the original house, the original house being the second floor. Uh, some, well, they got approval then because it wasn't historic, but it, it totally changed and, and destroyed the original design from Paul Rudolph. It's another view from another angle. Again, the second floor there, that's well, the remnants of the original house. Underneath it is that large piece that totally enclosed the ground floor. That's a view straight on from Vista Del Mar. So not only did it totally changed the, the, the original design, but it, it blocked. It blocked the, the original front view of the house. Uh, what they did is on that addition you saw sticking out, they built a deck. And what's important here is if you look on the right, that white siding you see, that's the remnants of the original house. But if you notice, in the original house, it was not closed off with that siding. It was a wide section, I think it's 30 feet wide, of those louvered glass panels. It was never closed off like that. The owner closed it off and added <laughs> sliders. There was never sliders on this house. You can see the sliders there. So that's the, you're looking at what they did to the original house that totally changed the design from what was there originally. You'll also notice they added on this heavy air conditioning equipment, which I'll get to later. So this is the view of the house. And there's another on the right side is another addition they made in 2008, and that's a view basically of the house uh, when we bought it, 2018. So it's got that 1980 edition underneath it, sticking out to Vista Del Mar. It's got the 2008 edition. This is a view, an aerial view at the time. So the original house is in the middle. Again, you'll note all that equipment on the roof. You'll see that you can almost see the, the roof caving in. This is back in 2018. You'll see the 1980 edition in front of the house and the 2008 edition behind the house. So we received a COA for demolition in 2018. And we received permission to remove both of those non-historic inappropriate additions in order to bring back the original house, just so we had the original design house. Yeah, and that's the front view. We received permission to re remove all those non-historic additions. 
So that brought us to here. That brought us to 2019 after we removed the non-historic additions. What you're looking at there is the Vista Del Mar view. At the time, we received a COA approval in May 2019 with the plan rendering on the bottom right. That was our plan to restore the original design. If you look at that house, what we started working from in May 2019, that's not the original house. That's not the original design. You can see the whole characteristic center middle section has been closed up and, all, and the glass has been changed. So we're not working from the original house here. This is the sea breeze view. After we remove the non-historic additions. This is our starting point. This is what we're working from. Okay, so the first thing, uh, we received our building permit. We applied for building permits September 2019. We received our permits. This is after we got our COA. We received our permits March 2020. So the first thing we did is I uh, have some, just as some background here as far as the change in elevation. Uh, our COA at that time, like I'm saying, the only difference in our plan is our COA at that time included a request by us to keep the existing six foot elevation of the house. All right, we wanted to retain the existing six foot elevation of the house. The reason on that was we didn't want to start cutting the structure, raising the structure. We didn't want to start messing with it. It's a 65 year old steel structure. We say, leave it as it is. Six feet is, is the FEMA base, base flood elevation. It's not, it doesn't uh, conform to Florida building code or Delray beach code. In this area, the code is seven feet. But because it was a historic building, we asked for a variance to keep it at six and we were granted a variance at six. That it turns out was a mistake. And early in the project, and I have some quotes here because I want to talk about the elevation. Uh, these are three city officials, Steve Tobias, chief building official, Elizabeth Perez, plan review, Patrick Lyons, structural plan reviewer. They all indicated to us early in the project, before we got our permits, before we got our variance even, that they thought we should be building at seven feet. I'll just quote from Steve Tobias. My thought would be in the AE zone, that finished floor would have to be six feet for FEMA, plus one foot for the Florida Building Code for a total of seven feet. That was, again, before we got our COA, early in stages of the project. Elizabeth Perez, when she reviewed our plan, she even <coughs> mentioned, she said, she put a note on there that even in spite of our variance, she said, if the first floor is to be used for other than storage, parking, or access, the finished floor elevation needs to be designed flood elevation of seven feet per Florida building code. Patrick Lyon, project must comply with FEMA requirements, which is seven feet. So as we get to this issue with the elevation, keep that in mind. All three city officials were encouraging us to go to seven feet. Of course, we had the, var the variance for six feet for our own reasons. So to understand about the elevation change here and why we made the elevation change. This is the FEMA map, uh, what's called the Special Flood Hazard Area, AE it's in. Uh, the house is where that blue eye is in the middle. So we're, we're in the AE zone. The base flood elevation is six feet. It's very close to the intercoastal. It's two lots away from the intercoastal. This is a, a map produced by the city when they did their intercoastal seawall survey. So Vista Del Mar is towards the right center top of that. All those seawalls there are color coded and most of the seawalls closest to Vista Del Mar are rated either poor, serious, or critical condition. And that's literally, like I said, feet from the house. We're not on intercoastal, but we're very close to it. So in that 1980 edition, and you're looking at from the sea breeze side, you're looking at where they enclosed the ground floor. You'll see those steps going up to the house. I think there's six steps, about three and a half feet. They've physically raised the structure. They raised that existing steel structure about three and a half feet because at that time they had to comply with the uh, elevation code in effect. So they raised it to seven. I don't want to get too detailed here, but the seven feet back in 1980 
is not the same as seven feet now. They had a different data system. So they raised it to the data to the system in effect at that time, which was seven feet NGVD. Now, when you do the conversion, that seven feet is actually five and a half feet, where we are, where as, as it's measured today. So the house as I bought it was at five and a half feet. We didn't know that though. We thought the house was at six feet. So we go to work. We get our permits uh, in February, beginning of March. The first thing we do is we clear out everything that's underneath the house there. We want to get to the, uh, to the bottom there, to where the pile caps are. You're looking at the, there's four steel columns that support this house. All right, they're tied into a piling system. That concrete uh, triangle you see uh, underneath the column there, and then there's a plate. It's sitting on the, uh, that plate is sitting on the concrete. So as soon as we clear this all away, and this is below grade now, the grade in this property is of natural grades about two feet. It was totally corroded. So we call our structural engineer. He comes to the site. He says, you, you got to stop. You can't do any more. You got to cut out this steel and you got to replace it with new steel. That's the letter from uh, our structural engineer stating we needed to do that repair by cutting out the steel and putting in new steel. So we call this cribbing crew, this is March 2020. There's a cribbing crew with a specialized uh, equipment. They raise, you have to raise the house before you cut the steel, obviously. So they raise the house. That shows a guy cutting the steel. So we're cutting out the bad steel and adding new steel. Now while we're doing this, we're checking all the, the finished floor elevation. We're checking all that. And that's when we discover, uh-oh, the house is not at six feet. It's at five and a half feet. Now, six feet we thought we could get away with, and we got a variance because that's the FEMA flood elevation, but the house is not at six feet. It's at five and a half feet. Again, that's supported by the fact that the previous owner raising it to seven, that's the equivalent of five and a half today. Probably we should have realized that, but we didn't. So we're checking all the, all the numbers, all the elevations. We want to make sure we wanted to reset the house at the exact same finished floor that it was. But unfortunately, we find out while the house is up in the air, it's at five and a half feet. So we had to make a decision in real time while that house is up in the air. I made the decision. I think it was the right decision. Did I do it in the right, exact right way? No, I didn't. But I had to make a decision in real time. What do I do? Do I reset this house at five and a half, which is dangerously low and probably be uninsurable? Do I reset it at six because my bar variance says six? Or do I reset it at seven, which is the current building code, seven? So I made the decision, set the house at the current Florida building code, which is seven feet. I had this background information from three city officials saying I should have done seven feet all along. So that's the decision I made. That's just a photo of that. Literally, this steel was dissolved into like a white dust. I don't know what chemical composition it had, but it was badly corroded. It had to be replaced. That's the new, we, we welded in the new steel column. Okay, so that's, that's where we are there. Um, so we fixed the problem with the bad steel. We, we reset the elevation to seven feet. Mr. Heisenbottle, in his initial review of our plans, he stated, although we, we should have sought approval for the change, we should have, I agree, the change was justified. The fact that the house had already been raised, the fact that the building code is seven feet, the fact that we're having to deal with uh, coastal flooding and rising sea levels, it's almost a no-brainer. The house has to be seven feet. There's numerous houses under construction on Vista del Mar now, Every one of them, and renovations, every one of them is being raised to seven feet. Numerous people in the city I know doing renovations on their house, not, not building new houses. That, of course, has to be done at seven, but renovations. If you do a significant improvement or renovation, you have to raise the house to seven feet. So now we're in the reconstruction. We've raised the house. We're in the reconstruction phase. So I, there's just a quote there from our structural engineer, Taylor Kalkin. Uh, he's been involved with the project from the start. 
So I'll just read it. He did a thorough inspection of the house. He made numerous site visits. He was very familiar with the structure. So here's what he said. Since the damage at structural wood members at roof level and second floor, roofing, rafters, roof sheathing, wall studs, fascia, subfascia, on and on and on, are at excessive levels where total section losses and loss of strength are observed. I recommend total removal of the damaged roof and second floor wall system and rebuild the structure as per permit plans issued by City of Delray Beach Building Department. Construction methods and materials are outlined in detail on sheets S2 through S7. So he drew those structural plans. They were submitted by, as part of our permit plans. Our permit was approved. So we had approval, in our mind, our understanding is we had approval to do exactly what he said. He also said, until necessary demolition is performed on the upper level of the building, the damaged steel structure cannot be fully accessed. In other words, you have that box. This is basically a glass box. I'll go into detail later. It's sitting on top of steel beams underneath it, and then there's four steel columns at the corner. There's beams going all the way around it. That box is sitting on top of the beams. So he's telling us now, and this steel is 65 years old. And we know we got corrosion problems. And he's saying, until necessary demolition is performed on the upper level of the building, the damaged steel structure cannot be fully accessed. Appropriate steel structure repairs shall be applied on the existing steel beams as per repair, deal, repair details provided. So that's enough. Aside from the completely dilapidated structure on top of that steel beams, we couldn't get to the steel beams until we removed what was there. So that's what we proceeded and did. This is details from his report. It's in, it's in the, uh, I assume it's in your, in your files. And it basically goes into great detail of, on every structural element, why it had to be removed and replaced. If we didn't do that, the house was not gonna be safe. It wasn't gonna be structurally sound and he, basically told me, if you don't do this, the house is, at some point, it's going to collapse. So he went through all the details of all the elements to be removed. So now, okay, we've done the, we've made the elevation change. Uh, again, this is what we're working with now. This is the sea breeze facade prior to removal. So the important thing here to, to see and that's the same photos in the top right board there. From end to end, you're looking at a wall of glass. Now you're saying, that's not all glass. I see louvers there. Well, the louvers are on top of the glass. Behind every louver panel there is glass. So that's glass, 100% glass from left to right, with the exception of that beige plywood towards the right that was covering up the, an opening uh, that the original, that that addition had. But that whole wall is glass. So now we, we start to proceed to remove that glass. We had approval in the COA of 2019 to remove all this glass. It was not to code. It was a mixed batch of all kinds of different glasses from the last 65 years. None of it was impact. And the important thing is here, none of it is set into a wall. Every piece of glass, and you can see this guy pulling out a panel of glass. When you pull that glass, that panel out, there's nothing behind it. There are no structural walls. So as they go from right to left, taking out that glass, what do you see at the end? There's nothing there because there is no structural wall. As they're removing the glass, they're removing the louvers. The louvers also, we had approval in the COA, May 2019, to remove the glass, to remove the louvers. I don't think there's any controversy or disputing that. We had that in our plan. It was approved. Everybody knew we were taking out the glass and louvers. Uh, what probably nobody visualized, and it seems obvious now, 
You take out the glass, you take out the louvers, there's nothing left. You see through the house. So, you know, I'm not an architect, I'm not an engineer, I'm not a builder, I'm not a lawyer. Do I understand every line and every note and all these plans? No, I don't. But my understanding was, and the, ar the architectural plans called for all new glass, all new louvers, and plywood siding. So yes, I knew that. Did I know that the structural engineer drew plans that had a new roof and new wood elements in there? Yes, I did. But did I visualize ahead of time that if all this was done at one time, and let me go back here. July 15th was timestamped at 158. They literally started that day, removing, removing the, uh, the glass, the louvers, and the rotten wood. By 254, like an hour later, that whole side's done. Now they go to the other side, the Vista del Mar side, they start doing the same thing. They gotta remove the glass, they gotta remove the louvers, and they gotta remove the rotten siding. And all that wood underneath there is totally rotten. That's a picture of the siding. It was falling apart in my hands. Now we knew probably we'd have to repair, replace the siding that was in our COA plans. Did we know we'd have to replace all the siding? No, but we knew there was a problem. <clears throat> we did take uh, special care to, to measure the siding. This is one of the few good pieces of the original siding. So we have that. This is the siding we're going to replace it with. Wood siding, exactly the same. Not, not a match. A re I don't even want to call it a replica. It's exactly the same. Exactly the same. Only difference between this is what they call T111 plywood, which was known to have problems. This is a, a rot-resistant hardwood, but the specifications and dimensions, exactly the same. Oh, I'll, I'll get to the louver. So did I visualize uh, ahead of time that, you know, within hours, everything would be gone? No, I didn't. And, uh, you know, no one else did either. No one ever even brought it up, not the architect, not the engineer, not the builder. You know, and we were circulating these plans for six months. We're all looking at the same plans. No one ever said to me, uh, Mike, you know, if you take off the glass and the louvers and the siding and the roof, there's nothing left but the steel. Now, I, in hindsight, it's, it's pretty obvious that was going to happen. But at the time, we didn't discuss it. We didn't even visualize it. But, you know, it is the owner's responsibility to know the code. And the code is if you remove more than 25% of a historic structure, you need a special COA for demolition. I didn't even think about that at the time. But that's the code. It's the owner's responsibility to know the code. I'm the owner. I take responsibility for it. I get it. That's why I'm here. This is another shot showing that you What's important here is that we're looking at the roof. The roof was never designed to hold air conditioning equipment. There was no air conditioning in the original house. The air conditioning, we think, was added on with the 1980 addition. The roof was never designed to hold all that air conditioning equipment. This, I don't know if you can see it. Is there any way to enlarge this to zoom in? It's in our staff report. That's in the report. <laughs> Well, what you're seeing there, I went to the city of Delray Beach. It's a permit verification site. It'll give you the history of all the permits on a given property. And what you're looking at there, and maybe you can find it in your, in your package, is the siding was repaired and replaced in 1996. So first of all, we know it's not the original siding. And second of all, if they had to repair, replace it in 1986, I mean, you can just imagine 25 years later, what condition that siding in. It was in horrible condition. And you'll see there are four different times, starting I think in 1990 all the way through 2006, 
Four different times they replaced the roof. So we're looking at the roof. Now this is a close up, a section of the roof. And you can see there, there's four or five different layers. So they didn't fix the roof. They didn't install a new roof. All they did was slap on another roof on top of the old roof, compounding the problem, adding more weight, never solving the problems with the water penetration. So after four botched efforts at fixed net roof, that roof was compromised, totally compromised. It had to be replaced. Now we get to the louvers. So we took off the louvers, and every single louver, and every louver we took off, and they're, they're non-working, by the way, they're all seized up. But every louver panel literally had Courtney's name on it. I don't know if you can see it. Every, so everything, the manufacturer of these louvers was, was Courtney's supplier. Courtney didn't buy the house until 1973. So we know that's not the original louvers. Can't be. It's got Courtney's name on it. We had approval to, to remove those louvers. And we had approval to remove the glass. And we had approval to remove the siding. So that's what happened. So this is the end result. You complete removal of the glass, the louvers, the siding, the roof. Uh, mm -hmm. That's what's left. That's li so you look at it, July 16th, 10 o'clock in the morning. It's less than 24 hours later. So it all happened very fast, happened very quickly. So you might say, well, well what were you thinking? Well, I didn't quite know what to think. It happened very fast. I mean, the, the amber lights were flashing, but I was told it's in the plan. The contract is, it's in the plan. He showed me the plans. It's in the plan. You got new glass, you got new louvers, you got new siding, you got a new roof. I got to take out the old before I put in the new. Did I realize he was going to do it all at once in one day? No, but I'm told you give those same permit plans to any contractor, same thing's going to happen. It's inevitable. Now, at that point, uh, the city stopped issued a stop work order, stop construction. They didn't allow us to continue the uh, concrete work pouring the slab. So that's a photo after the glass, louvers, wood, and siding are out, August 24th. That's a photo just a few months ago. Basically, nothing's been done since then. So it's been sitting there like this, well, since August 2020. So 15 months, 16 months now. Uh, that structure's been sitting there. Luckily, in that time, we did complete the concrete foundation, and we completed an extensive rehabilitation of the steel. It took us three months just to fix that existing steel structure, but we thought it was important to do that. That's from the Seabreeze site, what exists now. So now, how do we go forward? So I have this quote from Paul Rudolph. Architecture is not a question of the purely theoretical if you're interested in building buildings. It's the art of what is possible. So what is possible here? We could not keep the original design, which was not the original design. We had to demolish the structurally unsafe parts of the building. So now we have this original steel structure, we need to reconstruct it. That's the only thing possible. There's, there's no other plan. There's no plan B here. So um, when I first came before the board, uh, when I got that demolition COA in 2018, I said to him at that time that when I came before the board that what I didn't want to do was just to restore a museum that nobody lives in. To me, that's not historic preservation. Uh, you can't just paint, patch, and pray with, th with these houses. You have to know the house is safe and sound. You can't be in denial. We live in, in a very harsh environment here in South Florida, very vulnerable to climate change. It's going to become even worse. It's just a fact. So we wanted to make, keep the original design but we needed to reconstruct it so it's safe and sound. There's just, there was just no other alternative. 
again, the mistake we made is assuming our plans were clear to historic. They were not clear. I take them for their word they're not clear. I, I get it. We should have gone over everything I just showed you. We should have gone over that with historic. Make sure everybody's on the same page. We didn't. That was our mistake. So going forward with the reconstruction, this is a uh, from the Secretary of the Interior reconstruction standards for sustainability. And that's key here, sustainability. Vista Del Mar, is, this house is located on Vista Del Mar, probably on the lowest spot of one of the lowest streets in Delray. The street itself, I think, is about a foot above sea level. So it's prone to flooding. Our reconstruction took that into account. Like I said, the plans we're submitting now are the same plans that were approved in May 2019. The difference is we raised the, if you look at the finished first floor there, you'll see four steps going up to that. So what we did is uh, we basically terraced the grade of the property. You're starting at one foot in the street. By the time you hit the, our outside wall of our property, it's about two feet. We, the other side of the wall is about four feet. Then we went to about a five foot pool deck. And then that deck you see, uh, it's hard to see, but if you see around the house under the, on the ground floor, that deck's about six feet, seven inches. And then the, house, the finished floor itself is about seven feet. So we terraced it up to make it as gradual as possible. One of the criticisms of our previous plan, even though it was approved, was the house was kind of sitting up too high, like almost on a tabletop. Had too many steps going from the grade around the house to the house. So we've minimized that now. So it's actually, it's actually better. We've managed to meet the current building code, which is seven feet. And at the same time, we reestablish more of the built on grade appearance of the original house. So reconstruction, just a, a brief discussion of reconstruction because there's a lot of misconceptions. What is reconstruction? Is it allowed? I know Mr. Heisenbottle will go into that, but some people don't accept reconstruction, although the Secretary of the Interior does. And all of our, all of our work here in Historic is based on Secretary of the Interior standards. Secretary of the Interior accepts reconstruction, if it's done right. So just to give you an example of a reconstruction, that's a photo of the Barcelona Pavilion. Mies van der Rohe designed it in, I think it was 1929 for Barcelona World's Fair. After the World's Fair, it was completely destroyed. Nothing left of it. They rebuilt it from scratch but in the same location, from the same plans, I think it was in the 1980s. So now I would say that's one of the most iconic historic buildings in the world. Hundreds of thousands of people, not millions of people, have visited this house. It's a total reconstruction. Does that mean it's not historic? Of course it's historic. This is the Paul Rudolph Umbrella House in Sarasota. So it was not totally destroyed, but a, a hurricane went through there, I'm not sure how many years ago. And the most iconic part of that house is what they call the umbrella. That's, that goes over the house. That was what was, that's the uh, characteristic design. That whole umbrella over the house was destroyed and blown away in a storm. They rebuilt it. I'm not, I think it was about 10 or 15 years ago. So again, is that is not, not a valid historic house? Of course it is. But some people would say, no, it's not because they re you, you rebuilt the umbrella. I don't agree. This is another Paul Rudolph house, the, what's called the Walker Guest House. That was totally dissembled and moved to California a few years ago. So is, is that no longer a historic house? Well, I think it is. Now, I've gone one step beyond all this because what I'm doing, and this, by the way, is the cocoon house, also designed by Paul Rudolph. That was totally restored and rebuilt, reconstructed in, in 2020. It's still an iconic historic house with a reconstruction. Uh, 
Roger mentioned the Farnsworth House. So this is the kind of things that not just our house, but many historic houses are facing these environmental challenges. Every few years it floods. The last time it flooded, completely damaged the inside of the house. I don't know what the, I don't know how they've resolved that problem of the flooding. They're talking about moving it, raising it, but it's subject to flooding. What do you do? Do you leave it there? Do you not move it? Do you not raise it and let it get flooded every couple of years? It's going to be gone. So what I've done is I've tried to, and I've done it in this house. This is the 55 Southeast 7th Avenue house. Before I did the reconstruction, my idea, my, what I, my guiding principle is, if it's deteriorated beyond repair, if it's not built to code, if it's not structurally sound, that material has to come out. But when you reconstruct it, you go as close as possible. So we went from this to this. But everything was reconstructed very carefully. It won an award, the sir, AIA Palm Beach Presidential Citation. Sir, just for a matter of relevance, if we can move on to the, your specific That's actually the last one. So okay, thank you. That's what I did. That's what I did before. That's what I'm going to do again. I'm going to do a very faithful reconstruction. No expense spared. And at the end of the day, I think it'll be an amazing reconstruction. The city of Delray Beach will be proud to have it on there historic resource designation list and we'll be proud to live there so if you have any questions or anything else any clarification no okay I just had a quick question before you get started, um, to be clear. Um, Mr. Heisenbottle is a consultant for the city. Was he engaged by the city or by the applicant? So Mr. Heisenbottle, um, if, if you give me a minute, let me get set up and then I'll explain. Okay. So um, 212 Seabreeze Avenue, the Sewell C. Biggs House, Michelle Hoyland again for the record. Um, Mr. Heisenbottle, Richard Heisenbottle uh, of RJHA, which is his company firm um, name, was engaged by the city of Delray Beach initially to um, do an assessment on the property after the um, demolition occurred. And he did an assessment and provided a report to the city. Then the applicant submitted their request. And upon the submittal of the request, the city um, spoke with Mr. Marco and offered him the ability to engage Mr. Heisenbottle as a third party um, reviewer. So Mr. Heisenbottle did the technical advisory review of the whole project. He's been involved since the beginning, um, has reviewed the TAC comments, for this, all the plans, provided comments to the applicant and did an, a second round with them as well. So he's fully engaged in the third party review and his contract also included the preparation of the staff report that you have before you, the presentation that he's going to make now. So 100% um, Mr. Heisenbaugh is representing the city on this review. Okay, so he's going to continue. I, I don't know what more I can add. I think most questions will be fielded by, by Rich Heisenbottle unless he needs me at, at some point. All right, so I've wiped everything so, down. So you can do I'm mouse sorry. this or the... Oh, I'm good. Okay. I'm good. Thank you very much, everyone. Uh, just once again, to bore you to death, for the record, my name is Rich Heisenbottle with a little raspy voice tonight. I'm president of RJ Heisenbottle Architects, otherwise known as RJHA. 
Um, my offices are at 2199 Ponsley on Boulevard in Coral Gables. Ha have you been sworn in, Mr. Heisenberg? I have I not been sworn in, so would you please? Ms. Miller came for you. Anybody else needs to be? Okay, please raise your right hand. By the authority vested in the notary of the state of Florida, do you swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but I do. Thank you. Okay. Uh, and, and before I start kind of the second half of uh, tonight's presentation, I want to thank uh, Michael, Mr. Marco, and, and his wife, and Roger, uh, for, for actually giving a very, very thorough and, as I deem it, very accurate representation of exactly what happened. But I've, I'm afraid I've got to go over what is some old ground first. Um, from a legal perspective, so that you, to, to remind all of you, I don't know if everyone, uh, was anyone here during COA number one? Uh, or, yeah. No, I, I was not on the board, but I was well, here. Well, okay. <laughs> you know, or, or COA number two, some of you were. In, in any event, I need to bring you up to speed a little bit before we worry about what, what, we, what our business is tonight which is really going to be the most important business, but not notwithstanding. So, so if you don't mind, I'm going to try to go through uh, some of the history, as Michael did, but in a much briefer way, uh, so, that, so that we're up to speed. And then we'll address the issues of the day, and we'll see if we can't put those issues, uh, issues to rest. Uh, as, as we all know now, uh, um, the, the size of the house and, and, and that it was designed by Paul Rudolph and it is really one of those great examples of 20th century regional uh, modern architecture uh, and, and, and Roger was listing off all those other great houses. You forgot I am Pei's personal house. Ah, I didn't even know about that. Go home, look it up. Uh, <laughs> we all know, I, I believe, where it is now. We've, we've heard Seabreeze Avenue and Vista Del Mar many, many times, so, so I'm not going to uh, belabor you with that. And you've all seen uh, all, of the, all of the great photographs of how pristine and pure this, what was, a, uh, a great piece of artwork uh, by Paul Rudolph really was when, uh, when it was completed back, uh, back in, in the 50s. Uh, and... We also know that through the course of, of time, uh, a lot of things happened to historic buildings. You've, you've undoubtedly, especially sitting on this board, seen it. Uh, how they've been uh, sometimes, sometimes altered and sometimes uh, severely altered in ways that are not always sensitive and certainly not always in accordance with the Secretary's standards. And, and uh, an old friend that has passed away, Bob Curry, uh, did an addition to this house in uh, two editions to the house. First edition in 8081 and, and what's the bad, what was the, and, and, and a, a second edition in 2007. And I must say, these it did not, neither one, even remotely, did this house justice. We would never have accepted them today. None of us would. Uh, but, but at the time, it, at the time, it was deemed acceptable. And at the time, it was probably deemed good architecture. Heaven help us in the 1970s, Roger. How do we, how do we get through the 1970s as architects? You know, they should have tied our hands behind our back or something. Uh, it was dangerous. Um, but but uh, going forward, that's exactly what uh, the Marco team had to, had to deal with uh, to, to, uh, to restore uh, this property and turn it into a home that everybody uh, can in the community can be proud of. So, so we have the first thing that happened is we have a certificate of appropriateness application number one, uh, 2018-076, and that certificate of appropriateness gave the uh, authorization to demolish those two non-contributing additions that you already know about. It made, uh, it recommended uh, revocation of the tax credit, just an incidental item, not important to us uh, today. And it had a couple staff recommendations, staff conditions that went along with it, with it, excuse me, not with it, um, with it. Um, the North Edition would be retained until the new building permit, uh, blah, 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 and, and the uh, kitchen is obtained. And, and uh, the ad valorem tax credit would actually be repaid. Uh, very simple, very straightforward, but that was going to at least allow them to see what really understand um, 
the extent of the original house. Um, and during that time, uh, it was just interesting to note that the board members actually asked, um, you know, can they come back in two months and say that it, it was rotten and they had to knock it down? And, and, and that's this, uh, that Mrs. Uh, Hoyland says, uh, the applicant would need to file the COA for demolition for that. And the long and short is it is just a unique situation that has occurred here. Uh, but everyone was concerned about demolition from, from day one. And a question number two, uh, can this uh, require a bond? And all sorts of discussion ensued. But at the end of the day, I believe that the board even suggested probably raising the house, Michael. Uh, and, and then at the end of the day, we decided not to. And at the end of the day, no one was worried about demolition. And so, and so everything went forward. Um, then, and this is the result of that as, as uh, has been shown to you before, um, after, after the, demo, uh, the demolition. Then we have the certificate of appropriate application number two. And, and that uh, was actually revised in January of, uh, uh, whoops, I'm doing it again, uh, January 23rd, 2020. Um, the applicant there is at that point is requesting a true certificate of appropriateness for the design of the entire building, uh, a variance for the pool, a, um, a variance for the uh, retaining the six foot finished floor elevation, and uh, waivers for the addition not to be subordinated to the historic structure. Again, uh, the plans are reviewed, everyone agreed, and, and, uh, and all things uh, happily went, uh, went forward. Uh, and this is just the site plan for, for the house at that time. You can see the pool in the front uh, and, and the, the garage and the carport in the back. And, and they presented some very wonderful designs that were very, truly a very uh, sensitive uh, additions to, uh, to the Rudolph house. And you're seeing some of the early renderings of that. This is Del Mar South rendering and, and the Seabreeze Avenue rendering and, and, the, and the garage entry and that side. Now, um, so, so that's, um, that ultimately resulted in the approval of the permit plans and the approval of the construction documents and everything began to move forward as, as Michael has previously described. Um, but this level of demolition and removal that occurred was never presented nor discussed in the HP board hearing and was not discussed anywhere in the justification statement that was submitted by the applicant. And we all know that that's a requirement of the city of Delray land development regulations. And that is, that is uh, the, the, probably the most important element of what has, uh, what got in the way of this project and, and pose the challenges that we've seen uh, over the last year. Um, again, you, you know what this looks like already. It's been shown to you what the outcome was and, and uh, thoroughly explained as to why it occurred and, 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 and ultimately uh, how it occurred. So, so what are the issues before us tonight? Because it's not about the design of the house like it is about so many others that you're gonna hear tonight. It, this, the, tonight we have the, the challenge of dealing with two issues. Uh, the property has been reg-tagged and constructed, construction halted by the building official uh, pending this investigation, which we've all conducted at this point, uh, into the demolition work that was done to the structure in uh, July of 2020. And that demolition work did, in fact, exceed what was authorized by the Historic Preservation Board and the previous COAs. Uh, the other issue here is that the owner raised the structure in violation, again, of the approved COA without advising the building department or seeking historic preservation staff or even or, or board approval. So, so uh, I can get into uh, details uh, of that and, and the conversations that, that Mr. Marco and I had in, in the field. And we, you've heard the explanation before as to how the house, we thought it was at one elevation, it turned out to be at another elevation, and, and now it's really at the correct elevation. Um, and, 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 but those are the things we have to now uh, try to tr uh, justify and, and make legal. And so uh, in, 
and going forward, clearly, clearly they're raising it to a, an elevation. Uh, seven is a great idea. <laughs> uh, so, so we'll leave that there for a second. Um, so um, to just run through uh, the, some of the code enforcement division uh, issues, uh, an, an exterior and exterior demolition was conducted prior to obtaining the permit. We, we already know that. Uh, the work was conducted that exceeded the scope of work. It was done without the public hearing. That's what we're having tonight. And an exterior and exterior, uh, uh, interior and exterior demolition of the historically designed structure exceeded the 25% of the structure that is required under, under uh, the code. Okay, so much for that. Let, um, in summary, the COA that is before you tonight includes a request for approval of the following. Approval of after the fact demolition. It, it's approval for a change in the finished floor elevation to the plus seven NAVD and approval of the contemporary reconstruction of the existing historic structure. We've all seen the justifications. Um, the, you just, as you probably know, the violations were heard by the special magistrate in February, and the special magistrate found that the res, uh, respondent, uh, the property owner, was in violation and ordered the property owner to submit a new COA within 60 days and to appear before the Historic Preservation Board to address concerns from the city staff. Uh, no fines were assessed, and effectively he sent he sent the property owner back here for exactly what uh, we are uh, hopefully going to do tonight. Uh, and, and I uh, believe that Mr. Marco went through this earlier, but I'll, I'll run through them perhaps a little bit more carefully again. Um, fortunately, the U.S. Department of Interior does provide guidelines uh, for reconstruction. And, and they define it clearly as the act of duplicating uh, by means of new construction, the form, features, and, and detailing uh, of a non-surviving site, landscape, building, structure, or object for the purpose of replicating its appearance at a specific period of time and in its historic location. And, and they go on to outline uh, a, a number of, of key bullet points here. The standards will be applied, taking into consideration the economic and technical feasibility of each project Reconstruction will be used to duplicate vanished or non-surviving portions of property when documentary and physical evidence is available to permit an accurate reconstruction with minimal conjecture. And uh, such a reconstruction is essential to the public understanding of the property. I think we know that we have enough documentation here, and Mr. Marco has shown you some tonight that we have that adequate documentation to reconstruct this property in, in the accurate uh, mode that is suggested and required by the standard. Um, the reconstruction will include measures to preserve the remaining historic materials, features, and spatial relationships. I am very pleased that the, the most key relationship that you guys did say is the dimension between the underside of the steel and the, and the concrete deck below. The proportion of, of Rudolph's openness be under the house and the portion, of course, of the house itself, it remains exactly the same. And, and that, hold, that, to me, really uh, holds true to the accuracy of, of, uh, of what has been proposed. That's what uh, their, their drawings show. Reconstruction will be based on the accurate duplication of historic features and elements, uh, sustain, uh, uh, substantiated by documentary or physical evidence, I can tell you, rather than conjectural designs. Uh, there's no conjectural designs here. This is done very, very accurately. I can tell you I've gone over every drawing. Um, and reconstruction, uh, a reconstructed property will recreate the appearance of the non-surviving historic property in material, design, color, and texture. Uh, a reconstruction will be clearly defined as a contemporary reconstruction. The design that was never executed historically will not be constructed. Well, we're not doing any of that. Um, so this COA proposes, uh, as proposed, will meet 
the Secretary of Interior Standards for the reconstruction of all of the uh, and and all of the city of Delray Beach's land development uh, regulations. Um, I'm not going to get into the issues of the comprehensive plan. They're all in your staff report over there, but suffice it to say that they are all met. Uh, and and the COA findings have all been met. And I think we're at a point here where we should entertain public comment before we talk about uh, what um, what your options are uh, for this evening and, and motions there. Uh, does anyone in the public uh, care to comment? We have two. Thank you. <clears throat> Good evening, board members. My name is Kenneth Shepard. I live at 1117 Vista Del Mar Drive. Uh, I built our home uh, in 1984, and <clears throat> it's a lovely street. But over the last four years, what has been going on Vista Del Mar has been pretty hectic with all the building. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, over the years, the last four years, we've become friends with the uh, Marcos. Uh, my wife and I were visited by them quite a few times and they showed us the renderings of the home that uh, was there in <clears throat> the mid 50s and that they were gonna bring it back to that type of design and we were ecstatic. Uh, I go back with the Courtney's back to uh, 1984, Virginia and Howdy, great people. But the house that you're seeing that is being presented by the <clears throat> Marcos is not the house that they purchased by uh, Virginia, uh, that Virginia Courtney and Howdy lived in. They made numerous changes uh, in the roofs, the air conditioners, uh, and our biggest concern living by them was if we ever got a, had a Cat 5 hurricane, I don't think the house would have made it. And there would have been tons of debris that was on the roof and the air conditioners and stuff like that, uh, that all the neighbors thought were pretty hazardous. Also, one time, the uh, house was hit with lightning. It blew out all the electrical, blew out all the plumbing, and the house was really never maintained. Uh, after Howdy, uh, Mr. Courtney passed away, Virginia struggled a little bit, and she just couldn't up the, keep the home. There was <clears throat> mass infest infested infestations with rats that we had to contend with. So I'm here tonight to plea that the board green lights this uh, final uh, stage of the Marcos building their home. And uh, the other thing concerning the flooding, the one thing that we've had over the last four or five years with these moon tides is we're having, to, uh, we're having a streets flooded up to three feet. I'm at a six foot level, our main floor, and three feet up my driveway, we have floods. The city has definitely tried to help, but the pump station on uh, Thomas Street seems always to be out of order, or they're always trying to find a pump flying it in and flying it out. So there is considerable flooding still uh, on our street. And uh, the raise of the seven foot, I think, is uh, uh, very needly in this situation because of what we're experiencing right now. That's all I've got to say, and I want to thank you. Good evening, board. Uh, Dan Sloan, Sloan & Sloan Architects, uh, 106 Southeast 7th Avenue. I um, just want to say I'm very supportive of the plans uh, that Silverstein Architects did. I think they did a really good job. Um, keeping the scale and the the uh, architectural context of the original design, but but uh, adapting it as needed for today's um, you know environmental context and and sustainability and so forth. I do have a great concern about the process in terms of the plan review. The original plans, it did not seem to have a demolition plan, which was a uh, I absolutely admit was uh, a missing plan in the documents but the documents the structural drawings clearly stated that the essentially the entire structural system is being replaced it was not anything ambiguous about it, it was it was stated new new studs new roof rafter everything was shown as being replaced so somewhere in the review process something went wrong they should have said hey this doesn't seem quite right and certainly is a 
as a, at least as a courtesy, tell the applicant, we would like you to submit a demolition plan so there's no ambiguity. This has taken cost a fortune. It's delayed months and months just because the city didn't ask the applicant, please provide us with a demolition plan that would have said, oh, we need to go for a COA. Could have been a much more smooth and less expensive and torturous process. <clears throat> so I think the review process should be fine-tuned so this kind of thing doesn't happen in the future. It's very unfortunate. But in any event, I really support the project. I think the plans are great. I look forward to seeing it under construction. Thank you. My name is Jim Miller. I live at 206 Seabs Breeze Avenue, and uh, I've watched uh, this go on for many, many years uh, since the uh, unfortunate passing of Virginia Courtney. And the home has deteriorated so badly that I wouldn't let my children go in because the, the walls were paper thin. And uh, all the things that Ken said are absolutely factual and true. And the only thing I want to say is all of the neighbors know what kind of home they want to build. We want them there, we want, we want the home there, and we think it's time that we move on and we need your help to get it done. Thank you. Okay, does anyone else in the public wish to speak? Seeing none, we'll, we'll, we'll continue uh, here and, and and I think it is time for us to discuss uh, the alternative actions that this board uh, can take tonight. You can move to continue with uh, direction, uh, or you can uh, be uh, move to approve the certificate of appropriateness 2021-102. Uh, that will be COA number three for this house for the after the fact demolition, a change in finished floor elevation to plus seven NAVD. Uh, relocation and a contemporary reconstruction of the existing house uh, by finding that the request and the approval thereof is consistent with the city of Delray Beach uh, land development regulations and visual compatibility standards and the secretary of the Inter interior standards and guidelines as uh, as reviewed uh, earlier uh, and then you have the ability to do effectively that same motion with conditions if you might find yourself having any, uh, or you can deny the certificate of appropriateness by finding that uh, it does not meet some one of the standards or the criteria. Oh. So uh, with that, I will uh, sit back. I'll be here to answer any questions you might have, but I'll leave this up to the board discussion. I do have a question right now. Go right ahead. Before you sit down. Um, I've never seen a reconstruction on this board. Um, I've served many years uh, often on the board. And my question is, how does something like this, where it's basically a brand new construction at this point, and even the Secretary of Interior Standards says that it's new construction and it has to be designated as new construction as a replication of an existing building. And how does that affect the taxes, because when you do a, a renovation of any sort to a historic property. Sorry, Ms. Sexton, is your, um, your microphone on? They're having trouble hearing you through the, okay, if you could just pull it towards you a little is bit. It better? Yeah. Okay, I'm sorry. So my question is, um, how does this attack, uh, affect the tax benefits? Uh, th that's actually a very good question because many parts of this house, from the foundation to the steel's main superstructure that holds it in place to the first finished floor are very much original are, and are still there. And then everything else that we're seeing is, of course, not there. I, I'll leave that. Uh, I don't think that's the purview well, of the board. Oh, really? Okay. Uh, personally, I think, I think our job is to deal with the secretary standards and the land development regulations. I can't properly give you that answer. This is a very complicated one because of that. Right, we so. do uh, we do see those come yeah, before we, us uh, on designated properties that have not been designated before, <coughs> and we do 
uh, give grant them either the tax benefit or not based on their yes but how it relates to to a, recon a, a reconstruction or partial reconstruction right is a very good question that I've never come across before either so let me, let me ask a question that you might be able to answer Sorry, if, if we could if we if we um, allow rebuttal and cross-examination um, ex parte communications and move into board discussion and ask all the questions just so that you can kind of okay, so let's move into uh, ex parte Communication, and then, then we can ask, yeah, ask questions. So, Mr. Chard, uh, I drove by the uh, building today. Uh, there is a sign out in front of the building that uh, confused me a little bit. It, it looked like it was possibly for sale. No, no. Perhaps that might be addressed. We're we're being told over my shoulder that it is not for sale. Okay. Ex parte communication. I have had none. None. Hey, um, I've had quite a bit. Um, <laughs> I would say, first of all, uh, Mike and Nina Marco are neighbors of mine, and I would consider them to be friends. Um, our, we walk our dogs at the same time. Um, and I've been on this board since 2018, so I was here when it came through with the, with the design review, and I will say that um, at that time, I. Uh, voted enthusiastically to support the the COA and to support the project. Um, since then, I've had um, you know specific conversations with uh, the Marcos about this project and about their plans. Um, and in 2019, I I toured the site when it looked like it does right there. Um, I also met with Jeffrey Silverstein at his office um, you know, prior to the last time coming through. So. Um, I have quite a bit of ex parte communication on this project. Um, I, I also uh, spoke at when the, I was not on the board, but I did sp speak uh, pro, uh, for the project when they presented it. I thought it was a great design. I also was, am an ex-neighbor of the DeMarcos. And I, um, so uh, I am friendly with them, but I received an email from their current, the current people that were in their house uh, in support of this project. I've had no ex parte. Okay, so if we can we want to move to our cross-examination or rebuttal. So the, the question that I had uh, for for you, Rich, is... Um, Wait, sorry, can you see if they have cross-examination or rebuttal? And then when you move into board discussion, then ask the questions. Okay. Um, if, that, if that's... Well. Do you have any cross-examination or rebuttal of the applicant? Thank you. No, none. Thank you. Do you have any cross-examination or rebuttal of the staff? No. Thank you. Now we'll ask questions. Okay. Go for it. Into board discussion. Board discussion. So, um, the I think maybe what, what Rhonda was, was trying to, to ask, and what I, I had the same question is, considering this a reconstruction or a replica. I mean, I don't know the, the right term, but call it a reconstruction. Um, I the. Board, the staff report referenced your uh, report that you did in September 15th, I don't know if it's 2020 or 2021, that was not part of this, but uh, I understand that it had a like, prescriptive um, steps to, to take to ensure that the applicant is able to maintain their individually designated That's status right. as an individually designated property within the city. and. I want to be sure that the, the plans that, that we have and, and that process is able to be done because we, I would be looking to you and I think the board and the city would be looking to you um, as our consultant to, to tell us that yes, it, it does um, still meet the requirements for individually designated historic property. Uh, you bring up a very, very uh, good point, Mr. Baffer. Um, that is something that I did cover towards the end of the report, and I'm very pleased to say that the Secretary's stand, uh, standards um, encouraged me to professionally believe that the House should maintain its local historic designation uh, because of the fact that this is being done 
uh, in, in the kind of accurate manner prescribed by uh, those standards. So I, this is not a house that, that I would by any means suggest uh, delisting. Because um, then the, the next step is the, the ad valerium tax benefit that will come before the board and, um, and the board would at that point then be looking for probably to you for guidance to say, did they, did they meet these criteria? Does it still meet this criteria? Is this still, is this still worthy of, of being historically designated? And, and uh, it sounds like um, if they follow the plan that, that yes, it, it would be. Uh, that's that's exactly what I concluded in, in my report. So that was my question. Yeah, and I don't know, Rhonda, if that helps. Oh yes, yes. I, I'm not trying to say it shouldn't be. I just wanted to clarify uh, the position. You know, because it is it is a replica, and there is that language in the the secretary's guidelines that says, I, I guess you have to put a plaque on front of it and say that this is a this is a replica so that you don't mislead the public into thinking that it, it's, it's original. And it's also, it is also in the public record. I don't think we need to put a sign in front of it saying well, I, that I it don't is. know how you do but, that, but um, it does but, say you, you, you need to let people know somehow that to, to not mislead them into thinking that yeah. this is original, but it's... Um, just as a, as a side note, as we think back to the prior editions that have been put on the house and we think of what this is going to look like now, I, I, I really do think uh, that under the circumstances of how uh, historic homes very often evolve and, and, uh, and, and some of them get trashed in doing so, uh, this one certainly did for no, no bad reason. They just, it just happens. Uh, and and that what we see here in the, in the reconstruction of the home uh, and... and um, is something that is ultimately going to make us all uh, rather uh, proud of it and, and uh, proud to um, see it still on our uh, local register. And I also think that, that Paul Rudolph, if he were alive today, uh, would be proud of the outcome of what has finally occurred here. Okay. So if we want to move into uh, board discussion, I'll just start with kind of, um, you know, I've got a... Um, I, I, I just want to say it because I, I was I was on the on this board when when this first came through and um, um, Mr. Marco said that there were three city officials that recommended uh, lifting the building to seven feet. I also recommended. I don't know if you guys reviewed the tape, but on that tape, I I, I questioned why did he want to keep it at six feet. Um, and I think it was because it didn't want it. It was the view from Vista Del Mar looking up. They didn't want it to, to look elevated. But just from a practical standpoint, I also um, was in favor of, of lifting the building to seven feet. Um, and the fact that there is a foot and a half discrepancy, and I know uh, you touched on it in your, in your presentation, but for, for board members to really understand that that's the difference between NGVD and NAVD. And it happens every day in civil work where there's, you have an old survey that is, is NGVD, now we're NAVD and nobody picks it up and realizes it. And then you know, you're halfway through a 60 story building in downtown Miami and realize that you're a foot and a half off. Mm -hmm. So um, it, nobody did anything wrong. I don't think that um, that, that was, you could even say that that was in any kind of a, a malicious in, intent there. And the same goes for the demolition. Um, um, you know, Mike Marco says he's, uh, he's not an expert. Uh, you know, I, I think he probably is, you know, probably is. Um, on the other hand, I am. And as the licensed contractor on this board um, almost three years ago, I also failed to recognize that when you remove the glass, the louvers, and the roof, there's nothing left. And I should have picked that up. And, that, and that's, you know, you mentioned the review process. It went through the review process, and, and, and I didn't even think, think through what, what this was going to look like when you removed the sides and the top of, of the building. There's the floor. Um, it's, it's obvious now. Um, but I, again, I don't think that there, you know, there was a, a malicious intent there. I think it just a, 
an oversight nobody even recognized. It. And and those of you on this board now, you you will remember there have been projects that come through here, and I say, yes, understand what this looks like when these people take the roof off. There's it's going to look like there's nothing there, uh, and this is why. This is why because I I missed it in 2019, and um, you know, I, we we need I need to be the one to recognize that on behalf of the board. So um, that's just, you know, I, I I would like to see the, the Marcos be able to move forward with their, their project and, and you know, create something that, that everybody can be happy with. I think the board, I, 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 had I been on the board, I would have approved both requests. So uh, after the fact, I uh, am ready to approve <laughs> the, uh, the request now. I would only say that um, I had been involved in something like this. It's called the Army Navy Club <clears throat> in Washington, D.C., where we took an old structure and had as much steel behind the brick as you'd need if you reconstructed it out of a, into a steel building um, and how difficult it is and how you can run into issues that there's no way in the world you could have anticipated them. Um, in our case, had we lost one brick, it would have been like pulling a piece of wool out of a sweater. It would have ended up with a pile of wool and no building. Um, so I understand how what happened did happen. Um, because I don't think there's any fault of anybody other than if you had been through it before. There's only one way to know, and that's it, to have been through it before. So I'm very in favor of what you did and supportive. I agree. I like the plans. I would have been in favor of them back in 2019. I don't think I was on the board yet. Um, but it, uh, same thing. It seems to me that none of these things were done maliciously, and they. I think we would have all approved any, you know, the seven-foot elevation and um, any of these we would have been in support of, of it in the first place. And so that shouldn't change anything today. We sh should still support it. It's, it's a great plan and it seems like it's gonna be a really wonderful property. Uh, I am going to support it, but I do have some questions if uh, the applicant will bear with me. Um, <clears throat> the, uh, the first thing is that in something uh, like a restoration, there's supposed to be a recording of the architectural details and a documentation for archival purposes. Uh, and I would imagine something like that would go to the Delray Beach Historical Society. Has that been done as part of this process? I'm not sure who needs to answer that. But. Let, me, let, let me try to speak to uh, Jim uh, what you're talking about. Um, you're talking about a HABS survey. Um, we have different levels of HAB survey. Anybody heard of our HAB survey? I'm seeing a lot of, <laughs> okay. Historic American Building Survey. One of the things that the State Preservation Office or, or other preservation uh, officers like yours uh, would do on a building that is going to be demolished uh, and, or demolished and even reconstructed might be to insist on a Historic American Building Survey um, documentation. Now, that can occur two ways. There are different levels of documentation. We're not going to give the whole uh, Historic American Building Survey lecture tonight, but, but they come in different flavors, and, and some of those are just as simple as taking very good rectified photographs of the original building and archiving those. And then, uh, uh, Mr. Chard, for, for very special buildings, uh, we'll, do, we'll do a hand-measured ink drawing on mylar uh, with every detail you could possibly imagine of exactly the way the building was before we lost it, uh, or, 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 even, or even as it stands uh, today and if you didn't lose it. And those get archived uh, in, in the National Library in Washington, uh, D.C. Now, some, some jurisdictions don't always send them off to the library. Some stay in the local library. University of Florida has an amazing archive uh, where, where um, many HABS surveys are held. But, 
But in this particular case, um, I think there were so many additions on this building before that doing a HAP survey of, of Bob, that would have shown uh, the two Bob Curry additions would have served no, no real earthly uh, purpose. Uh, and, and, you know, the, the drawings that, that ultimately uh, put the building back together again have been done very accurately as, a, as just an example uh, of, of, the, uh, of the wood siding on the outside and the dimensions of all that and, and make, making sure the dimensions of the steel and, uh, and the reveals, et cetera, and, and the windows are all uh, to original specification. I just don't see any purpose in it here. Well, I, I would suggest that maybe since there is such a, a recordation already of the work being done, that that might be, I don't know if it's a condition of the approval, but uh, that it might be something that should be submitted to our local historical society and its 65,000 items. I think I would do it in a way that it is simply photographic, a, photo, a photographic survey of the history of the building, because we've got those great photographs. And we have nothing that we could personally measure at this point. Well, that gets me to my second question, which is that it does uh, talk in here um, uh, about preserving certain of the elements. Uh, of course, I'm not going to find it now that I'm looking for it. Uh, but that we've obviously seen some here tonight. And I think there's some, some language about uh, repurposing that. Uh, saving that uh, and uh, having that as a uh, indication of what the history of the building was and the importance of the building. I think, I think storing uh, those is something that is also very, very common. We have uh, another old hotel building, Coral Gables, where we, uh, that we put on the National Register and got tax credits for. It's a very pretty special project. Uh, but there, we actually found one original building in the build, uh, window in the building. The others have been replaced multiple times. And, but we found it hidden in a wall, covered by drywall. There, there, there she was. And, and while we couldn't leave that on the exterior of the building uh, and, and needed to put an impact-resistant window there, we were able to at least save it. So I, I might suggest that, that uh, the Marcos uh, identify those items that they were able to save, i.e. the louver, for example, or, or, or the original piece of wood, and, and you know, label them for what they are and, and, and let them reside you know, with the house in some marked um, way that that, uh, uh, that I think that, that honors the the it honors the history of, the, of yeah. yeah it does. So two more questions. Um, one is that the original design did not enclose the ground floor in glass. So that's, I believe, a significant change in the design. Yes, it is. Uh, the glass is clear. Um, it still reads as a void underneath the house, uh, and very often uh, preservation boards uh, like yours uh, allow for voids. Think of the porches that might have been, uh, you know, semi-enclosed with a, with a clear glass, um, and and accept that as an acceptable means of enclosure uh, because uh, because the void is it still reads as if it were not there. And in this particular case, if we went back to the rendering just for the fun of it, we could if we want. Um, um, I think we're going to find that it reads, it still reads as if it's open because it is this uh, clear glass. Uh, but it provides uh, as a practical uh, more use for the, um, for the space, and it was approved in the prior COA. Certainly more practical in uh, this climate. I know. But, um, as you read the Secretary of Interior's guidelines, that is in compliance or in the spirit of those guidelines. I believe it to be in the spirit of those guidelines. And I'm, I've sat in your position for uh, 10 years at my, in the city of Miami and two on the Coral Gables uh, Preservation Board, one year as chairman. And, uh, and, um, and we've, we've done that same sort of thing. It's not something we, we want to do. Um, it's something we might uh, frown upon, but it, but it is something that is commonly done. Okay. Uh, commonly. The last question is, uh, if you look at the original, it appears that the construction on the ground floor is off, the, off center, and therefore it sort of gives a feeling, a, a dynamic of, you know, how is it staying up there? And 
I'm asking the question, is the redesign going to have that same sort of uh, fool the eye kind of appearance? I wonder how fast we can get to the... I look at that and that looks like it's completely balanced from well, side is, to side is, as compared to Michael, the original. Is that a proper depiction for where we are now? No. Please, yeah, because I know there were that multiple an renderings. Rendering. It's yeah. not an accurate rendering, uh, especially the window arrangement on top is not the that's same as, as what we have here, is what's in the current plan that's approved. Uh, Jim, but your question on the glass box down there. That's, a, that's, a good, that's a good question about that being off-centered or not. Yeah, it's so. just not really what we're reviewing now. We're reviewing the elevation and the demolition. But it's it's it, it's a good it's certainly a good valid, question. Valid question. It, that ship sailed, on, you know. Yeah, and, right. and, and, I mean, that, uh, that, was, that was part of the last COA. Yeah. When but this was approved, uh, but but would, would would be nice to have them. There, there is in the current plan. If he if he could actually come up to the, the mic, I'd appreciate it. Thank you. So again, I, I would ignore that rendering. But in the in current plan, it's hard to see in that rendering. But there is in the same general area that we can point to this, this area in here blocks over there we do have a small enclosed office and bathroom and probably in roughly that same location this is all glass in here i but think this if you see the plan up there you can see the box right there yeah, there's a there is a box there is a box inside the structure inside the glass that does kind of emulate that. And it, it is off center like, like that? Yep. Yeah. Okay. And it functions as an office and a bathroom. So it's, I don't know if it's exactly that same size, but it's similar. It's just such an amazing look that you. you, you <laughs> it's going to look like that. Are we ready? That's all I have. I'm ready for a motion. Any more discussion? Ready for a motion? I'll, I'll do a motion. I move to approve Certificate of Appropriateness 2021-102 for after the fact demolition, a change in finished floor elevation to plus seven NAVD relocation and a contemporary reconstruction of the existing historic house by finding that the request and approval thereof is consistent with the city of Delray Beach and development regulations and visibility standards, compatibility standards, and the Secretary of the Interior standards and guidelines. Second. Any discussion? Any do you have any uh, um, qualifications you might want to add to this? I, I, I just had one thought, and I hate to bring it up right now. But I remember reading an article in the Palm Beach Post where they, were some, they had reached out to the Paul Rudolph Foundation. And the Paul Rudolph Foundation was very unhappy with this project the extent that they were removing it from their inventory of projects and they recommended losing its historic designation and i wonder if maybe rich heisenbottle would be the guy or to reach out to the paul rudolph foundation and try to make peace with them and get this project back in their fold or at least request it I don't, I don't fully understand uh, the mission of their foundation uh, to the extent that, you know, that, um, do they seek to fully, perfectly restore the original Paul Rudolph work? Would, would it have satisfied them only if we had restored the original Paul Rudolph box? Excuse me, not, it's not a piece of artwork, an art box, but notwithstanding. Um, it, it, or, or would they, 
do they do they uh, include other buildings that have been altered or have had air, uh, additions placed on them? Uh, I think there's a little a little work to do there. I'd like to I, I'll take a shot at it just to just to reach out to them. I know exactly where we're where we're you know we're trying to go with it, and I'd like to do it at, with some some great photographs of the finished product so they can see how sensitive this is the most sensitive addition that I could possibly imagine being made to that house. Um, and, and we'll have to see how they, uh, how they react to it. But if, you know, if, if they're incredibly purists, uh, to, to the extent that they would not want to see anything on the house touched, then there's not much that any of us are going to be able to say. And they might be. And, and they and, might be. And they might but, be, and there, but, uh, there, may um, be, there may be no satisfying them. But I, I, would, I, I would like to feel like you know, either, either you or even us as a board or somebody says, hey, just we want you to know what we're doing with this. Yeah, uh, I'll, I'll volunteer to to, uh, to take a shot at it, but I'd like to, going back with them, I'd like to do it with a, with a formal letter and, and, and real photographs of what's done when the product is really done and and explain what has happened there and, and encourage them to maintain it with, you know, on their list of Rudolph projects with pride. That, that would be my ask. I don't know if we want to, you know, uh, encumber the in, in, the approval with that or not, but but uh, yeah, I don't I don't think that would be an appropriate condition for the motion. I mean, I think you've talked to Mr. Heisenbottle and he's he said what he said here, but um, I don't think you need to put it onto the motion because it, it's not a condition to the property owners. But but um, Mr. Benfer, I, I I'd, I'd gladly just take a shot at it myself, and I, I'm sure that. As this goes forward, you know, a year or so from now, when we're when we're able to maybe celebrate the house, um, that uh, having some good photographs of it and writing a nice piece about it, and, and maybe uh, getting a piece published here also would be uh, it, let's, that we can treat this at the end of the day as a preservation success story uh, rather than as a preservation failure. I would think of keeping some of those artifacts. In the yard, in the house, uh, yeah, as a historical the house comment. There's that, a proper garage and things like, you know, a place for, for that sort of stuff. It was my understanding the artifacts weren't original, though. No. I mean, they're That's like exciting. Virginia Courtney's shutters. And yeah, they, they are the wrong shutters. And they, so, they, I mean, what, no, what artifacts do you want them to keep? Yeah, it's a little no, tricky in this case. Is steel? <laughs> <laughs> the glass? Uh, that's, that's gone, I'm afraid. But... I don't know that we really have, uh, you can't think of any real artifacts. Aside from the original steel that's there. That's it. Nothing in the house when I went to work on it was original, really. Yeah. Maybe some of the old rotten wood was original, but the glass, you can't, you can't say the glass, it's not safe. No. Should no. we vote? Let's, let's vote. Did we get a second? Oh, yes, no. yes, we did. Oh, yes, we did. Hmm. Robert Osnoff? Yes. Elise Lindstrom? Yes. Rona Saxton? Yes. Lydia Willis? Yes. Jim Chard? Yes. And Jim and Baffer? Yes. Okay. All right. Good luck. Congratulations. Thank you all. Motion passes. Good. Thank you all very much. Nice to see you all again. Nice to see you as well. Okay. Thank Have a happy holiday season. Thank you. That's right. If he was going to follow up on me. Yeah. I was wondering if he was going to be intermittent. Are you feeling better? Thank you. Um, may I make a suggestion? Can we give a five minute recess for the board? Mr. Baffer? Do you think we could do maybe a five-minute break and then Absolutely. Get Let's back take started. a five-minute break and come back at 9.30. That way everybody can clear out and everything. Yes. Thank you. You got everything you need? You need some help? When was that? Because in 1988, they were the ones that they worked on the Armenia Club. Because I remember um, one of my Larry Pickett, who was playing the he never served in the military. He said he had a lifetime pass. I got a lifetime one too. I'll tell you what the fear was. 
We well, watched it similar to what they were doing, and we watched the demolition yeah. because we took everything out. Behind well, us. they did that in DC a lot. Remember, Metro Center did the same thing. They had all that steel, all that steel holding up the front, yeah. and there's nothing behind it. They did it, but it was a little bit different because mm -hmm. uh, Metro Center is really kind of strange. Yes, yeah, so I would like to go. First of all, we were too well. Yeah. Yeah. I guess remember when we dedicated it. Oh, you're right. Yes, we dedicated it. Ronald Reagan came because I remember everybody laughed at the only person who wear a brown suit and away with it. And they blocked all the streets and they put out, you know, they had all glass and they put out bulletproof panels on the walls. And, and everybody had to get there early and the Secret Service did it all day and work and all that. Reagan walked out and we're all looking forward. All of a sudden, you hit. Bam! Everybody's scared of shit. It's Donaldson, Sam Donaldson, who, through all of that security, walks through an emergency exit because he had somebody on the inside unlock it. Lock it and slam the door. And I swear the Secret Service were all wearing it like yeah. this. And then the Reagan said, Sam? What the hell's wrong with you? But that time you almost got shot. Well, he had, he had that, that whole thing where we didn't see Donaldson. Oh, that was why I was here. That's why it couldn't be anybody else. Yeah, we're talking about one time. One time over the He's still the architect. Silverstein's still the architect? Yeah. But Roger, Roger. He was a consulting architect. Yeah, I think it's important to the integrity of it.
stick or two on daughter. And we'll say that. Not this time, but maybe next time. Okay, so we're going to move back to nine. Which one is it? Nine A. Nine B. Nine B. Becomes nine C. Ready? Are you reconvened? Yes. We're all back. Okay. Got the recorder on? We're good to go. Mics are on and everything, I think. 
All right, so the next item on the agenda is item 9B, which became 9C for 330 Northeast First Avenue, COA 2021-199. This is a certificate of appropriateness. And the owners and their agent architect, Mr. Dan Sloan, um, are here and will present. Okay, Dan, you ready? All right. You good? You want me to wipe it down after I touch? I'm good. Okay, I'm gonna leave this. I had two vaccines and getting the booster tomorrow, so if that doesn't work, I'm out of luck. All right. And I'm gonna photograph that. Oh, okay. Uh, Dan Sloan, Sloan and Sloan Architects, um, here again with the uh, Derrickson Residence Renovation Project. So we built a little uh, study model uh, to give you guys an idea. You know, you can look around, see how it's actually gonna look in 3D. And one thing to bring to your attention, <clears throat> we had discussed about the lot coverage and that type of thing. Um, the, the adjacent lots to the north are 50 foot lots. So I've drawn a red line on here just to give you an idea how big it would be if it was a, a lot uh, similar to the ones to the north. So you can see that if you, if you ignore this extra section of, of land, it's really not very intensely developed at all. So anyway, I'm gonna pass this around. You can take a peek at it um, and help, help Hopefully, hopefully that will help you to understand the the proposal a little bit. So, um, just a housekeeping item, just to go through their the the staff's report. Um, we had two items of concern in this this new staff report. The first thing was on page two in the middle paragraph. It says. Um, starting with the applicant's revised proposal and submit and resubmitted request, it kind of goes through the items that we have uh, accomplished or included in the revised plans to address your specific requests at our meeting from October. And um, they failed to note that we reduced the square footage uh, in the master bedroom and media room addition so that we, we ended up with a more narrow facade. Uh, which was one of your concerns was the massing of the south addition. What we did was we tried to reduce the, the width of the walk-in closet component there. We had a master bedroom and then walk-in closets. We, we reduced the width of the closets down to six feet, which is about the practical minimum to have a reasonable walk-in closet that's double loaded. And that resulted in a, a reduction in the width of one foot, one inch. So we reduced it. Um, and then the other item was on page three, um, staff mentions, um, it, go, it goes into again, staff is suggesting that it should have asphalt shingle roof, um, whereas the board's specific direction was go ahead and change it to a standing seam metal roof from the 5e crimp, which we did do. Okay, and then I'm just gonna go into this little brief presentation. Um, I'm going to kind of go very quickly over the garage and the guest cottage because you seem to have um, no concerns with those designs, so just focusing on the, the, the residence itself. So here um, you can see that the main concerns of the board, I uh, kind of went uh, outlined them here on this slide. I'll just read them through. The first was the visual, the visual mass of the two-story master bedroom addition on the south side, uh, which, as I just mentioned, we reduced the width to address that concern. The second item was to change the 5E metal crimp to a standing seam metal roof, which we have done. We're proposing to do that on all the structures. Uh, it will be in the same natural silver color called Galvalume. The third uh, concern was the windows were proposed to be black. It said in the staff report they were proposed to be bronze, but that's not correct. They were proposed to be black, um, and we've changed them all to be white. Uh, the next item was the guest parking in the front. Um, there's an existing um, paver park parking area for two um, cars in the front, staff uh, in the staff report recommended those to be removed, even though that was not proposed by anybody on the city staff during the TAG or technical advisory group review. Um, so there was no concern, obviously, in terms of safety of those the back out parking. It's solely an aesthetic concern. Um, however, if we get rid of those, we cannot have a legal uh, rental cottage, which was certainly desirable. It's reducing the, the value of the property and renew, re, 
uh, it's a very desirable thing to have that as a legal rental. So what we would propose is our best solution would be to change those to either permeable pavers, so water would percolate directly through them if the concern is with green space, or if it's a visual concern, uh, we could change it to a grass pave, which is a structural system underneath the grass, um, and it just looks like lawn. It just has a single uh, line of, of brick around the perimeter just to identify that as a little parking area. So 95% of the time, it would just look like lawn. When there was guests there, they could park there. Um, if that is unacceptable to the board for some reason, we have a alternate, which is a ribbon driveway um, configuration, which I'll show you in a, just a second in the slides. Um, so, so anyway, uh, the next concern was that we had five light exterior French doors. Board would like us to change them to 10 light, which we did. Next concern was the, the uh, railing design was an X type uh, traditional railing design. The board preferred plain vertical pickets and we did that. So we tried to address every, every, each and every concern the board had. Here is a quick and dirty um, overlay of our original rendering just showing um, the vertical pickets um, on the screen porch. Obviously as, a to as you can see in the little model, it's a completely open screen porch and behind the screen panels, they're, they're actually operable. They're called phantom screens, so they could be completely open during the nice month. When it's summer, when it's bug year, they, the screen panels would be closed to keep the bugs out and so forth. But it is completely open air. Um, and then you can see the French doors we've changed to, um, to the 10 light French doors. Um, and then the next slide shows, the again, the existing and new site plan with the slightly narrower um, addition on the south side or the left side of the main building. This I, uh, shows the option of removing the guest parking on the, the lower left side, um, the two parking spalls, and installed something called ribbon driveway on the north side. We'd prefer not to do that because that forces us to push the northern addition to the west and compress it so that we have a, a more cramped area for, for the elevator lobby and the, um, the uh, kitchen pantry area, which so we'd prefer not to do this, but if the board feels that this is the only acceptable way to accommodate uh, two guest pots, we, would be we will proceed with this option. And this shows what ribbon driveways look like, if you're not familiar with it. Uh, in terms of color, we have a red tone um, and red and blue tone option on the bottom. And then the preferred option would be the one on the top, um, which has got the, uh, the yellow or orange tones that we believe would go very well with, uh, with the light blue proposed color scheme uh, for the stucco. That's the vineyard blend, they call it. And then the next slide shows the composite um, plan again. The darker tone is the existing buildings. The lighter tone or the lighter gray is the, um, the proposed new additions. And then there's the before uh, existing floor plan on the left, the new floor plan on the right. Um, and this is with the option using either the grass paving system or this permeable paving system um, that we discussed earlier. Um, the second floor, again, it's equally uh, been narrowed by the same exact increment as the first floor, and the roofed porch has obviously been made uh, a slightly more slender as well. And then this is the new uh, garage. It would have a two-car garage on the first floor uh, with charging stations for electric vehicles. So that would be primarily where the owner's cars would reside because they would obviously be charged there regularly. And then above that, we have a uh, home gym and a, and a little home office. That's a, I, this is identical to our previous proposal. No changes at all in that. This is a renovation to the existing guest cottage. Uh, which we're proposing to raise um, the floor level a little bit because it's pretty low and it tends to flood. So we're raising that and then we're building an addition, compatible addition, so that it becomes basically a studio apartment with an attached uh, uh, garden storage area, unair conditioned garden storage area on the top. Okay, and then this is the proposed new uh, front facade or street facade 
changing the roof material, as we mentioned, to the standing seam metal roof in the Galvalume color, changing the, the X picket design um, that we had, a railing design we had previously to the vertical pickets, and then lastly, changing the five light French doors to 10 light French doors in a white, uh, the, the, the French doors are a um, navy blue color, and then all the windows are white. This is the rear um, facade or the alley facade showing the exact same railing configuration, doors, and uh, window color. And then there's the side of the porches, same railing design. And the other side of the home. This is again is the existing uh, photos of the home. You can see they've re if you recall, they, the previous owner had enclosed the front porch with a whole series of very thrifty um, single hung aluminum windows on the top. There's just a whole lot of them. And then the bottom, they have some very homely horizontal roller windows that are completely inappropriate. Uh, just a hodgepodge of windows all around the building. Uh, there's the back, has a strange kind of a, a balcony roof area. And, um, and more horizontal windows shown on the bottom right. Uh, this is the guest cottage, which is in really, really sad shape. It's in desperate need of our help. Uh, and then there's the, the before and after elevations of the little guest cottage, um, elevations of the garage, four elevations. And then this just shows your, your neighboring houses and an updated streetscape on the bottom with, that show the new railing configuration uh, basically um, is kind of illustrated there. And if there's any questions, uh, I'd be happy to entertain them. Um, um, one, oh, one other item. Previously, um, some folks had brought up uh, that it seemed like there was quite a bit of intensity in terms of the site uh, lot coverage and so forth. If you look at it from a standpoint of your floor area ratio or your, um, your lot coverage ratio, we are really uh, only at a 37% uh, ratio on that. And in terms of the footprint of the building plus um, the, uh, all the hardscape, we're only at 52%. So 52% of the of the um, of the site is actually green space. So there's more green space than building and walkways and spa and garage and everything. You add up all the the walkways, the 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 accessory buildings and the home, and you're at 48%. 52% is green space. Then that is not by any stretch of the imagination a really intensely developed site at all. Okay, so that's all I had. If you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Thank you so much. Okay. So Michelle Hoyland again for the record, and I'm going to try my best. To be quick so that we can get both of these last two projects before the board before our 11 o'clock deadline so you will see that we provided you with a memorandum staff report um, for this project we tried to focus mainly on the things that had changed um, with the request and mr. Sloan and I did speak and I'll discuss um, the items he discussed as well. So this property is located at the, on the west side of Northeast First Avenue, south of Northeast First Street, which is also Lake Ida Road. It's in the Old School Square Historic District and it is a contributing structure. Um, here you have a survey, and I'm gonna go quickly here over to the site plan. This is the um, site plan as proposed. It's very, very similar to what was originally proposed the main change is right down here on the south elevation where the um, addition has been reduced by a foot. The parking in the front is being removed and it is noted and we can go back and look at it if you wish where the applicant has um, pr proposed an alternate plan of having ribbon strip driveway over on the north side of the property but we've 
provided this because this is what's submitted um, for the request. So the, um, I'm gonna go to the original picture here. So this is the existing house. You can see here, there's a large side yard um, to the left of this little fence post is a different property. So it's actually a really largely sited property. I think we've identified this as um, masonry vernacular in the staff report where it's actually a wood frame structure with a stucco um, siding on it. And here's some additional photos I took after the last board meeting um, just to, I was really interested in taking a look at the roof because we had discussed the difference of the possible hip roof that may have been on the front here um, that they have found in their investigation when they started doing interior demolition. This really wasn't any, didn't provide any clues um, to that from the exterior. This is um, additional photographs. It's not actually the front view. It's the south side elevation that we're looking at, the, the rear west. Um, this is the little guest cottage, which one day once was a garage in the back of the property. And a few more photos. And here, um, if I'm like I said, I'm going to move rather quickly. We've already talked about this once before. The top picture is the existing front elevation. The bottom picture was the proposal at the last board meeting, um, or at the, the October, I think it was, board meeting where you saw this. So you can see that they were proposing um, two wings, basically, on each side of the existing structure. So the um, building's been modified. I have red squares around the porch railings and the doors so that you can see those have all been switched out. Something that doesn't come across in this black line drawing are the French doors that are behind this porch feature. They've also switched to a stand standing seam metal roof, which that brings me to the um, two items that Mr. Sloan mentioned. One being um, on page two of the staff report that the building, we didn't actually identify it in the notes, the bullets, but the building was reduced in size by that one foot on the south side. So that he's correct. And also that the board um, suggested, I think Mr. Baffer, when the motion was being made, um, indicated that he was okay with standing seam metal roof and that is what the board recommended rather than a 5V crimp roof. So what we see here is a, a new roof style that's very similar to what was here, just when the building's built, the material will look a little bit um, more sturdy. This is a comparison. The top is the old, the bottom is the proposed. So you can see those switches and the doors and windows and or the doors and railings. Um, the top is the existing, the bottom is the proposed last time. This is the proposed now. It, it's not shrinking, it's just the way our image clipped in, but it's um, fairly similar on the sides except for the railings. Side by side, previous, previous proposal and current is on the bottom, previous on top. So that definitely improves, I think, the elevation with those vertical pickets. Um, same thing, this is the north elevation. Anything that's in um, red is new, and what appears in blue is existing. A side by side here as well. The big shift is, again, those railings. Um, this is the west. The west elevation is pretty much all brand new in appearance because of the shifts that are happening in the additions. Um, so again, we got that standing seam roof and the railings uh, side by side. This is the little garage in the back. There's no change to this with this current request, so it's the same as it, what was presented previously. All sides. Then we have the detached structure in the back southwest corner of the property that's all brand new. Um, garage on the ground floor and additional square footage upstairs for the owners. It's not proposed as a guest cottage at this time. Um, so we did express in the staff report, while well, yes, the board recommended um, the change to the applicant being a standing seam metal roof. It was our original analysis that indicated the and based on the fact that the Historic Preservation Board had previously denied a metal roof for this property 
that the staff's analysis was that the most appropriate material would be shingle or aluminum shingle or metal shingle for the roof. Um, and we've provided just this is the backup should you need to come back to it and why we were identifying that as an issue. So that was the original proposal, um, the roof concerns that we identified at that time. And I put it in here just so we have reference. And then the new proposal, this is directly from the staff report. Um, we're still moving forward with that um, condition of approval, which the board can remove should they not agree and, and choose to approve a standing seam metal roof, that's fine, but we still felt that this analysis stood. And this is directly from the Secretary of the Interior Standards, the Historic Preservation Design Guidelines. We were basing that um, analysis on our, our tools that we have available to us. Um, there was extensive discussion about that hip roof being existing, um, which was documented with photographs by the applicant, which with the original pr um, proposal, we didn't, we, we realized that at the meeting. So that was um, something we were not aware of beforehand, but if it is bringing the house back to a more historic integrity, more historic integrity to the house, um, that, that would be good for the home for that change rather than moving to a gable roof. Um, we feel that the porch railings are really going to help this structure contribute. These are some photographs of contributors in OSHAD and I think that the vertical pickets will assist the integrity for this structure. So these are two contributing structures that are on the same street in OSHAD and these are um, in OSHAD in and around the same area. Um, the blue one is up the street, and the pink one is on Swinton, Nani's Attic, it used to be called. Um, these are non-contributors also on the same street. The one on the right is in direct relation as it's very close to the subject property. The one on the left is a little further away on first. Um, I included this original proposed rendering as reference. I don't think you provided a revised rendering in the submittal, if I remember correctly. Um, but the big change here is, again, those vertical pickets and those door um, configurations. Here we have the original proposed streetscape versus the newly proposed. It's very similar. Um, the window frame color, as Mr. Sloan indicated, is going to white, so that does address concerns by staff. We've provided the Secretary of the Interior standards here as reference along with the visual compatibility standards. Um, this is the updated proposed material chart. So you can see the walls are gonna be painted um, with appears to be a soft blue color, the standing seam roof with white fascia and trim, and then uh, red colored shutters and awnings that while the Windows are still indicated here as, as black. Um, we, he has a, um, given testimony that they're going to be white. We also had a condition, which I would like to leave the condition just so when the plan comes back in, we can double check the square footage on the structure. Um, but Mr. Sloan did send this to us shortly before we finished the presentation, which included some square foot calculations. So you'll see that site plan technical item is still in the report. And we ask that that remain um, just for a clarification and cleanup at the end, um, which is square foot calculations existing versus proposed. And so that's what you see here. Uh, we did, he did provide the AC square footage in the previous chart we weren't seeing AC square footage, which was one of our concerns. He was providing footprint square footage, which really wasn't a, a true snapshot of the size of the building. Um, so now we do have that in these proposed numbers here. The proposed um, air conditioned square footage for this residence is 3703, um, where 2392 exists now, and that's considering all structures on the property. The 4,559 square feet is under roof. So keep in mind that includes porches. There's a 49 square foot reduction in AC square footage. And that's that one foot on the side of the building that's been shifted. 
Here's the COA findings. These are also found in your staff report. Um, and I will go ahead and conclude the presentation and turn it to public comment and then the board. Is there any rebuttal or cross-examination? Well, do we have public comment? Public comments first. Well, once again, for the record, uh, Roger Cope, Cope Architects, Inc., uh, 701 Southeast 1st Street, Marina Historic District. The very charming property. I'm intimately familiar with, with the building, the house, uh, the aspects of the roof, and at one time that, the fact that it was a hip roof and not a gable. Lo I love them opening up both levels uh, of porches facing the public right away. It's absolutely charming. Uh, the house, the property is much bigger than it appears maybe on paper. Uh, so uh, your lot coverage shouldn't be of any concern. The, the, the new, uh, new structure in the back, the garage, the two-story garage is charming, as is the uh, restoration of the little existing single-story uh, uh, apartment to the, uh, the northwest corner. Uh, I do love their, uh, if you could support them on their parking off of First Avenue, I think uh, in, that, in that lower uh, south East corner. I think that's something that would benefit them. Uh, I, I think it's on the table whether whether or not you support that or not. I, I think you should. Um, and it's just a charming project. It, uh, it's it's uh, a great block. It's a uh, it's a three a three block stretch of old uh, school square, and and every house on that uh, in that area is absolutely charming. This will be the next one, so please support it. Thank you so much. Mr. Becker, if you could um, request ex parte communications before we move into rebuttal and cross-examination, please. I will. Is there any ex parte or communications, uh, Jim? I walked around the property today. Sure. I've had no uh, comments from the outside. Nothing for me. And none for me? I, I went back and revisited the property tonight. And for me. I have no rebuttal. Any? Can I ask her a question? The applicant has no rebuttal, he said. No cross examination. Cross -examination no cross or rebuttal. No, we've got to get out of here by a <laughs> All right. Um, or discussion. Ask your question. And Michelle, did did staff weigh in on the new driveway proposals? So um, there is an alternate plan that's in Mr. Sloan's um, presentation, which also was submitted. Um, we did not put that forward because it's an alternate, so I, I wasn't sure if that was something he wanted to review and discuss with the board. Um, we do like the idea of the ribbon strips. There already is a driveway there now, which is where I parked when I went to the site. Um, you can see it in this plan here. So this is what's before you. You can see this north wing over here. This is as proposed and what's before you and is in our presentation. This alternate plan shifts that um, addition further back into the property in order to accommodate some of that um, those ribbon strip driveways. So I, I haven't seen what that looks like on elevation, but you know, if it's the same massing looking at it from the front, but it's pushed back a little bit and in the same design, I, I can't imagine that there would be a problem with it. I just haven't seen what it looks like in, in black line drawings. Okay, thank you. Any discussion? I still have trouble with the massing on the south side. I just, that house is so close to the street. It's, uh, I mean, it doesn't have the 25 foot setback, it has 13 foot setback. And I just think that that south side massing is very large. Um, I'm sort of in the support for the alternate driveway because um, it would make more green space in, in the front uh, because there are, I think, a lot of trees that are going with this because 
I don't can't remember what the percentage was, but when you look at the plans, there's there's not much open space. Claudia well, took my point about the trees. Um, uh, given our earlier conversation, I'm wondering how many trees, there are quite a few trees on that property, and I'm wondering um, how many of them are going to be removed. We could ask the applicant. Can I? Yes, please. The overhead view is very green. Uh, just to respond about uh, tree, tree coverage and so forth, um, if you if you go back, um, I don't know if this is my slide or theirs, but if you looked at the existing site plan, you'll see that the existing driveway is covering a, I don't know, like a thousand square feet of of land. It's a very large area that's covered with driveway. It goes way back. We're removing all of that with either option, and with the option of taking that existing paver driveway and turning it into grass pave, it looks just like a lawn. It's just got a slender row of bricks around the two-car parking area. It's totally permeable to, to rainwater. It looks just like grass. It's just when they have gas, they can park there. So that is the best option in terms of green space. And either option, you lose no trees with either of those parking options. The ribbon option, you'd have a dramatic reduction in paved area as well, but you would have um, pavers for the width of the two ribbons. With the grass pave option, you have no you have no pavers. It just looks just like a lawn. Um, and in terms of the landscaping, as I probably don't remember, but I mentioned we have gotten a proposal from a landscape architect, but we haven't hired him. But my personal philosophy and what I've always tried to do whenever I'm developing a property, I try to have the least um, loss of trees, of native trees that I can. Of course, um, invasive trees, we want to get rid of those. But native trees, we try to preserve those as much as possible. That's my personal philosophy, and that's what I would direct the landscape architect to, to do to the best of his intent. Can, you know, of course, he has to work around the footprints of the new properties, but it's a very, very large site for, the, for that neighborhood, and there is a lot of green space, and there will be a lot of green space. As I mentioned, 52 percent of the site will be uh, vegetative areas, will be green you know, space. I'm less concerned about the green space than the canopy. Okay. And obviously, the canopy, if there are a goodly number of trees that are eliminated, that would reduce the canopy. Yes. My goal would be to reduce th to the least extent possible to, to work with the plan, to work with the footprints of the building. And that's what I would direct the landscape architect. But as I say, we don't have that plan, and that's not really, we, as part of this process, you don't actually re review the landscape architecture plan, and it hasn't been developed yet. But ph philosophically, my goal is to retain as many trees as is possible. Would you entertain that as a condition of approval? Uh, I, you can't no. because you it's not part of your Ballywick to review landscape, so you really can't legally, right? I, I was going to make that comment. No, I, I, I'm aware of that. Philosophically, yeah, yeah. philosophically, we will try to, that's my goal. When I developed Sloan Hammock a property in the Marina District, we only lost one tree out of dozens. So that's my philosophy, as I said, designing architecture and construction. See where the trees are going to grow. Yeah, yeah I, I know we can't require it, but I thought you might want to proffer it. Not, not really practical. But as I say, we'll do our best. I think you'll be very pleased with the project. Thank you so much. more interesting than freezing. Um, you hardly even know it's there. The ribbon strips is appealing because there's very little of that in Delray that I, I can recall. There's lots of Chicago brick and things like that. But, but it's still papers. There's still yeah. hardscape. We're going to rip that out. With the yeah. grass, you don't yeah. have any hardscape. Well, it's got the underlying structure, but not very much. Yeah. But you only see the grass. Yeah. Visually, it's not there. It doesn't block that massive addition, though. Any 
more discussion? I, I support the project. I think that um, Mr. Sloan came back with um, and answered all pretty much everything that we had asked him to. Mm -hmm. I think it's the mm -hmm. made it a little bit smaller. Um, he changed the doors. He changed the color of the windows. You like me to make a motion? I'd like to. Oh, sure. Well, are we ready? So. Um, approved certificate of appropriateness 2021-199 for the property located at 330 Northeast First Avenue, Old School Square Historic District, by finding that the request and approval thereof is consistent with the comprehensive plan and meets the criteria set forth in the land development regulations. I'll second it. We have a second? Need discussion? I, I think he needs to add those slight plan technical items. No. <laughs> They're automatic. Yeah. They're automatic. Yeah. Yep. Yep. The only thing um, that would be added is number one about the roof material being switched, and that was not read into the record. So there's no condition. Did you get a second? Second, we did have a second. Yes. Uh, wait a minute. So the roof isn't is in as one of the conditions or no? No. Mr. Sloan changed the roof to standing seam metal. Our condition was about asphalt shingles or aluminum shingles. But okay. it, it's always up to the board whether you choose which motion you choose. And the reason I left it out is because of our discussion the last time. Robert Ostinoff? Yes. Elise Lindstrom? Yes. Rhonda Saxon? Yes. Claudia Willis? No. Jim Chard? Yes. Benjamin Baffer? Yes. Thank you. Motion carries. Thank you. Motion carries. Motion carries. Mm. Okay, the next item on the agenda is... Ma'am, could I get that model back? Diane, would you please hand Mr. Sloan the model? Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. I appreciate it. Good night. Thank you. Okay, the next item is actually 9D, uh, which is 610 North Ocean Boulevard. Um, this request is for a COA variance and waiver for the property known as Fontaine Fox House. The COA number is 2021-165. The property is individually listed to the local register of historic places. And um, Mr. Cope and his um, owner that he represents, Nilsa McKinney, are here and uh, will make a presentation. Why am I not seeing your presentation here? Did you send a presentation? Yeah. Um, Katharina, are you there? Can I have the USB? I think this cabinet is still open. I don't know why it's not uploaded here. Give me one moment, she'll bring it in. Thank God you brought I that. <clears throat> I don't think IT is gonna like that we're doing this. Done. <laughs> OK, 
Okay, Roger, I'm sorry about that. been sworn in Miss McKinney I went okay I was here at five <laughs> thank I've been you. here with every one of you so thank you first of all for being here this late and listening to us my name is Nelson McKinney and I am representing myself and my husband who cannot be here tonight he is on a book tour on his seventh book so um, we wanted to first of all thank you guys for your advice during the last um, visit that we made here, um, and also to Michelle Hoyland and her staff who have been just excellent in helping us get through the process and helping us understand um, your interpretation and what you needed us to come forward in front of you today with uh, the corrections that you requested. So. Roger will quickly go through those, as will Michelle, but we did address um, the concerns you had on the garage, um, the concerns on the guest wing, and then we secondary met with Michelle a second time to make sure that we were understanding all the corrections correctly, and she helped us through that. Um, we uh, addressed the windows um, in, on the guest uh, suite, we also, the guest um, building, I'm sorry. And we addressed the side and colors and um, in your package, you have some new um, options. Um, we completely removed the covered walkway that was from the garage to the kitchen um, for concerns of mass and, um, and clutter to the, to the area. Uh, and um, I will go ahead and defer the rest of the presentation to Roger Cope, but I just wanted to personally thank you again for being here so late and listening to us. Okay, everybody, um, thank you once again. Um, Roger Cope, Cope Architects, Inc., 701 Southeast First Street, Marina Historic District, for the record. Um, and for, uh, for the a few of you were here last month when we gave our initial presentation, Mr. Baffert, uh, Claudia, and Jim. So thank you very much. Uh, uh, the others, uh, sorry you missed last month, but we're, we're gonna try to focus today on the things that were asked of us then. Uh, and uh, uh, Nielsa uh, touched on um, a few of them, but but I'll go into a little bit more detail with respect to each and every one. This is a very, very, very historic house. This is 610 North Ocean Boulevard, the Fontaine Fox House, uh, cartoonist of the uh, international acclaim. Uh, so this is, uh, you've never seen a property like this ever before. Uh, it, it is, uh, Mr. Baffert used the, the term uh, cobbled. Uh, some of the, some portions of the, uh, uh, this is the site plan, for example. This is the existing site plan. Uh, the house uh, has been cobbled together in many ways because it's a, it's a series of additions and infills and things that have come together and collided together and collided with one another, uh, uh, the, the likes of which are, are, are make it charming and interesting and, and challenging all at the same time. So, But this is an existing site plan. Absolutely no change from last month. Uh, obviously showing existing conditions. The little structure on the bottom right is a two-car garage. Uh, and then the main residence is the portion up on the, the top. Oops. Yeah, right there. That's the main residence, if you will. The darkest portion of which is representative of the original uh, 1936 structure, which is buried in uh, amongst all the uh, cobbling that has occurred over it uh, over the past uh, 80 years. And, th and then the structure to the bottom left right there, we call the rear wing, uh, discovery of, of which is the original garage to the property is uh, sort of anchoring the very north edge of that, that rear wing. Uh, and that's something we that we didn't contemplate until Michelle discovered it, Michelle and staff discovered it, uh, 
leading up to last month's presentation. So, uh, and I'd be remiss if I didn't thank Michelle and Katharina and uh, the other Michelle, the intern Michelle, for all the assistance. We've met more times on this project with them than any project I've ever, ever experienced. And so uh, here we go. Here's our, here's where the changes from last month begin. This is, uh, this is our brand new uh, site plan. Uh, and and uh, uh, much of the criticism, I'll, I'll move, this is the, the ocean is to our right. Here's A1A and then the property uh, extends from A1A and, and goes westward. Again, uh, the original garage, garage is sitting right there. So just barely to the right of it, you're going to see a third car, uh, a bay for a third car, I should say. Uh, so we've, uh, we've uh, added the third bay uh, without disrupting at all the existing uh, two-car structure that's next to it. Uh, we've even integrated, you talk about trees, uh, we have a sea grape tree that uh, we have identified on that uh, northeast corner uh, that influenced the shifting of our third bay. Uh, we're gonna work around the tree. We're, we're not taking a single tree down on anything that we're doing here today. Uh, so uh, I'll get into more details elevation-wise and floor plan-wise with respect to that garage. But we used, as Neil also said, we used to have a, a covered spine that would lead a person in, in, uh, uh, from the garage to the, to the main structure, which is in the kitchen area, which is back in this area. We have, uh, rather than uh, fumble around with, uh, with, the, with this spine, uh, we've completely eliminated it from the project. So there's, uh, there were a few questions about it. What, you know, what, what was its purpose? What did it, uh, what did it look like? And, and, and was it uh, harmonious with everything else. Well, we, we thought enough about it to remove it from the project and move on to the next challenge. Uh, the, the, uh, the, uh, the rear wing is the next challenge. We, 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 uh, if you recall in the previous, uh, slide, it was separated by a gap, uh, between it and, and the main residence. We've infilled that gap with what, what we call the hyphen. Uh, and we've added a second floor onto the rear wing, and uh, we were asked to give a lot more detail to that second story addition uh, from, from what we had last month, and I'll go into that with you as well. So um, no other changes on the main residence itself. We got a lot more clear with where we're relocating and shifting existing windows. Uh, because we were, uh, there was a little bit of confusion, maybe with, with, uh, and rightfully so. Uh, uh, so uh, I'm going to show you some drawings that uh, give clarity to uh, window shifts and reuse of windows. Uh, the, again, existing conditions. I'm not going to bore you with. This is uh, these are comprehensive uh, composite floor plans that that really don't bring much to the table for tonight's discussion. Uh, Let's get right into uh, the, the uh, and these are very complicated floor plans, so I apologize about that. It, 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 it can't be any more complicated uh, with, with the project itself. Uh, this, these are existing additions. This is, this is the master bedroom. Might as well talk about it for a second. This is the uh, master bedroom, uh, which is the second floor uh, on the main structure and it uh, has a great view to the left over the ocean and uh, we've got a, l a little bit of expansion that we're uh, proposing for it that I'll go into in uh, this slide right here. Uh, everything you see in shade uh, is an expansion or an infill of an existing terrace uh, that is, an, uh, is our proposal to make the master suite upstairs uh, a lot more livable by today's standards. It's a tiny little uh, subordinate space that, uh, uh, that w uh, is now the master uh, suite on the property and is really the most important space on the property. Uh, and I'll show you what all that looks like in elevations uh, uh, soon. And so this is the uh, existing rear wing. Here's the proposed rear wing. We were adding a couple of hundred square feet of, of space uh, 
uh, within it. Uh, the hyphen that I spoke about earlier is way down here. It's actually connecting this rear wing to the main residence. It's cute as a button. Um, here's our existing garage, and here is our proposed new garage uh, with the third bay right there. Much more charming than the garage that we came in a, a month ago, and hopefully you recall what it looked like. Um, here is a series of exterior elevations. Uh, the elevation at the very top of the page is, is what is existing out there today. Uh, the garage, the two-car garage to the left, a tree house that's anchored uh, and, and, and uh, sitting in the center of the property, and then uh, what today is the, uh, the, the main portion of the residence, again, the master bedroom upstairs in this triangular uh, window element, uh, uh, and living room below. This is the living room area here. The, 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 the steps and, and access up to all of that is way over here on the right. Uh, we're, uh, the image on the bottom of the page is, uh, the, uh, the proposal. Uh, and so, um, we are, uh, very unusual elements of design up here. Uh, but again, that's ex that's what's existing. You know, some things of which I've never seen in my career, you know. But and so so uh, here we are on the proposed elevation facing the ocean uh, below. We we've uh, centered our main entry, shifted it from from this area right here to this area, giving it a, a lot more uh, logic to the way the site flows. Uh, we've introduced a couple of windows right there. That's a new piece. This section right up here is an outdoor terrace. Uh, we've extended the building envelope a little bit to the south to capture a sitting room off the master. So uh, we've popped, uh, because the ocean is where I'm standing in this, in this illustration, uh, we've popped a window in there to take full advantage of the ocean. And then for balance purposes on this piece over here, where there's a, 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 a this is a walk-in master closet right there. It, it continues to be a walk-in master closet. It's extended about nine feet. We've popped a window into it as well, just to give some balance uh, and rhythm to the to the elevation. Uh, and uh, there's very little uh, general change in terms of this image and this image. It's. Uh, uh, a, a big change in, 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 in everything is the removal of the treehouse. We're taking the treehouse down, putting it on the ground, spinning it around, putting it behind the garage, and it's becoming, it's repurposed as a changing room for the pool. Um, the changes that we had before on the garage were, were fairly extensive. We've absolutely minimized them. This is, uh, again, the above image is is existing the below is proposed it uh, uh, th this is the south elevation the top image is existing the bottom image is is uh, proposed here's the hyphen way over here it's just a, a cute little single story space with the matching roof and glass doors to either side of it you can pass right through it uh, it's seven feet square so it's just the tiniest of little little elements um, uh, Claudia, for your edification, I, if, if you see a circle on, on some of these graphics, that represents a window that's either shifted or relocated or changed in some slight way. For example, in the uh, existing image up here, those two windows right there, which is where our hyphen has, uh, has landed, We've taken those two windows, and rather than just throw them away, we've uh, put them over here and repurposed them. Now, they're going to be brand new windows. We're not actually using the old windows, but we're retaining the opening, uh, and, and rather than uh, pretending that they were never there, we're repurposing them somewhere else. So, uh, and I think that's, that's a, 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 a true benefit to, to, the, uh, to the overall design. Uh, other than that, very little change on uh, the, the ground floor of the main uh, residence. Uh, here's the existing, here's proposed. And, and then again, here's the existing master upstairs. 
here's the proposed master with this little tiny addition right there uh, uh, representing the, the, uh, the very modest extension uh, toward the ocean. So uh, this is the opposite elevation. This is the north elevation. Top image is existing, bottom image is proposed. Again, we kind of clean up a few of the window areas. Uh, th this space right here is, is one in which we, we took the center window out and we relocated it to the opposite side of the building. And, and then we actually uh, it, it repurposed the space. It's a general living space right now, but we've turned it into the kitchen. So to run the kitchen counter past these windows, we had to raise the sill height of the windows. Um, I took that little tiny window right there and I put it up in the peak of the gable right there to try to make a little sense out of it. And uh, as, again, as opposed to throwing it away. And so those are the modest changes that are effective on the north elevation. Um, this is the west elevation. This is uh, the least significant, shall we say, the least visible from the public right away. Absolutely nobody can see this elevation, uh, not even the neighbors to the west. Uh, but, but obviously, we're obligated to take uh, full design on and... and uh, and so here's our single story rear wing right here with, uh, we were, we were uh, criticized for not really showing a couple of windows that were existing back there. We've incorporated them now. Um, and, and, and this little section right here, it represents the very western end of the main uh, living quarters wing. And you can see how, uh, again, the word cobbled, it's very, very cobbled because it's several additions that have occurred over the, over the past few decades. And so we've, we've redesigned it um, with a little bit more liberty than we would have if this were facing east and facing a public right away. Uh, we, we've incorporated three sets of French doors. They, they go out onto the, the, basically the exact same deck that, that's out here anyway. Uh, but we've eliminated an awkward sort of uh, stoop and railing system. Uh, we, here's our hyphen. Our cute little hyphen is right here uh, because otherwise today you kind of walk through this little narrow seven-foot wide passage between two buildings. Here is the very end of the original garage from 1935. Uh, and so we're going to pay homage to that guy uh, when I come back around to the front of this this new rear wing, but here's the uh, here's the uh, the the west elevation of the new uh, rear wing, and uh, I'm not going to get into the things that we've changed from last month to this month until I get around to the front, because it's uh, I'll tell you how we've made it much much more identifiable as a new element versus the existing uh, one story element below it. These are um, existing elevations. This is the rear wing existing uh, front, and that's actually the back, and that's actually the end, the uh, south end. And so here we go. Here's, here's the exciting rear wing here, uh, because this faces uh, east, faces the ocean, but again, it's extremely deep into the site, very subordinate. Uh, not seen from A1A at all. You would have to be swimming in the pool on the property to even appreciate this elevation, but yet here it is. And, and here's our original 1936 garage that we are paying homage to. We are, we're retaining its roof line. We, we met with, with Michelle and with Katerina and, and uh, the other Michelle, and we, we've we uh, were paying, we had, a, we had a balcony, we had a Romeo and Juliet balcony coming out of that window right there uh, that we abandoned in, in lieu of paying homage to the existing original uh, garage. So um, uh, we actually took that balcony and we sucked it up into this section over here. Uh, and so there's a, a balcony that's accessible from a bedroom there a uh, some common space here and then this bedroom right here we introduce a door right there way off to the left hand side and it too goes out to that balcony so we gave up a balcony uh 
in one spot that was conflicting with our garage and we shifted it over to there and staff was very active in helping us make that decision so uh, i think they're kind of proud of, of the improvements that we've made on this elevation uh, so how do we further distinguish the second floor this, so this is the only new this is the big this this second floor element up here is the new piece onto the property uh, because it's a it's a new second story that we're adding to an existing one story. Uh, why is it added to this rear wing? Well, this rear wing is the most cobbled piece on the property. So it is the least original uh, and is, it is the most subordinate because it's the furthest off of A1A. There's no question that uh, there's nowhere else on the property that we could have been more subordinate with the second floor. So uh, ways to distinguish the new second floor from the lower floor. We've, uh, we're going to use a much uh, tighter exposure on our horizontal siding on the second floor. Well, I'm going to show you at the end of the presentation uh, a treatment in whitewash. We're, we're whitewashing uh, the entire property and we're going to, uh, we've got a series of intensities of whitewash, if you will, from a light wash, white wash to a medium to a very dark, almost white. And so we're going to distinguish, uh, we're going to have a light white wash on the upper level and we're going to have a heavier white wash, a much more white uh, element on the lower level. We've introduced a, 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 an apron, if you will, that is this solid uh, wood element right there that will align with uh, that of the balcony. We did not have that before. Uh, so, uh, and we've, we had a, uh, this, this gable right here is new to the design. Uh, it was, it was, it was a gable, but it was rotated in the opposite direction. So now it complements that of the, uh, of the homage that we're paying to the garage. And of course, uh, directly above the garage, we've got, uh, a, a third gable. So we've got, uh, a much more harmonious element in this rear wing that affords us uh, some new space, some new exciting space onto the property. We're, we're, we're going uh, uh, to the degree that we feel we can with distinguishing the new architectural language of that upper level uh, to distinguish it from the lower level. Um, and again, there's our hyphen right there, which is a lot of glass, a, a glass French door with glass transoms and glass side lights. We're trying to make it as transparent as possible just keep in mind that's only seven feet wide so it's very very tiny here's the uh the uh the south elevation of the new two-story uh we're, we 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 didn't what's different here than last month we didn't have these features up on the, the second level we had a blank wall there even though nobody including their neighbors can see it uh it's very heavily vegetated back here uh some very mature sea grape trees but we introduced uh, some window elements. These are not real windows. They're, they're faux windows, if you will. We'll trim them out in, in, in wood and make them appear with a little recess and some casing and a sill and, and make them appear as windows, but they're not windows. They're, they're, they're not in the floor plan as a window. There's nothing to see there. So, but we, rather than have a big blank wall, we introduced some interest into the uh, fa uh, facade itself because uh, uh, some of the feedback from you was that it was a little bit too boring. So it's not boring now. Um, that is a kind of a cutaway section of our hyphen right there. It's a passageway. And this is actually the north elevation of the two-story wing in the back uh, with windows repeated above one another in this instance and uh, with the exact same size window, one above the other. Here's the balcony that's uh, a little bit beyond uh, that all bedrooms upstairs share. And there's a little tiny reference back to the window that I pointed out a few minutes ago above a gable. So we've got uh, uh, certainly enough interest in the north elevation of this uh, new rear wing. Uh, here's the garage. Very, very simple. I'll try to fly through it. Um, top images, all, all these images are existing. So it's, it's, a, it's a very, very simple two, two bay garage with a, a common gable roof covering everything. 
Uh, we're not sure what year this thing was built. We, we know it's not original. Uh, and here is our, here's our new garage with the third bay right there added. Uh, the tree that I spoke of uh, that we're building around is right there. Uh, so we've given, uh, ex we've, we've responded, in my opinion, to exactly what we were asked to do uh, from last month's presentation. We've minimized the architectural impact of that third bay. Um, there's the treehouse that's now sitting at grade, spun around uh, 180 degrees, and is a, a really simple, cute little changing station for the, for the outdoor pool. Um, you don't need to talk about windows at all. Uh, again, this is the holy grail that I showed last month. This is the original uh, uh, John Volk architectural drawing from 1936. It was a needle in a haystack find, uh, but this is the original house that is uh, unrecognizable in today's environment out there, but yet here it is, uh, both floor plans, a lower floor, upper floor, uh, and all the elevations associated with it. Uh, um, at one time, very, very early on in our project, we were trying to replicate or, or cl too closely duplicate some of the elements from this, uh, but we've backed off of that and, and we've uh, responded by having elements that are much more uh, harmonious with existing conditions of today. So this is an image of uh, our experiment with whitewashing. We are not experts at whitewashing. This will be the first project we ever whitewash versus a solid opaque paint. But uh, the upper image, th this is all uh, on a, a very small section of the existing house. We did it in the back of the house where nobody could see it. Uh, and then we photographed it. But the upper element is, uh, is uh, it's, it, it didn't photograph very well, but it's the light the lightest of the three whitewashes, the one in the middle is a, a mid-grade whitewash, and the one in the bottom is uh, a darker. Uh, point maybe being that uh, that um, the grain and the texture and the the naturalness of the wood siding itself still comes through uh, on the technique that we're going to use to 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 whitewash the property. Um, we've proven last month with competent and substantial evidence that the property was previously whitewashed. We've, we gave photographs that uh, we have on file that prove that. Uh, so, um, and, and we're of the opinion that these whitewashes are going to fade over time, just like anything in, in, uh, in South Florida. They're going to fade over time. They're probably going to have to be whitewashed more often than if they were painted. But but we're much more excited about whitewashing than painting. So uh, that might be the end of the slide. Um, I hope I didn't go through it too fast or bore you with too much about any other aspect of it. We're, we'll be available for questions. We think we've gone back to the drawing board. This is the second time before you. We've gone back to the drawing board and, and uh, responded to everything that was asked of us last month. Well, we got a continuance last month, which we were uh, uh, certainly very excited to, to hear the constructive criticism so we think we've responded to everything we look for your full support and i think michelle's got a couple little conditions of approval in her uh recommendation and we're absolutely fine with them i have no no uh, issues with any of her conditions of approval so that uh, concludes the presentation thank you very much thanks roger Good job getting this turned around quickly. What's that? I, I didn't believe you last month when you said you'd, you'd be ready. We were ready within a week. Wow. Quickly. You worked very hard.
So 610 North Ocean Boulevard, the Fontaine Fox House, which is individually designated to the local Register of Historic Places. Again, I'm Michelle Hoyland for the record. Um, what's before you is a revisit to the COA variance and waiver that the board reviewed last month. Um, I'll do a brief, brief history. I went through a very long history last month. The storied history on this property is associated with um, famous cartoonist Fontaine Fox, who um, made Delray Beach his winter home and then later longer term residence in the 30s and 40s, 50s. Um, Fontaine Fox was a nationally syndicated cartoonist. He had uh, an art uh, story, article, comic, I guess, um, in newspapers at the time known as Toonerville Folks and then also had Toonerville Trolley. So when you hear of Delray Beach being referred to as an artist and writer's colony, Fontaine Fox was in the list of folks that was uh, that were here and that's why we have that name and, and we're known for that um, that back history. So this property is on North Ocean Boulevard. It's on the west side of the road. This is directly west of the North Beach access. If you've dri driven um, A1A, a lot of times you see some golf carts parked here, which I don't know. Um, it's not a golf cart parking, but that tends to be where that they park, um, north of the municipal beach, north end. This is an aerial view of the property. Um, many years ago, it incorporated several lots around the property that extended all the way to Andrews Avenue and over and across um, A1A on the beach. And over the years, it had been subdivided several times, um, parceling out parcels like this house here that was constructed. Um, part of the approval for that house had limited setbacks, so that house wasn't forward of the building line that could affect, uh, affect the historic integrity of the Fontaine Fox house. Um, construction of these structures back here as well. And this is just another aerial view looking from the west. Um, you can see there are quite a few structures on the property. What we're looking at in this area right here, this is where the original structure was and that little one car garage was back here. Um, and then there was a cottage in, in the far rear part here. This structure that I've got my mouse over right now, if you can see that was an addition that happened. There was also some other subsequent additions um, to the garage there I think we it was four I think that it went through on that part extending the size of that which have, in effect became the guest house this is looking so we're basically standing at this point um, in the center of the property right here looking towards the house so the front of the house was oriented to the south property line not to the street on a1a um, so that's very very close to the way the original home looked. Here I've provided you with a few graphics of the Toonerville history. Um, this is also in the staff report. It's important to the story for this property because this was the um, inspiration for Fontaine Fox so that he um, conspired with, I'll say, John Volk, who was the architect of record, a famed, famed Palm Beach architect and wanted to bring some of that style that he was inspired by for his comics to the structure. So that's um, what is the representation we see here. And then here's a few more photographs. I'm gonna go through somewhat quickly of the site and around the site. This is the guest cottage in the back. Um, this is the far north side of the, the rear over here, the guest wing. This is the far rear, so we're on the west side at this point, and just beyond this to the right side of the screen, the property drops down with a retaining wall and goes to a very um, heavily landscaped area with some very mature trees back there. It's a, a big jump in elevation back there. Uh, here we're looking at the garage, so when you first drive into the property, this is the first thing that you see. This is the east side of that garage. It's out on the front part of the property. Um, this is a tree house. I think um, some of you are familiar with the history on the tree house. It, um, the McKinney's built this and went through some litigation with the city because it wasn't um, 
I, you know, at the time, I don't know how important that is to this request, but there's a storied history. So this, there was a settlement agreement with the city in order for this tree house to remain and the board did approve it. The tree house you'll see later is being taken down and, and moved elsewhere on the property. Um, so here you can see the properties noted Mott. Those are the Fontaine Fox properties and the one that says Fox was another property he owned and there is still a home there that is in the Monterey style that exists. It's not um, protected by the historic ordinance. These are some images of the historic building permit records. I have them in in case the board wants to ask questions. We just brought them forward along with the original John Volk plans from 1934 um, of the structure and some zoomed in pictures. So the east elevation and the north, which are um, having, you know, there are some modifications proposed. The south, you can see that little front door that was there is now a bank of patio doors that was um, modified as well many, many years ago. And I'm just going to move somewhat quickly through this. I think it's important to note that um, local ar architect Robert Curry was involved with this project in 1971, um, doing an addition for the owners at that time. So we have a lot of that historic building permit um, information. This was a drawing, I believe, at the time in 2013. This was Francisco Perez who worked on the project then. So there, there have been those expansions that I've mentioned over time. So now I'm just going to move to the site plan. The original site plan is on top. The proposed is on the bottom. Um, you can see that that walkway that was once proposed through the property has been removed. That's probably um, one of the largest changes, as well as some adjustments to that parking area and the garage on the east side of the property. It's been adjusted to honor the shape and form of the existing garage as well as protect a tree um, that the board asked the applicant to do and and they did proffer that so here we have existing floor plan proposed everything in red um, is new that was the the proposal you saw last month and this is the proposal now so the shifts that have happened are also affecting the guest um, cottage in the rear the tree house is coming down and it's being located um, to the back side of this garage on the west side of it. Here's the new proposed front east elevation. I think there was some confusion on my part at the last meeting. There is an addition bringing the front forward on the east side of the structure um, with some shifts in, in the um, A-frame style window that's on that side. We'll see it a little bit more clearly when we look at the south elevation. So this entire red section here was what was proposed last time. The board had concerns with these gable roofs, um, dormer gable roof styles over these windows. So the applicant um, has removed those gable roofs, but ultimately the form of the addition on the east side of the building is, is still proposed um, with the porch down on the ground level. We have these highlighted um, just as a, a note that we don't want the board to miss the fact that there is an addition happening here and this drawing is a section drawing. So that's why you see this cut piece here, but there is a form here that's being added um, to the building on the south side. You can actually see it peeking through on the north um, when we get to that. So the existing and proposed um, elevations here that's where that guest wing was missing and the drawing has been updated to add the guest wing. So now we can kind of see the form of that um, structure. The request includes a waiver so that that structure remain, um, get a special approval in relation to secondary and subordinate. This is a requirement of the visual compatibility standards related um, to additions for this property. This is um, needing a waiver because it the addition is not secondary and subordinate to the existing structure. We've referenced this proposed hyphen in several of our um, images in the presentation and I'll show you that here. This is a walkway between the original um, or the main house on the right and the guest cottage on the left which will now be connected by a hyphen as we call it. It's a historic term. Um, basically it's, it's kind of like a vestibule 
but it'll allow for the interior to be air conditioned and this um, no longer necessarily be considered a guest cottage. It will be an expansion of the um, main house. And there's that um, structure here again as well. So uh, there have been modifications. This was the proposal um, that you saw last month that's at the bottom of the screen. And you can see here, um, we worked with the applicant. One of the renditions we saw before they submitted did not include this little roof gable of the garage. And we did kind of press on them um, to include this gable because we felt it was important to the built environment and the integrity. And when you're out on the site, you can clearly see that that garage structure was something original to the site. Um, so they removed the balcony and doors on the floor above and shifted a door over here and extended the balcony over here as well. There's a differentiation in the wood siding from the upper floor to the lower floor, which is very slight. The trained eye will recognize it when they're, you're in the, in the property. Um, that's what we kind of shoot for and our goal is because we want to be sure that we, we respect that historic integrity with the changes that get made um, to properties. There's also a more appropriate window being proposed down here in this uh, far south side of the project. This is that garage um, roof pitch that I was speaking to with the door opening on the bottom. This, this is an older uh, rendering, it's not a newer one, but it's somewhat reminiscent of the size of the structure, so we thought it would be helpful to include it. Um, the west side of the structure, there was some discussion about blank walls up here. So this is what was proposed previously, and now we see what is proposed with some additional windows. And I think some of them are faux windows as well. Um, this is so that there's still some integrity into the built environment, but not imposing upon neighbors that are close by um, to the west. Uh, another view, this is an older rendering, but again, this is showing the overall mass and size of the structures that are proposed. We've included the um, standards, the guidelines, and things that we've included in the staff report here in case the board needs to refer to them. Um, I would prefer not to go line by line through all of it because we've done the analysis already for you in the staff report, but basically um, majority of the issues that the board has had brought up at the last meeting have been addressed with the revised um, submittal. Um, there still is some concern with the secondary and subordinate issues on I, I would say the main issue is the addition on the east side of that um, original structure. This is that garage floor plan um, that's been revised, which I think is very nicely done to maintain the tree that's out there and also, again, providing some slight shifts and recesses that respects the historic integrity of the site so we can see the progression of changes. That's been a lot of our discussion over um, the last review. So again, proposed and the newly proposed here, um, I think one of the big shifts is you'll see that the um, roof has been revised here so that it's, it's clear that this is an add-on, which I think was very carefully done and, and well done um, with this re revised proposal. You can also see that occur on the back side of the building as well. This is the tree house, this is internal to the site. It becomes, I think, a pool house, changing room type of thing as it's directly um, east of the pool. Again, this is the old proposal and here we have the new with that um, additional roof slope that's being maintained um, for that progression of change. Um, the exterior paints, there's been a lot of discussion about it. I, I do have a question maybe once we get into rebuttal or cross-examination about the paint samples because we did have a meeting where we were talking about the paint and the um, whitewash technique seemed to be something that everyone felt like was a reasonable solution that still retained. <laughs> Some felt that was a reasonable solution um, to retain the wood exterior look. Um, there was a lot of discussion as to whether or not the structure had previously been painted. Um, and we are including the variance findings for you as well. 
then I'll move to public comment and then I would like to do a little discussion or cross-examination on the, um, the wood samples that were in the applicant's presentation. Thank you. I just want to make a comment. So we actually do um, have in our local rules that um, these board meetings end at 11 unless there is a board vote to continue the meeting past 11. It's entirely up to you guys. If, if you do not want to continue the item, you could also continue it to a later date. You just have to state the date, which I'm sure Michelle and the applicant could discuss if that's the will of the board. Oh, my fellow board members don't shoot me. Uh, I propose that we extend uh, the meeting another 30 minutes. It doesn't have to be a specific amount of time, right? It's more of like we want to finish this item tonight. And um, let's get a sorry, let's get a second and then and then we can discuss that. Yes. It, it doesn't have to be a specific amount of time. It's up to you guys if if, if that's what you want, um, if you want to do it through the item, you can do that. I'll be glad to amend it. I just felt we could probably get it done in 30 minutes. Are we voting or what? Yeah, take the roll. <laughs> you waiting for a second? Sorry? Uh, you, we got the second. Yeah, you, that's what I thought. We have a second. Yep. Yeah. <coughs> roll call? Yes. Go ahead. Robert Alstonoff? Yes. Elise Lindstrom? Yes. Rhonda Saxton? No. Claudia Willis? Yes. Jim Chard? Yes. Benjamin Baffro? No. Okay. So, public comment? We've got about 25 minutes to talk. Uh. <laughs> George Long, 46 North Swinton. The public approves. Can we? I like it. Okay, I'm the public. Thank you. John Q. You've all got. Get this. Um, can we do ex parte, we Mr. Have Chair, please? Ex parte communication, Jim. Uh, none since the last time. No. 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 None since the last time. No. Okay, any cross-examination? Yes. Or rebuttal? Just really quickly. Um, my question is for the applicant. Is this the same sample we saw when we were together in our last meeting? Yes. Did you lighten it? Yes. Okay. Um, I just wanted to make a note on record that we did have a meeting with the applicant. Um, where they provided us with some whitewash samples and we gave them some feedback and suggested that maybe the whitewash samples could be lightened um, a bit so that it, um, the more of the wood grain would come through. So that's what we're seeing here and thank you for clarifying. Do you have any cross-examination or rebuttal? There was a tiny bit of discussion whether or not you could whitewash over the existing conditions, you know, the brown, what might appear to be stained siding, and this is directly over the existing conditions. So it's, we didn't clean it or, or sandblast it or make it go away. We whitewashed right over it, and it's really attractive, very attractive. So we thought it was successful. Thank you. That's all for me. All right. I have a board discussion. Oh, can I ask Michelle a couple questions? Yes, you may. Uh, Michelle, can you uh, show me how they um, made the addition subordinate? Any oh. changes to that? I didn't notice any changing in the massing. So the changes didn't necessarily make the addition subordinate, which is why the waiver is still being requested. Um, the changes were predominantly done to the design of the addition. Okay, so because the massing was one of my big issues. Um, uh, 
and the other thing I was going to ask you was, um, talking about the painting or non-painting, can you show me anywhere in the Secretary of Interior Standards that, uh, or in any, any form of our codes, why we would go against the Secretary of Interior Standards where it says we should not paint over wood? Uh, it seems to me um, that we're just going on personal opinion here and not basing it on our regulations. Okay. This is fully a board decision to make. Um, we did include information in the staff report and the previous staff report as well as this presentation. Um, this is a SNP taken from the Secretary of the Interior with respect to wood. Um, removing or substantially changing wood features which are important in defining the overall historic character of the building so that as a result the character is diminished is not recommended. Changing the type of finish, coating, or historic color of wood features, thereby diminishing the historic character of the exterior, is not recommended. What I think this board has to do is look at the proposal with the whitewash to see is that meeting these the intent of this um, these code requirements, these regulations and guidelines. The whitewash is still letting a the wood grain show through. Um, we don't know if the house was originally the color it is now, the, a white color. We do have some old photographs that were submitted by a previous owner here, um, which it's hard to know. You know, there's documentation of paint that the applicant has indicated is up underneath the eave here. I, I don't know when that was done, um, but we do have documentation that shows this light color to the wood. And now it's a, a much darker color. So some type of change has already shifted. Um, this color here to me, I don't know if that's a wood whitewash or if that's a patina of the wood over time. It's cypress, so it's, it's hard to know. Um, but I think what the applicant is proposing would be more in line with what you see peeking out in this picture over here on the right rather than this. Well, it was my color. understanding that neither the applicant or the former owner had painted, had said that they had painted. So um, I, Roger said it was definitive evidence. It, it doesn't look definitive to me. Um, it, it does look like weathering, but I certainly, I don't have a problem with it on the new. But Roger spoke a lot about homage to the garage and homage to this and that. And then I know Frank went on for quite some time about how important the treehouse was to him, to give an homage to um, Fontaine Fox, to, to do it just like the Tunerville trolley. And it also, he did, in the natural wood. And there's so much published about the natural wood um, I just feel like, you know, this house tells a story. And with, I have a problem with the massing, with the other massing and the color addition, I think the story kind of ends <laughs> uh, if, if those things happen. And I think it's significant. It's Fox, it's Volk, it's Moss. Um, also, I have one comment, and it, it goes back to earlier tonight. It, it was made evidently important to me when we looked at um, the Sewell House, how important it is when you add on things that they can be removed, because they're removing it back to its purest form. Um, I'm not so sure all of these additions uh, really can be can be removed. Um, it's just a comment. One last comment. Transom windows. I thought that transom window was going off in the peak. peak. That was a question. Actually, is that to the applicant or to Michelle? 
was to Michelle. <laughs> um, where was that here? Sure the edition? About the, the, the one in the... The Bob Curry window? The one up in the peak. Oh, on the east side? Remember you said it made it look, it looked slightly out of proportion, but then you said. Well, we weren't sure when we first looked at this and Katharina and I um, reviewed this project and did the staff report, it wasn't clear um, that that was changing. But then when we were here at the meeting and we went back and forth, I think Mr. McKinney said, oh, it's just perspective. And we looked at it a little closer and realized, no, this is this is that shift that's happening in that A-frame because there's an addition being proposed on that side. So that um, this is what we're seeing here. This is all an addition east of the existing structure. So there, it's the same. Nothing looks to have changed much on there. If I'm wrong, please feel free to correct me, um, Roger. But that A-frame exists back here today and it's being recreated on the east side of this part of the addition here <clears throat> would you like to have the applicant respond to that um i thought we had discussion that we wanted that removed or whatever but i i could be wrong you know um it's up to the board. I'm one vote. <laughs> You're referring to the window or the whole A-frame? I'm talking about the, the transom part. The, it, isn't the original just, I mean, before, wasn't it just one window? Correct me if I'm wrong. It's late. It, it sounded like last time Michelle had asked the applicant to correct her if she was wrong. So if you want some clarification from him, I think he might be able to provide some insight on that. I, I was really sort of asking the board because I thought we had a discussion about that. Oh, okay. But maybe we didn't. <laughs> I, I don't recall, okay. and I'm not saying that you didn't. There was just so much discussed and so much time. We covered a lot of ground that night. Yeah. Um, I don't recall. I remember there being discussion about these little, um, I think someone called them Churchill Down. Yes, piece. correct. Um, but I, I don't remember if there was direction given to the applicant to take or remove or redesign this entire extension Okay. on the east side. I'm not saying it wasn't said, I just don't remember. Um, but that A-frame that you're referencing... We, we talked about that we, we, um, just because it was so odd. I, I didn't understand what it was. And I was asking, I asked originally, it was clarified that that was glass that came in in the 1971 Bob Curry revision. I'm not Let's sure what's happening that. to our mics, but maybe if you turn your mics off when you're not using them, that might help. Um, we can look at the original Volk drawings for that side of the house, which is here. This is what it looked like. So I think you're right, Benjamin, that came in. I remember Frank talking about um, the tile planters that are inside, when you're inside the room, um, inside that door. So I think you're right that that was the 71 edition that was happening here at that time. So, you know, that's something that as modifications age, they become historic too. We've had that conversation multiple times. Um, so it's, you know, it's something the board would need to consider if, if that is appropriate here. We can see part of it on that permit, that's the backside. And it's here, right there. So there was a porch added at that time too. So that would be modified with this this proposal. Because we would be going to similar form, but it's an extension on the east side of the building here.
I do remember we're having a conversation too about maybe, and I don't remember if it was at the meeting or in the meeting we had at City Hall with the applicant, but I remember at some point discussing having some extension back here and Mr. McKinney was not interested in doing that. do at this point. I think it's a lot better. Um, I, I appreciate the fact that the applicant and his architect uh, listened to what we suggested and, and really did address everything. Um, I think that the massing on the on the guest house is um, still there, but it's still there. I mean, I don't I think uh, softened it on the eastern side by adding some of that a little more fenestration to it, but I mean, it's, it seems to me it, it, what it's going to be. I don't know that what you do to make that not look like that. Make it so big. We'll make it so big, that's it. It's Fontaine Fox House, y'all. <laughs> as emotional as people got over the tiles at the Marina Villas, I mean, this is the Fontaine Fox House. Well, it's Frank McKinney's house. It's also Frank McKinney's house. Frank McKinney is the current owner. He's, this is generational. This is, hopefully, we will have another 100 years of people going through this house. And so if we make changes that everyone desires without considering the building, the structure, that's our job. Well, let me just clarify. So the original Fontaine Fox house was really very small. It was. What, like 900 square feet or something? Um, I don't know the square footage off the top of my head, but we do have the drawings, you know. Right. All of the additions that were done, um, you know, you can see on those drawings, I would say a majority of the additions were focus to the back of the house with that front porch being added here. Let's see here. Yeah, so that's the original south elevation. Seems like the biggest addition is back where the old garage was. Am I reading that? No. There was. This... Where's the two story? Yeah, so if you look at this little form right here, this mm -hmm. garage, that is, um, if I go to these older drawings, if that's okay with you, um, that was right here. Right. That so little that's, garage. That's the western part of the property. So what you're seeing on this drawing, this bluish color, blue lavender, those were um, the oldest additions or the oldest structures and additions. So this was the original house here that was a guest cottage. There was a garage here, and then all of this that was extended happened in the 50s before Bob Curry did anything. Um, there was a porch up front here, and then you see these red, little red boxes. Those were the additions that Curry did in 71. Then when you look here, this, um, it's hard to tell. I, I should have put more color to this, but this here, this red, is what Francisco Perez did in 2013. That's what this here was, focused to the west side of the structure and set back. 
but you can see in, in here, the original front door that was here was um, pulled out and expanded forward in the 70s, and you have this bank of windows. So that change garners its own historic integrity because it was done so long ago. Claudia, I understand your, your concern over the, the massing, uh, but short of not doing, <coughs> excuse me, short of not doing a second story, how do you avoid that? Well, you know, they have a second story now, but they're enclosing all, all of the outside duckings. Uh, well, on the main house, on the back, they're doing, uh, well. I'm, I'm just talking about the back. That's one story now. Well, I, I'm not a, opposed to a second story, but that is not, I mean, it's totally 100% right on top of the, it's not, you know, it's not reduced in any size, or it's not set back, it's not, um, it's not set in. <laughs> um, it does face the west side, which is, <clears throat> the least visible side of the house, so you got to take that into consideration. I'm considering the house as a historic structure. I understand. That's the integrity of that. That's what is my driving force, which doesn't have to be everybody's, but it's mine. And we said that wing was built in 1970, the one-story west wing? Which one are you asking about? The one that we're talking about, the second story on, and the massing. That so the... began with the garage. No, it, yeah. it was built in the original construction in the 30s, was the garage. Right. And then the wing, there was a progression of change that happened all of this in the 50s. In the 50s, okay. Yeah. That's on building permit records back here. Here is a good representation. 59, 58, 60. I think there's another one that shows it too. 57, 58, 60. That one there says 68, so that was the fourth edition. So the garage, basically the form of the garage, the only thing that's left that you can see is basically the roof pitch and the form of what would have been the front door, which I had pictures in here somewhere. I feel like it's back by the addition. I think you answered the question unless the board needs further clarification on it. Mm -hmm. Does the board have further comments or thoughts on a motion or I, I I'm not reading what, what direction the board's going in, so, you know, um, your options obviously are approval, approval with conditions, or continuation with direction, or denial. I would recommend that if you're leaning in the direction of a continuation with direction that you engage the applicant and ask him whether he would prefer a continuation with direction or a denial so that it's a final decision that can be immediately appealed. Again, I don't know what direction you guys are leaning, so. Yeah. <laughs> I, to, to move things along, I think it's clear I'm not going to support it, so I won't be making a motion to, to pass this. Uh, either the paint color, the pa paint color, and the, the massing. It needs to be subordinate to me.
We would also have to address the variance in the waiver, right? Well, they're connected to not being subordinate, <laughs> so. It, yeah. It, it is within the, uh, any of those motions, but you would just need to, if you were going to continue, it just be need to be continued to a date certain, because there are notice requirements based on that. Ask Michelle a question. What? Michelle on the variance. It's going from a 12 foot setback to a one foot setback on the west side. And on the north side. But north side. But the second story is sitting on top of the existing building, so is it already sitting one foot off of Yes, it's yeah. on the north side. So so it's just sitting right there already the ground floor and then there's some extension that happens as well with the porch this is on the east side of the main house so we're in this area here i'm sorry we're okay um Right in here, this darker red. But I don't think that's where our concern is being expressed right now. It's the west wing. I guess. It's how deep the property is. I don't see how that's not subordinate. I, I have a question, just for clarification of my notes. Building. Is the massing issue that Miss Willis expressed strictly limited to the guest cottage or is it in relation to the main house as well? It's in relation to the main house. I'd like to have, you know, the addition sort of disappear out of you, but I don't, I, I think that they take over the house. To me, I just, I can't say it's subordinate. I just, it doesn't, subordinate doesn't mean to me that it's back on the lot. It, it's in relation to the, to the house, the, the main structure, and it's not. I mean, I, I know Roger said it was set back, so it was subordinate, but I, I don't agree with that. Set back on the lot, not set back on the house. <laughs> in pretty much every other property, it's from the front that we make it subordinate, not from the side. It's from, to me, it's the total massing of the building. You're talking about massing. We're talking about a variance. We're talking about a, a waiver. And, and we can't just arbitrarily say, oh, and now we have to figure it's on the side. I we always do. Where it, you show me that in the rules. Well, it, I'm just saying it's subordinate. It means that the, the front facade on the street side is the rest of it becomes subordinate. I, I hear you, but you show me that in the rules. I, I, I don't well, I don't believe that. I, it's I, on the I, screen. I, it's M, bottom of uh, the right side of the screen. Additions to individually designated properties and contributing structures. Mm -hmm. There are six standards that the board applies as well as staff. Additions shall be located to the rear or least public side of a building and be as inconspicuous as possible. Additions to or accessory structures shall not be located in front of the established front wall plane of a historic building. Characteristic features of the original building shall not be destroyed or obscured. Additions shall be designed and constructed so that the basic form and character of the historic building will remain intact if the additions ever removed. Additions shall not introduce a new architectural style mimic too closely the style of the existing building nor replicate the original design but shall be coherent and designed with the existing building. Additions shall be secondary and subordinate to the main mass of the historic building and shall not overwhelm the original building. So that to me says that we should be less concerned with that second floor addition and more concerned with the changes to the front of the house because you brought up earlier and Michelle just read that if it's an addition, it needs to be able to be removed. 
that doesn't, I mean, you can take the whole second floor off, right? But the, those additions to the front of the house, I don't know if that qualifies in the same. I don't know if, I don't know if I'm following. <laughs> can you put up the, the changes to the front of the house? I, I mean, I, I do like the fact that on the, the when they're adding the second story, I like what they did to, to make it obvious that it is not original, right? They changed the side of the the size of the siding and et cetera. Yeah, but right? look at the massing. That's the back there. Where's the front of the house? So we're looking at the south side. So Where's if we the... were bird's eye into the site, we'd be sitting basically in the pool looking north. And what's on the right side of the screen is the front of the house that faces Atlantica or A1A. Do, isn't there an east elevation? So if we look at this, this right here that I'm circling over, this is looking at that from the inside of the property. So that's if I'm standing in here looking north. So this whole piece is new, added on to the front of the house. That's the front, east side, right? Yeah, that's what you see. That's what you see from A1A. That's added on, that is this form right here, the front of the house. The blue part's already there. Yes, ma'am. The red is new, the blue is existing. Is the guest wing there correct? That doesn't look to me like two stories. The guest wing is completely missing from okay. this drawing okay. because they did a section. So if I well, deleted that, we're just looking at a section. The form and mass of the guest wing is not shown on this drawing. I just saw a guest wing up there and I thought that's what that was. There, there is one slide though that shows it, right? It or shows it from the north right here. So if we're standing in the north looking towards the south, there's the guest wing peeking over. What I was hoping was that this form here, when the submittal came in, basically it's not the right orientation, it's reversed, but we don't have that mass. I don't, we don't see the south elevation of the guest wing on any drawing. So I can't tell you what the south elevation even looks like. I hate to like break up this discussion, but I, I'm going to tell you the only thing that's on my mind right now is less than six hours from now, I'm going to be driving to work. <laughs> and we, we've, got, we've got to do better than with, with these meetings. Been together, but I'm not going to be able to. And yeah, we've got just a couple minutes left on the extension that you guys provided. So, I mean, you would have to do another motion to keep going. Um, if you guys have a motion now, um, you can make that or you could make the motion to continue, you know. I'll make a motion. Um, approve certificate of appropriateness 2021-165 waiver and variance for the property located at 610 North Ocean Boulevard, individually listed to the local register of historic places by finding that the request and approval thereof is consistent with the comprehensive plan and meets the criteria set forth in the land development regulations. I second it. We didn't discuss the name, but. Robert Ostinov? No discussion. Yes. No. no. I'm sorry. Oh, I, I did second it. There was no discussion, I'm and sorry. he voted yes. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead. It was yes for him? Yes. Okay, thank you. Lise Lindstrom? No. Rhonda Saxton? Yes. Claudia Willis? No. Jim Chard? Yes. Benjamin Baffer? Yes. Okay. Have to do the waiver. Oh. No, don't combine. No, do we have to read the, the waiver? No, it was it. it was all within the same motion. Okay. 
Thank you very much. Okay, we, we didn't discuss it, but I'm not bringing it up. It was approved. Uh, Thank you. Have a good night. I wasn't sure. Huh? We were doing that because no one else was stepping up. Um, so I, the only thing I want to say is our next meeting is January 5th. We are slated to have um, some important projects on that agenda. The first round of applications relating to Sunday Village will likely be on that agenda. So if, when Diane, if you know now that for some reason you're not going to be able to attend, we need to know um, <coughs> that we're gonna have a quorum. We also have a couple other small applications on as well. Will that be a series of meetings or do you know? Um, what it will be is a recommendation from this board on the conditional use request for outside dining okay and a waiver request for a frontage standard as indicated um, or as required by the cbd code so it's a recommendation by this board but city commission has the approval authority on that um, procedure so it's the first item the first things you'll see and then depending on the outcome of that as it moves through planning and zoning board and commission um, more applications will be coming forward with relation to the site plan as okay. subsequent meetings. Okay, will they, those go to city commission before they come back on the board or will they be on the board January, February, March? So it goes to HPV in January. Yeah. Then it will possibly go in February to city commission. Okay. Um, p and boards for the conditional use, then city commission for the use and the waiver. And then once that's complete, then the whole site plan comes back. But those waivers and that use has to happen first, and then the site plan happens. Okay. So might it be the March meeting? I don't know. Okay. We've started mapping the dates out. I just don't have it right in yeah. my brain. Okay, so I saw code enforcement or I saw workers all over Swinton Social but I still saw the big fat hole in the roof. <laughs> they are working. They have, a, they have a permit for the south building Yeah. and are working to structurally s stabilize the building and make the repairs. We actually have an inspection on site with them on Friday. Okay. And then we're also re-inspecting the Sunday Village buildings as well on Friday. Okay. That's exciting. I saw them scraping the paint and stuff, but the, the hole in the hole in the roof bothered me that it didn't have a tarp or anything. You don't, I mean. The inside of that building is charred. I, sorry, I don't mean to interrupt, but I do think we're over the time limit that you guys have given yourself. If we want to adjourn and if you have further questions or comments or anything that you want to address with staff. You can call me. Myself or Michelle, okay. please feel free to call us. I really, really, really appreciate you guys, and you did an excellent, amazing job tonight. Thank you so much. Thank you.